fluid situation there, and that is a term that's being used by Israel, by Hamas, uh, and by the international agencies taking part, including the mediators from Qatar, Egypt, and the U.S. Um, after that, Israel is going to get a list of, and may have already gotten a list, of the next hostages to be released tomorrow. Palestinians will get a list of Palestinians from Israeli jails, and then the same thing will happen again tomorrow, the next day, and the day after that. That's four days. If Hamas can find and has the desire to release more of the hostages, they will do so, and the ceasefire will extend another day, essentially continue until they don't have any hostages left to give or they don't want to give uh, any more hostages up. At that point, the Israeli military says it is going to start fighting again with its stated goal that it's had from the beginning of this war uh, seven weeks ago of destroying Hamas. So, Matt, what comes after this four-day temporary ceasefire? Again, Diane, it seems that Israel is intent on continuing the war. The big question is the pressure from the U.S. and other international um, groups and agencies and governments that will put pressure on Israel to continue that ceasefire, to allow Gaza to breathe. The destruction that we've seen in two trips into Gaza City itself has been severe, extensive. It does not appear to me that the million and a half people who have fled from the north of the Gaza Strip to the south have a home to go back to. Uh, the infrastructure is completely destroyed. Uh, roads, sewage, electricity, water, it does not exist. So it's a question of how habitable, habitable northern Gaza it is, is at this point. And Israel, again, says that it wants to continue the fight indefinitely and also until it gets the rest of the hostages, about 180 or 190, we don't know exactly at this point. It is absolutely adamant of getting those people back as well, Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, thank you. And back here at home, President Biden is monitoring the temporary ceasefire and hostage release, working the phones to try to ensure everything gets carried through to the end. U.S. officials also say the U.S. wants to make use of this four-day pause in fighting by surging humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially setting up safe zones there. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's in Nantucket traveling with the president. Selena, President Biden helped to secure this deal. So what's he doing now to try to ensure all goes according to plan? Well, Diane, as you say, the president is here in Nantucket celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday, but he has been closely monitoring the situation and has been working the phones with regional leaders. He's been staying in close contact with them to ensure that this deal actually gets completed. So in calls this week with the leaders of Israel, Egypt and Qatar, the president discussed protecting civilian lives as well as working together to ultimately secure the release of all of the remaining hostages. U.S. officials also say that the U.S. wants to make use of this four day pause to serve more of that humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as potentially setting up those safe zones. Now, senior administration officials tell me that President Biden has been very hands-on in this process. He personally urged the Emir of Qatar to pressure Hamas to accept this deal, as well as for Israel's prime minister to accept it. Now, while he was in Nantucket, President Biden said he is hopeful that three-year-old Abigail Moore Idan will be on that list of hostages released as part of this initial deal, but he said he's not going to say anything until he sees the deal completed. He also said that he may speak more today. U.S. officials, though, throughout this process, they've been very clear that nothing is done here until it actually happens. All right, Selena Wang from Nantucket, Massachusetts. Selena, thank you. And the expected hostage release is the result of lengthy and tense negotiations brokered by Qatar and the U.S. So what goes into ensuring everyone does their part to follow through on this deal now? Let's bring in national security and defense analyst, former deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy, for more. Mick, how crucial are the next steps over these next four days? And what goes into keeping everyone to their word now that this deal is going into effect? So, Diane, every step's crucial because this is an agreement between two sides that absolutely don't trust each other, which is why Qatar was so important, why these international groups like the Red Cross, the Red Crescent are so important, because that is what gives each side confidence. So every step of the logistical process to bring hostages home, to bring uh, critical humanitarian aid in, to include fuel, to have prisoners released, uh, all have to be orchestrated so that every side sees what's happening and has confidence that they should take the next step. So I think at first this is going to be uh, somewhat uh, nerve wracking, if you will, especially for the families. But after the process gets going and, and the sides start getting, getting confidence in it, it should be more smooth. 
So Israel has made clear that the war will resume as soon as this temporary pause is over and that their goal is still to eliminate Hamas completely. So why would Hamas agree to this deal? Is it just about getting these Palestinian prisoners back or is there more in it for them? So you're right. This is going to resume a truce uh, by its its agreement is something that will end and it is presumed that fighting will continue. So Hamas, that's one of the reasons why they ask for uh, the IDF not to be able to fly drones over Gaza. They would like to, I think, reposition themselves, move command and control to a, a safer area, potentially down in the south among the civilians that, that move there. Uh, they will try to reposition their forces to get a tactical advantage, potentially the hostages uh, that they're not willing to release. There's all sorts of things that could happen during this truth. I think the IDF knew that the entire time. They were just willing to take that risk uh, to get their hostages out, which I think any soldier would. Now, Israel also agreed to let humanitarian aid, including fuel, into Gaza. How big of an impact could that have? So, Diane, that was one of the big sticking points, I think, in the negotiation. Uh, uh, they, the IDF was very concerned that essentially Hamas would take all of the fuel and use it for their own purposes, which, of course, they need to fight uh, the, the combat operations that are going on. Uh, however, it's very much needed across Gaza, not not uh, for Hamas uh, necessarily, who likely stockpiled many of it, but for these hospitals that rely on power generators and the fuel is needed to to, to essentially keep those going. So uh, my understanding is a thousand liters today will be allowed in. That's very important as the humanitarian crisis just continues for the civilians that live in Gaza. This will at least be somewhat of a relief that in the 200 uh, uh, trucks worth of humanitarian aid. So, Mick, what are you watching for over the next four days? So, essentially, I'm, I'm looking to see that everything goes as planned because every step that happens, uh, uh, whether it's Hamas turning it over to the Red, uh, the hostages over the Red Cross in Gaza, all this happening in the West Bank with the Israelis dropping off prisoners, every step builds confidence. And I think that is what we'll be looking for, especially today. All right, Mick Mulroy, always great to have you, Mick. Thank you. Coming up, we'll go back to Israel and hear from a former hostage negotiator how these high stakes talks happen. That's next. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. Oh so what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Welcome back. A temporary truce appears to be in effect in the Middle East as we await the release of hostages taken by Hamas. The deal between Israel and Hamas states about 50 hostages will be freed and released into Israel. In exchange, Israel is expected to release a number of Palestinian prisoners from an Israeli prison in the West Bank. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is in Tel Aviv and joins me now, along with crisis negotiator Moti Crystal, who has served on various Israeli negotiation teams in the past. Matt? Hey, Diane. So, Moti, what are the kinds of things that we should expect in the next hours? We are told that the hostages should have been released by now. What should people expect? Well, I think that uh, Hamas are really going to make this happen. Uh, they added, just in the last uh, hour, they added the 12 uh, Thais uh, hostages. Uh, this is a deal that was uh, not brokered uh, through the Israeli channel. Uh, we knew it was published that the Thai government are working independently through Iran, uh, try to uh, free their uh, people. And uh, actually, you know, Hamas is playing in, in the international arena. And uh, Iran is a sponsor of Hamas, part of the axis of terror, axis of uh, evil. So we do expect these 12 ties to be released and these 13 Israelis to be um, coming to the Rafah crossing point. So all of them are coming out. So we're now going to have 25 hostages who've been that's, held that's who are likely going plan. to be released. That's the plan. Uh, 13 uh, Israelis, uh, kids, uh, mothers, uh, hopefully elderly women as well to be released. They will be handed over from the Red Cross to, through the Egyptians to the Israeli military. The Israeli military is deployed in full deployment. Um, uh, military, of course, but also health and mental support. Uh, they will be examined uh, with the, uh, through uh, Israeli doctors, military doctors. And if they need some emergency or medical additional medical treatment, they will be uh, flown to the Israeli hospitals. Uh, if not, they will meet uh, in a secluded uh, uh, compound with their families. At the base in the south? One of the bases in the south, yes. So let's say Hamas follows through, and both sides follow through. The ceasefire extends for four days, 50 hostages come back, plus the 12 ties, maybe others that you mentioned. What happens then? And what about the rest of the 180, 190 well, hostages? Uh, so many pieces in this puzzle might, might fall apart. We do expect Hamas to prolong because there is a, there's an element, there's an incentive mechanism within the deal that for any 10 additional 10 hostages, Hamas can buy another uh, 24 hours of, of ceasefire. Hamas will try to extend. They will try to say, we are getting there, give us another day, another day. I think that this will be prolonged for six, seven, eight days. There will be a point of time that uh, this will fall apart and Israel will resume its uh, military operation. Why? Because Israel is committed, and, and you see around, you see the sentiment, Israel is committed to bring back all the hostages, either through military uh, operation or through deals or through international pressures. You worked on the Shalit deal. Correct. This is the last question. You worked on the Shalit deal, and that took six years to finalize. Is there a chance that the Israeli soldiers and men who are still being held there might have to spend years in Hamas captivity? The long, the short answer is yes, unfortunately. And the reason for that is something happened on October 7th. It's not just a, a, a barbaric terror attack by Hamas. Something changed in the mindset of the Israelis, and we understand that we no longer um, can get quick results. We are going, it's going to take time. Yes, it's okay. going to take time. So, Diane, uh, back to you, but the news that we haven't heard, apparently 12 Thai workers who are citizens of Thailand will also be released as part of this deal, hopefully in the coming hours. Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, Moti Crystal, thank you both. And we will stay on top of that hostage release in the Middle East. But coming up, the major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Also ahead, the travel crunch is on. Find out if severe weather will interfere with your plans as Americans head out in record numbers this Black Friday. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan. I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Grab your coat if you're heading out to shop or travel today because some of the coldest air of the season is moving into parts of the country. Sam Champion is tracking the cold as well as a cross country storm. Sam? Here's another winter storm, this one coming at the end of the holiday for everyone's travel home. So remember the one coming to the holiday just before it was a little bit troublesome and problematic. This one could slow things down, but it should not shut things down. Let's talk about the winter weather warnings and watches that are out right now for about 14 states. This is about 9 million people that are covered here. And this is where the storm continues to develop today, just kind of sitting still, but then slowly moving east after that. From Denver all the way to Boulder, this is like one to three inches of snow right in that area, but higher in the mountains could be another foot of snow. So as this moves into Kansas City, 7 p.m. Saturday to 5 a.m. on Sunday, that's the time that Kansas City is kind of involved in this. And it's a light snow for KC, but there's a little icy mix in some of that as well. So as we get to Chicagoland, and you're looking at this as an all-Sunday event, 5 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. And Chicagoland, this is not a big snow for us. We kind of get big snows. This is one to three, could be a little bit more in northern areas. But again, this is the kind of thing that might slow you down. It does not stop you. Detroit, the similar situation, most of the snow pushes into Canada, and it becomes a wet system with maybe just a little bit of high elevation northern New England snow, but not much at that. And if you look at the rainfall totals by the time we get to Sunday into Monday, for Boston, it's maybe one to two inches of, of rain. For New York, it's probably about an inch of rain. So that's way different from the storm that got us into the holiday and a lot less rain. Here's your travel Sunday, and you can see how quiet it is out west, so everything should be fine. There should not be any issues here, but there may be just some volume slowdowns. And if you combine that with some of the weather, it could mean the planes don't get where they're supposed to. So still connect your airports, still make sure you know what's going on. Be careful on those roads because there's a lot of volume and just a little slippery mess. Diane? Sam Champion, thank you. And here are some of the top headlines we're following for you today. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been serving a prison sentence for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home on Valentine's Day in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is facing a new lawsuit by a woman claiming he sexually assaulted her in 1993. The woman filed a summons under New York's Adult Survivors Act, a special law about to expire that creates a year-long suspension of the usual time limit to sue. 
Adams joined several high-profile celebrities who've been accused of sexual wrongdoing under that special law in the last few days, including Sean Diddy Combs, Jamie Foxx, and Axl Rose. Adams says the accusations are absolutely not true. The Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly crash sent the vehicle soaring through the air and set off a fiery explosion. The car's two passengers, identified as husband and wife, are dead. One booth agent is recovering from non-life-threatening injuries. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. To crush the families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. It helps protect some of the things that matter most to us. It helps cover our home, our property, our memories. But extreme weather events are getting more intense and seemingly more frequent, be it because of climate change or our human population expanding into these high-risk zones. <laughs> events like hurricanes and wildfires monetarily are becoming more costly. So what are states to do when they get hit with disasters again and again and again? Well, insurance companies, they're just leaving. I'm ABC News meteorologist Rob Marciano, and over the next 30 minutes, we'll focus on four states, Florida, Louisiana, California, and Colorado. We'll analyze why these companies are leaving, who is most affected, and how we can all better protect our home from nature's fury. 
We start here in the Florida Keys, ravaged by Hurricane Irma now over six years ago, and where the residents that chose to stay are experiencing a very painful and long journey to rebuild. This is disaster uninsured. See that sea lavender out there? That's where the house used to be. It came back this way. You would walk in the front door right where I am standing yeah. right now. The house went straight parallel to the ocean. It was a single level rancher. And this then was, was the fireplace was right here. Here's a piece of our house. Yeah, there you go. There's our so, floor. So, so haunted. <laughs> and there's some foundation. If you don't laugh, you're not going to get out of bed in the morning. It's just so sad. Wouldn't that make you want to rebuild in the same spot? It did. If we would have got paid by insurance the yep. right amount of money, it would have been a new, you would have been standing in a new house. Yeah. No. And that never happened. No. 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 So, you know, that, that insurance, um, that was worse than the storm. Hurricane Irma devouring Florida tonight. The storm making its first U.S. landfall at Cudjo Key in the lower Florida Keys at 9:10 a.m. Feels like you're being blasted with the fire hose. I didn't expect a concrete house to just disappear like it did. When I try to explain to people, I'm like, imagine an arcade game where somebody takes a claw and just goes like this, chomp, and just pulls it out, and it's just gone. In September 2017, Hurricane Irma barreled across the Atlantic with winds reaching 185 miles per hour the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. Deadly and destructive Irma making landfalls a Cat 4 in the Florida Keys. Jen and Harry's dream home destroyed, a twisted pile of rubble taking its place. Up the block, the same for their bed and breakfast. But in the wake of Irma's wrath, another kind of storm was brewing an insurance market on the fringe of failure. When you saw what was left of your home, did you think, well, okay, we've got insurance, let's rebuild? That's the first thing that came to my mind is we bought the insurance, it wasn't cheap. I figured we're gonna be in pretty good shape. I wasn't even thinking about insurance really till like the day after, because it was more shock. Then, of course, I brought my little safe with me in the truck. To look at your insurance policies. To look at insurance policies. And I'm like, well, we have 100 and something here. We have another 250 for the wind. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to be OK. Since moving into their big Pine Key home in 2015, Harry and Jen paid into premium homeowner insurance policies. FEMA flood, wind, and private insurance. So when disaster struck, they had little doubt they would be covered. A week afterwards, the guy came up from Texas, the underwriter for the flood insurance for FEMA, and he looked at the house, and for him to write a check on the spot for the entire policy. And how much was that? $110,000. So FEMA paid out when they saw nothing was there. Which was amazing. And at that point, I really felt better, because we I know okay. there's nothing there that can be rebuilt. But your private insurance, the wind insurance, yeah, private wind insurance. What did they say? Why, did, why wouldn't they pay? Well, it took probably a month or two before we got any calls back. And they sent, I guess, an appraiser out. Well, most of this damage is done by flood. And then, of course, the flood guy, like, well, most of this damage is done by flood and wind. This is the game. Here we are. The game is afoot, I said to myself. Pointing fingers. But playing the game meant being forced to file multiple lawsuits. We were entitled to this money. This was a contractual obligation that they did not live up to, and it should have been paid. Insurance isn't mandatory by law, but banks often require homeowners to get insurance as a condition of getting a mortgage. 
the insurer's goal is to collect more in premiums than they pay out in claims. We're seeing uh, higher costs of materials, higher costs of labor, and those are growing faster than inflation. In recent decades, the intensity of some hurricanes has exploded, fueled by the warming seas. Oh. We're having more disasters, we're having more costly disasters, and importantly, more people live in harm's way. So any individual disaster now leads to more payouts coming from the insurers. And they're recognizing that these costs are rising quickly, uh, not just because of inflation, and they're reacting accordingly. According to NOAA, 2023 marked the most billion dollar disasters on record for the United States with 24 climate disasters. These events getting more and more costly, prompting some of the largest private insurance carriers to leave the state of Florida entirely. There's very little that the states can do when an insurer decides to pick up stakes and leave. Three quarters of Florida's 21.5 million residents live in coastal counties. And it was Hurricane Andrew in 1992 that first exposed the vulnerabilities of the private insurance market, which led to the creation of a last resort state run program called Citizens Property Insurance Corporation. The state mandated company insures those homeowners who can't otherwise find private insurance. We've seen a number of large insurers go belly up. And in response, we've seen a lot of homeowners who are now dependent on the state's public insurance plan. So Citizens Property Insurance uh, is now the largest homeowners insurer in the state. And what that points to is a private insurance market that's simply not working. Florida has the highest average insurance premium in the country. And it's not just Florida at an increased risk. This is where we slept, and this is where we slept on. On a piece of plywood. This was our room. Your husband's a big man just to get through his doors. Exactly. You made it through as a family, at least. Some days I didn't know how we was going to make it, but we made it. For two years, this was home for Tammy, Charles, and Kaylee Guillory. It was hard. The tight quarters of a recreational RV parked in their driveway during the height of the pandemic. That's the sofa bed. You see how short it is, so you can't be tall. That's where I slept. And lay on you there. You slept there? Because yeah. I left and then I came back because where I was living at got damaged from the flood in May. So when I came back home, this was my new home. So you're sleeping on a table, basically. Yeah. yeah. It was a one-two punch for the family. First Hurricane Laura made landfall in Louisiana as a category four hurricane bringing with it catastrophic storm surge and 150 mile per hour wind. Just six weeks later, Hurricane Delta hit. Tammy and Charles were affected by both. First wind, then flooding, and turned to their insurance companies to pay their policies. We did what we were supposed to do on our end of the bargain. Now it's time for them to do what they're supposed to do but they had to take their unmet claim to trial. I cried so many times in getting letters or hearing from the law office. So this is the total amount that we have to pay? Yeah. They won, but the insurer appealed the case, which led to more waiting. This was for the mitigation. You won your case over a year ago, mm -hmm. yes. It's been like a year and a half. Do you feel like the... Insurance companies just aren't playing by the rules you guys all set up to play by? I really, truly believe that, you know. Uh, and it's not just for us, it's for so many thousands of people from this area that's gone through and went through the same thing that we've went through. I was a client of this company for over 20 years with no missed payments. But when it's time for us to be able to receive, we have to go through this. And I don't think it's right. I've been all around every street. You know. Attorney Michael Cox represented the Guillories, along with hundreds of similar cases in the area. When you have this massive catastrophe, I think the insurance companies came in. They know statistically that most people will just walk away with the mistreatment, and they did. You know, most people won't fight like Charles and Tammy fought. They stood up for themselves, and they were willing to go all the way to the mat with this company. I got good news for you. Yeah? Court of Appeals ruled today. Well, what we got? You win. Come on, man. We did it. Some great news, 
Y'all fought the good fight and won. After a long, bitter battle, while the Guillories had a happy ending, Louisiana still has the third highest insurance premiums in the entire country. The insurance market here has been deteriorating since the state was hit by record hurricane activity three years ago, which caused upwards of $23 billion in damage in Louisiana, leaving many carriers to back out of the state. 12 insurers declared insolvent because of losses from that period. Another 12 voluntarily withdrew. And in just the last two years, the Louisiana State Plan, called Louisiana Citizens Property Insurance Corp., more than tripled from 35,000 to 128,000 policyholders. The drama in Louisiana was that the state insurance regulator uh, increased premiums by 65% earlier this year for the state-run plan. And that was a recognition that they simply didn't have enough capital on hand to weather uh, an even moderate storm. Um, and so um, there was a big outcry. The state government approved a $45 million fund in February of this year to help stabilize the market. Insurance Commissioner Jim Donilon says it's a first step to court companies to come back to the state. That's a balance between the obligation we have to make insurance available, attract companies, and the obligation we have to make them responsive and, and fair with their policyholders. A major kink in the chain is often one thing, reinsurance. Reinsurance is most easily thought of as insurance for insurance companies. So insurance companies are going to take on risky policies from homeowners all over the country, and they're going to have a portfolio of risk, and they'd like to pre protect themselves from the, the worst case scenarios. With many high risk areas of the US seeing more costly natural disasters, the price for them to stay is increasing too. They have a lot of influence in the decisions that insurers make. They have invested heavily in climate modeling and they have some of the best data and the best models out there. And because this is the only business that they do, they have a lot of money at stake. One solution, fortifying homes to withstand these storms and reduce the need for insurance payouts to rebuild. Okay, what you currently see here are equivalent to Category 5 hurricane force winds. Here at the University of Miami, researchers are testing how to fortify against these storms, showing us that the way we build could be the one key to reversing the insurance market. Forces, the first round of Hamas hostages have been transferred to the Red Cross. This is part of a new deal that took effect overnight, including a fragile and temporary pause in the fighting. Let's get right to Matt Gutman, who's in Tel Aviv, Israel, with the very latest. Matt, what are you learning? We understand that the Red Cross is now in possession of those hostages. We don't know how many they are. This transfer is now occurring in the Gaza Strip. The Red Cross, of course, a key conduit for this hostage swap. They're going to be taking the hostages from Hamas in Gaza, transferring them through Egypt and into Israel. It's there that a special unit who's been trained in dealing with hostages is going to intake them. They're going to give them a quick medical check. At that point, they'll also uh, verify their identification. They don't exactly know who's going to be coming across the border. They'll also be handed phones, and at that moment, they'll be able to call their family members, their loved ones, for the first time in 47 days. This is happening right now. At that point, uh, some of them will be reunited with family. Those who need medical care will be flown to hospitals in Israel, where a team of psychologists is waiting to deal with these people who have obviously undergone significant trauma over the, over the past couple, uh, couple of days. And that's, of course, where they will be also physically reunited with family members. Again, this is ongoing and have not crossed the border into Egypt or Israel yet, but this is a very good first sign that this hostage swap is starting to take place as planned and on time with. An encouraging sign indeed, Matt. Thank you. And just a reminder, viewers, again, as part of this deal that was laid out, 13 hostages held in Gaza would uh, eventually be released uh, back to Israel in exchange for 39 Palestinian prisoners, mostly women and teenagers. And then if the ceasefire would hold over the co course of four days, more and more of those hostages would be released. Let's go in and bring in our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang. She is traveling with the president in Nantucket. And Selena, we know President Biden has been heavily involved in the negotiations, and there's the hope and the possibility that Americans could be involved. 
Exactly, Whit. President Biden may be on holiday here, but he has been working the phone, staying in close contact with regional partners to ensure that this deal actually gets carried through. This is incredibly high stakes, high pressure for the Biden administration with senior administration officials telling me that Biden has been very hands on in this process and personally involved in the negotiations. He had personally urged the Emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to do so as well. As you say, there's hope that three Americans will be included in this initial hostage release deal, but we still don't know yet who is going to be out, who is going to be on that list. President Biden here in Nantucket had said that he's keeping his fingers crossed that three-year-old Abigail Moore Idan, whose parents were killed by Hamas, that she will be included in this initial hostage release. But U.S. officials here Whit, have been very careful to say that nothing here is done until they actually see this happen. Incredibly fragile and delicate. Absolutely. So far, that ceasefire, that temporary pause in the fighting has held as this initial wave of hostages have been handed over. Again, we're still waiting on numbers, getting more information, but they have been handed over to the Red Cross. We will continue to bring you breaking developments throughout the course of the day here on ABC News. Selena, thank you, and our thanks to Matt Gutman. Again, we'll have breaking news alerts on ABC News Live, our streaming channel, and abcnews.com, and then we'll have a full wrap-up later tonight on World News Tonight with David Muir. For now, I'm with Johnson in New York. We'll send you back to regular programming. This has been a special report from ABC News. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. We were watching uh, that continuing coverage again of that expected hostage release. Uh, we're now getting word that the first group of hostages held by Hamas have been released as part of this deal between Israel and Hamas. Now, as part of the deal, a small group of hostages will be released uh, where we were expecting 13. It's still not clear if that's exactly the number released in this first group. But for the deal in total, we are expecting roughly 50 hostages to be released in total over the next four days. In exchange for Hamas uh, and Hamas affiliated groups releasing those hostages, uh, Israel has agreed to release a group of Palestinian prisoners being held in the West Bank. Uh, and so Israel will start, uh, presumably will start releasing those prisoners uh, now that Hamas has released this first group of hostages. We are awaiting more information again on exactly how many uh, hostages were expected to be in this first group. They were expected to uh, include three Americans uh, and were expected to be roughly 13 in total women and children. Children, uh, that had been taken by Hamas in that October 7th attack and again expected to be released. This was a deal, lengthy process brokered uh, in part by Qatar and the U.S. looking to help these two sides come together. And in exchange, it also comes with a four-day pause in fighting. That went into effect overnight. We're, of course, monitoring that closely. But in exchange for all of these uh, releases, in particular the Israeli hostages being released, Israel has agreed to this pause in fighting, this temporary ceasefire, if you will, over the course of the next four days. Now, U.S. officials now say they are trying to take advantage of that four-day pause in the fighting to try to get extra aid into Gaza, which, of course, has been decimated over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, fuel is particularly short. Power outages everywhere, including in hospitals, which is jeopardizing the ability to provide medical care in those hospitals. And, of course, they're needing so much more aid. Uh, and so U.S. officials are now saying that with this expected four-day pause in the fighting, they are looking for a surge in aid. And, of course, watching that deal so closely, again, Israel, over the course of the next four Four days. We'll be watching closely. Hamas is expected to release uh, those hostages over the course of the next four days, and then Israel, in exchange, expected to release some prisoners being held in the West Bank. Uh, now, earlier, Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman was in Tel Aviv speaking to crisis negotiator Moti Crystal. Uh, Moti has served on various Israeli negotiation teams in the past, including brokering deals with Palestinians, and he is now adding some color on what went into this deal and what happens to it now. Hey, Diane. So, Moti, what are the kinds of things that we should expect in the next hours? We are told that the hostages should have been released by now. What should people expect? Well, I think that uh, Hamas are really going to make this happen. Uh, they added just in the last uh, hour 
they added the 12 uh, Thais uh, hostages. Uh, this is a deal that was uh, not brokered uh, through the Israeli channel. Uh, we knew it was published that the Thai government are working independently through Iran, uh, try to uh, free their uh, people. And uh, actually, you know, Hamas is playing in, in the international arena. And uh, Iran is a sponsor of Hamas, part of the axis of terror, axis of uh, evil. So we do expect this 12 ties to be released and these 13 Israelis to be um, coming to the Rafah crossing point. So all of them are coming out, so we're now going to have 25 hostages who've been that's, held that's who are likely going plan. to be released. That's the plan. Uh, 13 uh, Israelis, uh, kids, uh, mothers, uh, hopefully elderly women as well to be released. They will be handed over from the Red Cross to, through the Egyptians to the Israeli military. The Israeli military is deployed in full deployment, um, uh, military of course, but also health and mental support. Uh, they will be examined uh, with the, uh, through uh, Israeli doctors, military doctors, and if they need some emergency or medical, additional medical treatment, they will be uh, flown to the Israeli hospitals. Uh, if not, they will meet uh, in a secluded uh, uh, compound with their families. At the base in the south? One of the bases in the south, yes. So let's say Hamas follows through, and both sides follow through, the ceasefire extends for four days, 50 hostages come back, plus the 12 ties, maybe others that you mentioned. What happens then? And what about the rest of the 180, 190 well, hostages? Uh, so many pieces in this puzzle might, might fall apart. We do expect Hamas to prolong because there is a, there's an element, there's an incentive mechanism within the deal that for any 10 additional 10 hostages, Hamas can buy another uh, 24 hours of, of ceasefire. Hamas will try to extend. They will try to say, we are getting there, give us another day, another day. I think that this will be prolonged for six, seven, eight days. There will be a point of time that uh, this will fall apart and Israel will resume its uh, military operation. Why? Because Israel is committed, and, and you see around, you see the sentiment, Israel is committed to bring back all the hostages, either through military uh, operation or through deals or through international pressures. You worked on the Shalit deal. Correct. This is the last question. You worked on the Shalit deal, and that took six years to finalize. Is there a chance that the Israeli soldiers and men who are still being held there might have to spend years in Hamas captivity? The long, the short answer is yes, unfortunately. And the reason for that is something happened on October 7th. It's not just a, a, a barbaric terror attack by Hamas. Something changed in the mindset of the Israelis and we understand that we no longer um, can get quick results. We are going, it's going to take time. Yes, it's okay. going to take time. So Diane, uh, back to you, but the news that we haven't heard, apparently 12 Thai workers who are citizens of Thailand will also be released as part of this deal, hopefully in the coming hours. Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, thank you. And uh, ABC's Patrick Rival joins me now from Tel Aviv with more on this uh, latest on the hostage exchange. Patrick, uh, we're hearing that this first group of 13 has now been handed over. What happens to them now and what do we know about this group? Hi, Dan. Yeah, we're hearing that they have now been handed over to the Red Cross via the Rafa crossing out into Egypt. We don't know yet how many were in this group. We know that 13 were supposed to be handed over. We hope, of course, that it is all 13. Now we know that they're going to be flown um, from there to a military base in Israel. They're also going to be met by a specially trained IDF force, which includes um, commandos but also psychologists who are going to first take biometric scans to check that they have the people they're supposed to have. And then they're going to allow them to speak to their families for the first time by phone. They're then going to be flown to this military base in the south of Israel. And then after that, after being debriefed by intelligence officers briefly, they're going to be brought here to hospitals in Tel Aviv, we believe to five hospitals here, where they will, some of them will require probably urgent medical care. Um, we don't know what state these people are in. We don't know if some of them could have been wounded even during the attack on October 7th. But they will be brought here and they will be given then the opportunity in the hospitals to finally meet their families after 49 days. 
And Patrick, what about the, the hostages themselves? What do we know about them? Who are they? Yeah, as we say, we don't know a great deal. What we do know is that, unfortunately, um, the three-year-old Abigail Moore is in, three-year-old American, I should say, is not among them, apparently, today, although she is expected to be freed, or at least is on the list to be freed. We know that these are women and children who are being released. I think it's believed that it's likely a, a significant number of those freed would be children. We've seen preparations by the IDF to receive children, including getting toys ready um, and especially training uh, their soldiers to also not answer uh, too many questions to these children immediately because un unfortunately many of the children held hostage in Gaza right now lost their parents or at least one or both of their parents in the October 7th attack and so obviously it's very very delicate how these people are going to be handled they've gone through an extraordinary ordeal. So Patrick walk us through the timeline here because Palestinian prisoners uh, are also being released as part of this deal so what does the timeline look like for this exchange over the next four days? So, firstly, we understand that today around 39 um, Palestinian prisoners, again, mostly women and teenagers, are going to be freed from an Israeli prison. We've actually seen video of prison trucks go going to a prison that's going to, uh, we're going to take these prisoners out and take them to places back, mostly inside the West Bank um, and also in Jerusalem. As in terms of the timeline, yes, so basically over the next four days of this ceasefire, we're going to, in theory, go through this every day where we see hopefully another batch of hostages, around 10 or 12, will be released. There's then the possibility that it could be extended another day. In theory, Israel has said they'll extend the ceasefire each day that Hamas releases another 10. There are about 236 hostages that we're aware of being kept in Gaza. And so there is a possibility that this can be extended. But of course, as the more this goes on, there's going to start to be more and more tension between Israel's desire desire to continue its operation inside inside Gaza as well as Hamas possibly taking the advantage uh, taking advantage of the situation to try and draw out the ceasefire as long as possible and Patrick what is the reaction to all of this there in Israel uh, what are people saying as they hear about this first release and, and wait for more yeah, I mean, I think the whole country obviously has been watching this. I was just walking around earlier and everywhere is plastered with the, with the words, bring them home. I mean, this is a huge national trauma for Israel. And so this is a huge moment if they are. Um, but this is a huge moment that they're being brought out. Now, the ceasefire, of course, is also a huge moment in this war because it's the first break in the fighting, the first real break in the fighting since this war began. But at the same time, when we speak to people here, there's no indication that we're hearing from the IDF or from senior Israeli officials that they intend this to be anything more than a break. They say that once the hostages are out, that this operation will begin again in full, in full force. And it's been interesting that today we've seen people trying to go back to their homes in Gaza. We've seen um, civilians who are displaced placed from northern Gaza to southern Gaza. They've been trying to get back to their homes in the north, which has been completely destroyed in many areas. But they've been prevented by the IDF. The IDF have said, do not try to come back. This is only a pause. The fighting will continue. And we've seen already clashes where IDF troops have opened fire on some of the Palestinian civilians trying to return. We know that several people were injured. We've heard that two people were killed in those clashes. And of course, every time that that happens, every time we have these clashes where there are people killed or injured inside Gaza, that can put at risk the continuation of this deal. All right, ABC's Patrick Rievel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, thank you. So again, 13 of those hostages taken by Hamas on October 7th have now been released. I want to go over to ABC News contributor, national security defense analyst Mick Mulroy for what happens next in this process, because Mick, this is just, this is the beginning of a process for this group of hostages. So walk us through what happens now that they are in the care of the International Red Cross. So, Diane, it's likely that they'll immediately be seen by trained professionals, both medical professionals and psychological uh, counselors. Uh, it's going to be very traumatic uh, to be released like this. Obviously, they've been through uh, an incredible amount of trauma itself. Uh, normally, when it comes to military members, we have been trained to deal with a lot of the, the issues that come up in, when you're in custody. Uh, they have not. So that's going to be the first, I believe. There may be a short intelligence brief to try to gather any information that's time sensitive. They might not know that they have information of import, but that is be determined by the intelligence services. Then I think they'll be allowed to be back with their families, uh, to, to assimilate back with their families. And then a longer term intelligence debrief would probably follow after that because they have a lot of information that they might not think is relevant, but could be very relevant to the recovery of other hostages, especially if those recoveries have to be done 
by a military uh, operation. So in terms of reuniting them with family, who I'm sure they're dying to see, we know their families are certainly dying to see them, how long will that process take, do you think, and, and how delicate is that process? So I think it might be dependent on the reaction of that individual hostage or former hostage in the treatment. Some may have more trauma that need to be addressed. Uh, some, they might be assessed, can go uh, quicker. I don't know that they will treat them all as one group. Uh, of course, the families will also be counseled on what they should do and not do and say and not say uh, when they are uh, reunited with their family members, because that can also cause a lot of issues. I'm not a psychological expert by any means, but I have been involved in the recovery of hostages. And I know that these are some of the things uh, from the past that we do much better now than we did uh, in years gone by. And Mick, what about from an intelligence perspective? Because these hostages could have information that can help the IDF uh, maybe find the remaining hostages and find some of the Hamas officials that they're looking for. So uh, walk us through that part of things. How do you strike that balance between obviously wanting to look out for these individuals and their mental health and help them recover from what they've been through, but also try to get whatever helpful information they might have? Well, that's right, Diane. They might have information that they just don't know is relevant about where they were, where they, when they were moved, how many times a day were they moved, uh, what did they see when they originally came out of the tunnels, uh, and then they can take that information that they might have, and then it will be sent through all the intelligence services to, to try to determine where and when they were at certain places, because that could be very important to the point of your question when it comes to a recovery operation uh, of a military operation of the hostages that may not be released. All this could be incredibly important uh, for the future. Again, they might not know they have this information, but it could be really helpful uh, going forward. So Mick, what are you watching for over the course of these next four days now, and how fragile is this agreement at this point? Could it still fall apart? Well, it certainly could, but I think what we should look for is uh, these are two, this is an agreement where two sides really do not trust each other. So every step of the way that we're monitoring today is a competence measure with the other side to then take their action. And so I think if we see uh, the, if this goes smoothly today, then it is, it is a good sign that it will keep going for these four days of this truce. And at, when that's over, if this is working for both sides, it might be extended. So I think we should look for uh, basically a validation of the agreement in each step. And I think that's gonna bode well for this continuing. And it's also important to note that when we do get to a place where there could be a ceasefire agreed to by both parties, that this mechanism might be the way to do it, especially if it works for the hostages. That would give, I think, trust uh, in both sides of this conflict uh, in this process. All right, Mick Mulroy, thank you, Mick. Thanks, Brian. And I'm Diane Macedo. You're watching ABC News Live's continuing coverage of the hostage swap between Israel and Hamas, a, a rather hostage prisoner swap. Uh, the first group of hostages held by Hamas has now been freed. Uh, they're in custody of the International Committee of the Red Cross, according to sources. A total of 50 hostages are expected to be freed over the course of the next four days, released to Israel, though it's unclear how many are now in custody of the Red Cross. Now, in exchange, Israel is expected to release a number of Palestinian prisoners from an Israeli jail uh, in the West Bank or a few Israeli jails. Now, this is happening seven weeks after the more than 230 hostages were taken by Hamas during that October 7th attack. Israel, though, is stressing that this temporary ceasefire does not mean the war is over. ABC's Patrick Rievel joins me now from Tel Aviv with the latest, along with senior White House correspondent Selena Wang and security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy for more. Uh, Patrick, I want to start with you. What do we know at this point about this group of hostages released? Hi, Diane. Yeah, we know that they've now been handed over to the Red Cross. They've been brought out from the Rafah crossing into Egypt. We don't know how many have been handed over. We know it was supposed to be 13, but we have not yet had it confirmed how many have been handed over. Of course, we hope that it is all of them. We also don't know who among them, who is among them, really. We know, though, that there are around 30 children in the list of 50, and the rest are al almost all women. Um, and we, it's likely that today a number of children will be, will be freed. Um, we know also that from the list that Hamas has provided, that on the full list, 
Three of them are Americans, including three-year-old Abigail Moradin, um, who unfortunately, as far as we understand, will not be freed in this release today, but will hopefully be freed in the coming days as, the, as it goes on. I mean, for now, we don't yet know a great deal about who has been handed over. We know that they are going to be flown to a military base in southern Israel and then brought here to Tel Aviv to be treated in five hospitals. Of course, they've gone through an appalling ordeal, and many of them may require medical attention. Some of them, it's possible, were even wounded in the October 7th attack. We know also um, that they will be met by a special IDF team who have been trained in how to receive very vulnerable hostages, in particular very young children. Some of the hostages are only around three years old, um, and many of them are very young children. And so these, these, as far as we understand, they will be scanned for, biometric, for, for biometrics to try and make sure that they have the right people. They'll then be given a phone call um, to their loved ones. They'll also have a brief intelligence debriefing to try and glean any information that might help the IDF presumably understand where the other hostages might have been held. But for now, we, are, we know that they're going to be flown to this airbase and we expect them to arrive later tonight here in Tel Aviv to be put into these hospitals. Uh, Selena, how's the White House reacting to this news? Well, look, this is incredibly high stakes, high pressure for the Biden administration. As officials have been telling me that President Biden has been personally very involved in the negotiation process and what they call a weeks long excruciating process to get to this point. But U.S. officials still making clear that, look, nothing is done here until it actually happens. And we're only in day one of what's supposed to be a four day pause. As you just heard, we don't know yet who's going to be on this first list. And in the coming days, there is hope that three Americans will be included in this initial hostage release deal to women and three-year-old Abigail Moridan. As of yesterday, President Biden said he's keeping his fingers crossed that she will be released. We know that President Biden, even though he is here for Thanksgiving holiday in Nantucket, he's been working the phone, staying in close contact with regional leaders here to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. We know he had phone calls this week with the leaders of Israel, Egypt, as well as Qatar. And we also know that President Biden, according to administration officials, had personally urged the Emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal, as well as for Israel's prime minister to accept it. We've really seen a big shift in the Biden administration since this conflict first began. What started out as this full throttled support for Israel's right to defend itself, as we've seen that shift to more calls for humanitarian pauses, for humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. We also just got a statement from USAID saying that this is a much needed four day pause to get much needed life saving aid into the people who are living in Gaza but there needs to be significant sustained changes to allow a ramp up in aid to get in over the long term. So Patrick, what happens to these hostages now? What's next in this process? Yeah, we know that they're being flown, as I say, to this military base in the south, and then they will be brought here to Tel Aviv um, for, to be placed in five hospitals. We know that they're going to be debriefed briefly by intelligence officers. They're going to be checked um, for their biometrics to see that they are indeed who is supposed to be handed over. And at some point, they will meet their families for the first time in the hospitals here in Tel Aviv, which, of course, will be a very difficult process for everyone. It's enormous. It'll be an enormous relief. But, of course, you know, this is just the beginning for these hostages to recover because they've gone through such a traumatic experience and there's also you know one of the things that is uh, one of the really dark things here is that some of these children who are, who are going to be released in the next few days we hope um, their at least one or more of their parents in many cases was killed in the October 7th attack it's quite possible they don't yet know that and so their families are going to have to explain that to some of these children so Selena what do things look like in the White House right now? What is President Biden trying to do to ensure that this deal goes through as planned? Well, look, President Biden, he is still here in Nantucket, but we know that he is closely monitoring the situation. He hasn't left his house yet, it appears, but we know that he's watching this closely. He's been working the phones with regional leaders this entire past week. President Biden yesterday said that he may address this issue today, but again, U.S. officials being very clear, they don't want to jump the gun here and that nothing is done until it's actually happened. The U.S. wants to see this entire deal work out as agreed, given all the mistrust here. There is concern about how fragile this is the 50 hostages release over the course of four days as well as Israel holding up its side of the bargain releasing 150 150 Palestinian prisoners but also there the US officials say that there's the potential that this temporary ceasefire could be extended beyond the four days 
if Hamas continues to release more hostages. Again, the U.S. here working the phones with regional leaders and senior administration officials tell me that in the early days of the crisis to help get to this point, a secret cell of top Biden aides was working behind the scenes with Israel and Qatar, which has been acting as this critical intermediary to work on this broader hostage deal. All right, ABC News contributor, security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy. Mick, I also want to ask you about the next steps here, because while, you know, obviously the reception in Israel, everybody is very anxious to get these 50 hostages, roughly 50 from this deal home, but that still leaves more than 100 that are thought to be being held by Hamas. So what happens to that group once this deal is over? So, Diane, once uh, we expect all 50 come out, 10, roughly 10 every day during the period of the truce, uh, per the agreement, the truce is then over unless it is extended. If it is extended, uh, my understanding, it will be in the same scenario. So one day for 10 uh, hostages to come out. If it's not extended, then we'll see this combat operation uh, resume. And then you'll see uh, all the devastation that we expected to see, because right now, this is when the IDF is really going to be getting into these tunnels and really going after the Hamas uh, fighters and leadership. So if it's not extended, we can expect to see the combat operations to fully resume. Selena, next steps for President Biden here? He'll be continuing to speak to those regional leaders. We know that this week in those calls with Israel, Egypt, and Qatar, they discussed about how they want to make use of this time. They want to talk about protecting civilian lives as well as how to eventually secure the release of all of the remaining hostages. As you say, this is just a portion of them. And there are still several Americans unaccounted for. The hope is that three of them, two women and one three-year-old, will be included in this initial release. U.S. officials also say they want to make use of this time to potentially set up safe zones as well as surging that humanity humanitarian aid into Gaza. So critical pieces here as a president still urging for restraint here as he's showing that support for Israel since this conflict began. President Biden has had more than a dozen calls with Israel's prime minister as well as that face to face meeting. And Mick, what are you watching for over the next four days? Any kind of red flags or concerns you're keeping an eye on? Well, I think it's important to point out that this is the this is the cessation of major combat operations. It's going to rely on the discipline, quite frankly, of, uh, of a giant uh, terrorist organization. So you might see some small skirmishes. The IDF forces are going to go into what's called a strong point defensive position where they can defend themselves, but basically hunker down during the, the, the course of the truce itself. But they have the right to self-defense. So we could see some small skirmishes. I don't think that necessarily means the, the agreement is broken, as long as both sides understand that that certainly could be the case. I do also see, of course, that they will be maneuvering. Uh, one of the reasons why Hamas was so adamant about these drones not being allowed to fly for a certain period of time in this agreement was because they're going to want to reposition themselves. They're going to want to move their leadership. They're going to want to move their troops to get a tactical advantage over the IDF. Like, the IDF knew this. They accepted it. It's just part of getting their hostages back. But I think you'll be seeing a lot of that go on during this truce. Patrick, what is it like in Israel right now? How are people responding to at least the, the first stage in this deal seemingly going through as planned? You know, I think the entire country has been waiting with bated breath to see if this is going to happen because there is intense, intense suspicion of Hamas here. And uh, their experience over the many years, over decades of this conflict, is that they don't believe that um, a deal is done until it really happens. They always fear that it could fall apart at the last minute. And so I think, that, yes, there's a great deal of relief and celebration that these people are finally being released. But now, of course, there is a great deal of trepidation because they're going to go through this all over again tomorrow, in, in theory, because, of course, this, this is a four-day truce where we hope we're going to see all 50 hostages released and then hopefully extended. I mean, also, this is a major moment because the ceasefire has now held, for the re at least for today so far. Um, this is a very big moment in this war. It's the first time that we've seen a break in the fighting since the war, uh, since the war began. But inside Gaza, the situation is very complicated. We know the IDF has ordered civilians there not to try to return to northern Gaza. Those who are displaced by the fighting and who have flooded down into southern Gaza, they've been told, don't try and come back. This is only a temporary pause. We are going to resume in full force once this pause is over, but we've still seen today thousands of Palestinian civilians trying to return to northern Gaza and being blocked by the IDF. There's actually been clashes. We know that the IDF has opened fire at some checkpoints on, it, on Palestinian civilians. We know at least several people were injured. We've heard that two were killed. And of course, every time that you have these clashes, that
that means that this could potentially jeopardize the extension of this deal because every time you see Palestinians hurt or injured there, you see the risk that Hamas will say, enough, we're not, we're not carrying on with this and we're not going to go on with this deal. Selena, U.S. officials are saying they're also hoping to take advantage of this four-day pause in the fighting to get more aid into Gaza. What's going on on that part? Yeah, this is critical humanitarian aid. This includes water, food, medical supplies, things to keep people alive in Gaza. But again, the USAID saying that need, more needs to be done here beyond just this four-day pause. That is enough, not enough to surge in the aid that's needed. They need to create a structure for a significant ramp up over the long term. And just speaking to what Mick and Patrick have been saying about the delicacy here and how many weeks it took to just get to this point. I mentioned earlier that there was this secret cell of top Biden aides, according to what senior administration officials have been saying that was working behind the scenes with Israel and Qatar. And through that process, they had a test run. They said that the release that we saw last month of two of Americans, that was a proof of concept that this secret cell could actually deliver from there. They tried to work on this broader hostage release deal, but talks stalled several times. At one point, Hamas broke off talks as well. So that just shows how fragile and delicate the situation here and speaks to why U.S. officials have been so careful about now, not just jumping the gun, saying this deal isn't done until we actually see it happen. And the White House really painting President Biden as playing a critical role in getting to this point. They do not want to see this deal fall apart. Even from here in Nantucket, the president watching this very closely and will be monitoring to see if he does end up speaking up today about this deal. All right, Patrick, Selena, Mick, thank you all. And we will have much more continuing coverage on the hostage release right after the break. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. You're watching ABC News continuing coverage of the hostage swap between Israel and Hamas. The first group of hostages has been freed by Hamas in Gaza and now in custody of the International Committee of the Red Cross, according to sources. A total of 50 hostages are expected to be freed and released into Israel in total over the next four days. But it's unclear how many are in custody of the Red Cross right now. 
Now, in exchange, Israel is expected to release a number of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. This is happening seven weeks after more than 230 hostages were taken by Hamas during the October 7th attack. But Israel is stressing this temporary ceasefire does not mean the war is over. ABC News contributor and security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy joins me now for more. Mick, what's your top concern now that this first group of hostages has been released? So, Diane, I think it's that it's consistent because this is a very delicate process. Both sides do not trust each other. But every step that actually happens, I think, will give them more confidence that it will continue to happen. So there's so many moving parts. We have hostages being released, prisoners being released, uh, food aid coming in around 200 trucks, fuel, which was a big issue in the, dis in the discussion, is being brought in. Uh, I think 100, uh, or excuse me, 1,000 liters today, which will be distributed across Gaza. There's all sorts of different parts moving. I think what we should be looking at is that it stays consistent, because if it stays consistent, it likely will continue. And of course, all in addition to all the things I just mentioned, there's a truce. So that is a very tenuous situation uh, in Gaza right now. I think both sides understand there could be some skirmishes. Uh, there could be things that happen that don't necessarily in the truce, and I hope that is what's uh, viewed by both sides, that this is moving forward and they should continue. In exchange for the release of these hostages, Israel has agreed to release some prisoners being held uh, in a prison in the Israeli, in, in the West Bank. What do we know about that part of this exchange? Who is being released and how the timeline is going to work here? So it's my understanding it's women and, and uh males under 18. Um, so they could be what we call fighting age males, although it shouldn't be. They shouldn't be fighting age males to 18. But Hamas of, often uses 16 and 17 year olds to fight, as does a lot of terrorist organizations, unfortunately. But those are the groups that are going to be released. And there's going to be a process where they get released from IDF to the Palestinian Authority. And that's part of this process. All right. Mick Mulroy, always great to have your analysis. Thank you. And we will stay on top of the hostage release in the Middle East, but also coming up, the major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Also ahead, the travel crunch is on. Find out if severe weather will interfere with your plans as Americans head out in record numbers this Black Friday. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. 
We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Grab your coat if you're heading out to shop or travel today because some of the coldest air of the season is moving into parts of the country. Sam Champion is tracking the cold as well as a cross-country storm. Sam? Here's another winter storm, this one coming at the end of the holiday for everyone's travel home. So remember the one coming to the holiday just before it was a little bit troublesome and problematic. This one could slow things down, but it should not shut things down. Let's talk about the winter weather warnings and watches that are out right now for about 14 states. This is about 9 million people that are covered here. And this is where the storm continues to develop today, just kind of sitting still, but then slowly moving east after that. From Denver all the way to Boulder, this is like one to three inches of snow right in that area, but higher in the mountains could be another foot of snow. So as this moves into Kansas City, 7 p.m. Saturday to 5 a.m. on Sunday, that's the time that Kansas City is kind of involved in this. And it's a light snow for KC, but there's a little icy mix in some of that as well. So as we get to Chicagoland, and you're looking at this as an all-Sunday event, 5 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. And Chicagoland, this is not a big snow for us. We kind of get big snows. This is one to three, could be a little bit more in northern areas. But again, this is the kind of thing that might slow you down. It does not stop you. Detroit, the similar situation, most of the snow pushes into Canada, and it becomes a wet system with maybe just a little bit of high elevation northern New England snow, but not much at that. And if you look at the rainfall totals by the time we get to Sunday into Monday, for Boston, it's maybe one to two inches of, of rain. For New York, it's probably about an inch of rain. So that's way different from the storm that got us into the holiday and a lot less rain. Here's your travel Sunday, and you can see how quiet it is out west, so everything should be fine. There should not be any issues here, but there may be just some volume slowdowns. And if you combine that with some of the weather, it could mean the planes don't get where they're supposed to. So still connect your airports, still make sure you know what's going on. Be careful on those roads because there's a lot of volume and just a little slippery mess. Diane? Sam Champion, thank you. And here are some of the top headlines we're following for you today. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been serving a prison sentence for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home on Valentine's Day in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. The Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly crash sent the vehicle soaring through the air and set off a fiery explosion. The car's two passengers, identified as husband and wife, are dead. One booth agent is recovering from non-life-threatening injuries. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News Live presents The American Classroom. Here now, ABC's Deborah Roberts. Hi, everybody, and thanks for streaming with us. I'm Deborah Roberts. ABC News is marking American Education Week by highlighting the many contributions of educators and students all across the country, while also taking a closer look at the future of education after unprecedented challenges since the pandemic. We're going to bring you reports from my ABC News colleagues on efforts to get students and teachers back into our nation's classrooms. But first, we begin with growing concerns about lead-contaminated drinking water in many of our nation's public schools. I joined up with our ABC News investigative team looking into dozens of schools, and we discovered that in one district just 40 miles outside of New York City, kids haven't been able to use their school water fountains for years. I wake up at 6 in the morning, I get ready, my bus comes at 7 o'clock, usually a little bit earlier than that. Having the right to an education is very important to me because I come from a family who didn't have access to education and I try my best to get the education that I need so I can succeed. 16-year-old Francis Galicia, a high school student at the East Ramapo Central School District in New York, is fighting for something many Americans take for granted. We don't have access to running water where you have a water fountain. They don't acknowledge the fact that we're struggling. But now I'm here telling you that we are struggling. In this school district just north of New York City, nearly 10,000 students who attend the 13 public schools in the area have limited access to safe running drinking water. Why can't you use the water fountain? because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Some drinking fountains in the district were shut off in 2016 after lead was detected in the water, traced back to the school's fixtures. The school district says it's providing bottled water for the students to drink while waiting for a more permanent fix. Are they fixing the problem? No, they're not because we run out of that water as soon as it gets hot. If your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. A state-mandated survey of the public school buildings this year found them to be in failing condition, partly due to the lack of clean running water. There are those who would argue that school systems are scrambling to do more with less. They're tapped out when it comes to money. They're working you know, hard to do a lot with what they have, what little they have. This isn't a new problem in East Ramapo. Every child has the right to go to the public schools in East Ramapo, like every place else. And the government is responsible to make those schools a place where education happens and that is safe. The kids of East Ramapo are not alone. Across the nation, many schools are dealing with issues of lead, which can enter the water through pipes or plumbing fixtures containing lead. Lead is baked into how it is we deliver water through the pipes and in our homes. Even if you go to a hardware store and you find something that's labeled lead-free, they allow 0.25% lead. Medical experts say children are particularly vulnerable to lead's toxic effects. It can cause brain damage. It can cause these irreversible long-term changes that can affect things such as behavior, attention, learning. The list goes on and it's devastating. But no one really knows how widespread the danger is in schools because there's no federal law requiring testing for lead in schools that get water from public water systems, which supply water to about 90% of the U.S. population. 
And state regulations for schools vary, with the majority not requiring tests. Unfortunately, school regulation is mostly voluntary. Unless the states or local school districts are prioritizing it, mostly folks don't know what's going on. Lead can be odorless. The water can still appear clear. It's not like if your water is tainted with lead, it's going to be brown or it's going to have some symbol where you can say, this is lead. The EPA does require schools and daycares that operate on their own water system, about 10% of all schools, to test and make the results public. An ABC News analysis of this data revealed that of the more than 7,000 school systems required to test by the EPA, 77% of test samples had some level of lead contamination, 16% were in the double digits, and 6% exceeded the EPA's recommended maximum threshold. It's important for people to understand that there is no safe level of lead for consumption. We wanted to know where schools stand now with lead levels in their water. So it's the same water line. So ABC News teamed up with eight ABC TV stations across the nation to gain access and information from schools about lead in their water. Reaching out to more than 130 school districts across 11 states, districts that represent more than 4,000 schools with more than 3 million students who rely on schools to provide them with water for most of the week. Of the schools we reached out to, 41 agreed to answer questions via email or over the phone, and the responses on what they were doing to track lead in their water varied, some saying they were part of a voluntary testing program, others saying they plan to test soon. 15 school districts or companies that tested on their behalf did agree to speak with our team, like in Indiana. Do you think that people would be surprised to find out that there is lead found in our schools? I think they would be. Atlanta. We got to protect our students. We got to protect our employees. <laughs> and Jersey City, where fixing the problem came at high costs. It's about another $5 million to finish this project. It's very expensive. Some school districts, like in Chicago, describing their results. Roughly 10% of the samples exceed the lead standard. So that's concerning. It is, but that's why we continually test flush uh, to make sure that we're meeting that Illinois Department of Public Health standard. But seven districts declined our request, and the majority of schools we reached out to, 75 districts, ignored our request, not responding at all. Advocates say communities of color often bear the brunt of lead issues in their water. In Flint, some allege the government was slow to act because the community is predominantly black. Government officials there deny that race was a factor. Back in New York, the state's Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU, has likened the situation in East Ramapo to environmental racism, since the majority of students are of color. The organization's calling for the state to intervene and take over. You sent a letter to Governor Hochul and other regulators comparing East Ramapo to, quote, the environmental racism seen in Flint, Michigan. Is it fair to compare this to Flint, though, when we're talking about a water system in Flint? And here we're talking about equipment, still not great. But is it fair to compare it to Flint? What went on in Flint was that people were put at risk. What's going on in East Ramapo is that children are being put at risk because they're going to school. And that's comparable. This is 21st century Jim Crow 40 miles from New York City. The East Ramapo School District, School Board, and the State of New York did not respond to our questions about claims of racial injustice. But the State and the School District telling us they're working to replace the fixtures by the start of the new school year. What do you want to see done? I just want to be in an environment where I don't feel like I've lost opportunities, where I'm allowed to the same things that other people are allowed to around the United States. I want the water contamination to go away. I want them to prioritize the need for clean, accessible water. Next, we ask the question, where are the kids? Millions of students are chronically missing from school since the pandemic with truancy and absenteeism at record highs. So ABC's Byron Pitts talked to some kids about what's stopping them from going to school and to adults who are dedicated to bringing them back. Hartford, Connecticut, called the insurance capital of the world. Rural class private schools to match. 
That's one heart. We rode around the other. Our tour guide and native son, a product of Hartford Public School. At age 49, Diego Lopez bears the scars of his schooling. What happened to your finger? Oh, so I was shot. You were shot? Yeah, I'm a four-time gunshot victim. Where? All over my body. Be specific. Like I was shot in the stomach, the chest, back, lower extremities, blew my finger off, the arm. It's like nine bullet holes. A ninth grade dropout, a former member of the Latin Kings, Lopez spent 10 years in a Connecticut state prison. He changed and became a counselor. Today, with one daughter in college, another who will attend soon, he's focused on helping children. The hard streets of Hartford, his office. Diego works with teenagers on the shy side of success. What's up, man? Byron Pitts, how you doing? Many of them high school dropouts, like Amanda. I was a junior when I dropped out. How long ago was that? Three, three. So you dropped out in the 11th grade. May I ask why? It was COVID. COVID, oh, I see. I felt like there was no need. Did school give up on you, or did you give up on school? It was kind of both. All right. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How do you tell someone that education is important when they're worried about getting killed or gang violence and all this other stuff that's going on in their life? And we expect our children to learn when they don't even know if they're going to live. So as you see, what's broken in schools? I don't think, you know, our kids think education is as important as it was before. I think our schools are just straight up just failing our kids. Those are hard truths in Hartford. In cities and poor communities across America, many desperate children feel like no one cares if they're in school, so they stop going. Am I even working hard enough? Should I just give up? I wouldn't be as motivated as I was before, and I would start skipping. Going to school started to become very, like, a big struggle for me when I started to struggle with my mental health. Children reaching a breaking point. Since the pandemic, students have disappeared from schools in alarming numbers. Over a quarter of all U.S. students, K through 12, miss 10% or more of school. They're considered chronically absent. COVID-19 really, I think, exacerbated a lot of the challenges that we saw around educational inequality and disparate outcomes among different groups of children. In our nation's capital, 48% of students are chronically absent. In California, 30%. Connecticut, 24. Educators feel the burden. I ask this question respectfully. Is the system broken? We in, in schools are, are tasked with solving for a lot. The fight for the future of America's children is at a crisis point. In 2021, there were 2 million dropouts. We're losing way too many children. They're either not showing up or they're leaving early and really not having any opportunities beyond that. Nationwide. For millions of students, a typical school day is filled with too many obstacles. From issues with transportation, caring for loved ones, to depression and anxiety, students are missing school. Every day, these compass peace builders, as they're called, go out into Hartford. I have a couple home visits. Meeting young people where they are. A youth in the hospital and then a mom. Offering job training, providing basic needs like food, clothing, shelter, and friendship. So the question of the day today is, what is an obstacle that keeps youth from going to school or causes them to drop out of school? I think one of the biggest issues is trauma. Um, we live in a traumatized environment, and our schools are not trauma-informed. This time last year, Genesis Luciano dropped out of school. Why'd you drop out? I was homeless. So mm. it was just a lot of stuff going on for me, and I just said I didn't want to do it anymore. How old were you? I was 17. So were you a good student in a bad situation, or were you in a bad situation and not really that good a student? I was a good student in a bad situation. And do you think the school didn't see you? The school didn't really understand me as much. In many parts of the country, programs are being tested to help students like Genesis, strategies to improve grades and attendance. From door knocking in Los Angeles, we knocked on 8,000 doors. To signs reminding kids to come to school in Alabama. Good morning. Good morning. To a truancy court in Nashville that tries to find solutions for each family based on the obstacles they face. 
a problem that affects all ages. Truancy can start young. Our kindergartners had a 25% chronic absenteeism. That was my first, you know, wake-up call. No one knows the stats or the stories better than Leslie Torres Rodriguez, superintendent of Hartford Public Schools, born in Puerto Rico, raised in Hartford. She is a product of the system she now runs. A five-year-old cannot get to school on their own. We knew that there were familial challenges, housing insecurity, unemployment, mm -hmm. health inequities that exist. One school in her district, Michael D. Fox Elementary, is hoping to solve that problem by bringing health care straight to its students, like this school medical clinic, equipped with a full dentist chair, even staffed by a physician's assistant. Down the hall, there's a food pantry. A lot of the systemic challenges that happen, all of that plays out in the classroom in our schools, and we have to solve for it. We're not gonna turn our back on our students. So in that regard, what grade would you give yourself? I could say we can always do more. I need a grade. Oh my goodness, you're gonna put me on the spot. Um, we're doing an average job. Your voice said average job, your eyes That's said. sadder. Yeah. It's sadder. Just as Luciano had her fair share of those obstacles, now she's enrolled in an alternative school in Hartford. During our interview, Genesis's peace builder, Haley Jones, grew emotional as she quietly watched. <laughs> Y'all crying over there? We asked her to join us. She's literally crying. Why are you crying? Because this is years, man. This is, this is years. This is like your heart. This is, I have like, this isn't about money. This is an investment of what I know. I poured everything that I, I could into her. Where might you be? With without her? I don't know. I would have been outside. I would have been in jail. I would have been nothing. In communities large and small like Hartford, there are countless children without hope, without school systems that work. But there are also adults who see them and their potential. Those adults are driven to act, often moved to tears. When's the last time you cried? I cry every day. I, I cry every day, man. I cry every day. I cry because I'm alive. I'm, I'm always thinking about the next day, about the next next great thing. When was the last time you cried? Probably yesterday. I see myself in our students regularly, and that that gets that gets to me. That gets to me. Our thanks to Byron for that report. Still ahead, we look at the nationwide teacher shortage through the eyes of one Texas school district. The American Classroom continues after this break. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Hit me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone lives. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance some more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. I've been running through the strange lives. Pictures on my phone lives. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Babe 
Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shohei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from a flood-ravaged Montpelier, Vermont, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The American Classroom continues. Here again, Deborah Roberts. As we all know, the pandemic wreaked havoc on our nation's schools, with tens of thousands of educators fleeing the field since 2020. But there are signs of progress. ABC's Maria Villarreal has a report on the efforts of one Texas school district to recruit and retain teachers. Friends, are you ready? Caitlin Ruiz is no stranger to Tosh Elementary School in Mesquite, Texas, a suburb just outside Dallas. It's super personal and super special to me because, I mean, I did walk these halls at one point. Bravery? Good. You think he's brave? I think so, too. I would be super brave to go against her, right? When this opportunity presented to get hired here, I mean, I was ecstatic and I felt like God put me here for a reason. It's a highlighted word because it's what? A vocabulary word. Good. A former student here, Ruiz, is now in her first year teaching fourth grade. After serving as a kindergarten paraprofessional or teaching assistant since 2021, the middle of the pandemic. I've never had a backup plan. Teaching is just the goal for me. Teaching has just always been what I've wanted to do. It's a true passion. Okay, Christian, what you got? Across town, Jeffrey Blackwell has brought the courtroom to his classroom, literally. How many other people go online regularly to read their news? Blackwell leads his high school speech, debate, and academic decathlon classes with a replica courtroom bench at the head of the class. Blackwell is a former attorney who left the courtroom 20 years ago to start teaching at his alma mater, Poteet High School. I feel like when I'm watching you, you seem so engaged. Like, this is your happy place. Oh, for sure. It's always been that way for, for school to me. Um, from when I was a kid all the way to now, you know, in an environment in which you get to learn and play with thought, play with ideas and perspectives, and, you know, dealing with kids that have such great minds and present things from perspectives I'm not even thinking about. So we're all learning together, and that's what makes it so special. It can be about anything you want. It just needs to be two-sided. As the son and grandson of teachers, the 47-year-old can't see himself anywhere else. There's always going to be compelling arguments not to be a teacher in terms of the marketplace, you know, um, dealing with certain issues that's just a part of the profession. But being a teacher, it's, it's a calling. That's what teaching is. That's who we are. Ruiz and Blackwell are just two of the thousands of teachers in the Mesquite Independent School District, which serves more than 38,000 students in 51 schools. And like school systems across the country, Mesquite faced unprecedented challenges in 2020. All schools in the state of Texas shall be temporarily closed. Dr. Angel Rivera, now the district superintendent, was the assistant back in 2020 as the COVID crisis began to unfold. We had to have teachers work on two platforms, the face-to-face, -face, while simultaneously doing a virtual piece. And so pretty much it doubled up their work. It probably expedited people leaving the profession. If the teachers were stressed before, they probably doubled their level of stress at that particular time. Initially, my concern, especially with older kids, is are they going to show up online? Or is it going to be me talking to an empty computer screen? They wanted to be there. That moment where they're in the classroom, even if that classroom is virtual, was a sense of normalcy for them because everything else was unnormal. As the pandemic dragged on, school staffing shortages swept the nation. Around 300,000 public school teachers and other staff members left the field as the pandemic took hold, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But COVID merely put a microscope on issues teachers and school staff had been dealing with for years. 
I hear that teachers aren't being as supported when it comes to behavior in the classroom. A lot of them are leaving because of the pay. Um, they just say it's very hard to live on teacher salary. Personally, I'm doing okay, but I have great support at home with a husband, and if you're not, if you don't have a family, it could be kind of difficult to live on your own. Administrators were tasked with figuring out how to fill those vacancies. When you're looking at the fact that teachers are saying, we're not getting paid enough, we're not supported when it comes to behavioral issues, I'm gonna leave. How do you come into that? It seems like some pretty big challenges. It was very, very obvious that we had to established prestige in a teaching position and it was very obvious that we had to prioritize teaching positions and we did just that. So Dr. Rivetta made more funding his top priority. A local tax measure he presented to voters narrowly passed a year ago leading to 16 million dollars in new revenue annually for the district. Critical funding used in part to boost teacher salaries. How did you explain to them that it's not about like, oh, we would like the money. It's more like, no, we need this money. I said, this money will be paying on safety and security, teacher compensation along with paraprofessionals, and then programming for kids. Those were my three points. I kept it to three. I went around, and when they did pass it, I said, this is what we're going to do. In addition, the district implemented new programs like PACE, which helps teaching assistants pay for school as they fill vacancies while working towards becoming fully certified teachers. Y'all are overachievers. Ruiz is part of the PACE program. It's just a very special program for parents because so many of us want to go into teaching. We just didn't have the means to get there, and so this program truly helped us get our foot in the door. It's good. It's pretty special to be able to do what I love and also be able to earn that certification and degree. How many of y'all get your news primarily from social media? For veteran staffers like Blackwell, even before the pandemic, the district's Excellence in Teaching Incentive Program gave a financial boost to stay in the classroom. They were trying to figure out a way that the district can grow better teachers, and that takes time, and it takes additional instruction and training. If you go through this two-year program, then there's going to be a pay increase, a stipend that's attached to that. And if you continue on to get your master's in certain areas, we're going to give you more money. That time and that commitment that the teachers are making are going to be rewarded by increased salary. As the pandemic waned, the district says it was able to cut teacher vacancies from 145 at the start of last school year to just 16 this year. The impact of these teaching programs felt by teachers and students alike. The teachers, they're not just your teachers and your mentors, they're your friends. You can tell that a lot of the teachers here have a passion for what they do. They're all our kids. And I think that passion, that sense of, of purpose, they see it in our eyes and our actions. And so they don't necessarily question that. But there's more to be done as educators look to reinvigorate the industry. We want it to be better and we're striving. We've dedicated our lives to it. Many thanks to Maria for that reporting and to all the teachers out there working tirelessly in our nation's schools every day. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, I'm Deborah Roberts, and this has been The American Classroom. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from San Francisco, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is an ABC News special report. Good morning for those of you just joining us. I'm Wade Johnson in New York. We're coming on the air right now with breaking news. According to multiple sources, the first round of Hamas hostages have been transferred to the Red Cross. This is part of a new deal that took effect overnight, including a fragile and temporary pause in the fighting. Let's get right to Matt Gutman, who's in Tel Aviv, Israel, with the very latest. Matt, what are you learning? When we understand that the Red Cross is now in possession of those hostages, we don't know how many they are. This transfer is now occurring in the Gaza Strip. The Red Cross, of course, a key conduit for this hostage swap. They're going to be taking the hostages from Hamas in Gaza, transferring them through Egypt and into Israel. It's there that a special unit who's been trained in dealing with hostages is going to intake them. They're going to give them a quick medical check. At that point, they'll also uh, verify their identification. They don't exactly know who's going to be coming across the border. They'll also be handed phones, and at that moment, they'll be able to call their family members, their loved ones, for the first time in 47 days. This is happening right now. At that point, uh, some of them will be reunited with family. Those who need medical care will be flown to hospitals in Israel, where a team of psychologists is waiting. First group of what's expected to be roughly 50 hostages released over the next four days. Our Matt Gutman is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Matt, what are we learning about these hostages and where they are now. We've just learned from Israel's medical services, Diane, that all of the hostages who've been transferred, we don't have an exact number yet, but all of them are in good condition. We understand that Israel's security services, the Shin Bet, basically like the FBI, have seen them. And they're now being transferred to Israel. They will then meet an Israeli military unit with specialized training on dealing with hostages. They'll have their identities rechecked to confirm that they are on that list. And at that point, they'll go a very short medical checkup. They'll be given telephones to be able to call their family members for the first time in 49 days. Then they'll be flown to hospitals in Israel. All of the children being flown to Schneider's um, Children's Medical Center here in Petah Tikva, about a half an hour away from Tel Aviv. That's where they will see their family members for the first time. And that's where a group of psychologists will be waiting to help them deal with the trauma. And I just got to mention, you can probably hear the singing behind me. This is a spontaneous celebration that developed here at Hostage Square in Tel Aviv. There is cautious jubilation, I would would say very much on edge here about whether this hostage swap will continue. There's still three more days of this, Diane. Of course, Palestinians getting 39 prisoners from Israeli jails to be released into the West Bank in the coming hour or so, we understand. And of course, a huge amount of aid flowing into the Gaza Strip. I understand 200 trucks today, 200 more tomorrow, more in the coming days, Diane. Uh, Matt, what do we know at this point about who is in this first group and who's in the remaining group of the roughly 50 in total who are expected? expected to be released over the next four days. We don't know their identities yet. We understand it's women and children. We don't know who they are. We don't know if Americans are among this first, first batch as well. We do understand from Israeli sources that everybody is in good condition at this point. But it is also important to note that in addition to the 13 hostages we understand were released today, again, Israel is verifying that, there are also 12 Thai nationals who were kidnapped along with the Israelis and other foreign nationalities on October 7th. They have also been transferred transferred to Israel. That is a separate deal, apparently brokered between the Thai government, Iran, and Hamas, but they are also free. That is a major development that we were not expecting today, Diane. So, Matt, what's the expected timeline now between the release of these hostages by Hamas and also the release of Palestinian prisoners by Israel in exchange? 
Everything is happening imminently, Diane. We understand that those hostages are very close, if not in Israel at this point. We have not seen video of them. We don't exactly know who they are, but that should be happening imminently. As soon as that happens, the Palestinian prisoners, 39 of them, women and minors, will be released into the West Bank. They will be going home at some point, and then the entire process will be repeated tomorrow. And so far, it is important to note, Diane, that this ceasefire is holding so far. Both sides have upheld uh, their parts in this agreement. And Matt, before I let you go, I know officials were saying they were hoping to take advantage of that four-day ceasefire to try to get more aid into Gaza. Any updates on that? Yeah, a significant amount of aid has flowed into Gaza today. A hundred trucks before noon. We understand another hundred trucks have flowed in since then. Uh, medicine, food, water. Also, fuel is going in. Not a lot, about four truckfuls. Um, that will be continued in the coming days. And again, this is going to be repeated every single day for at least the first four days of this hostage deal. And remember, Hamas says that it might release more. And every day that it releases at least 10 more hostages, Israel will say, OK, we'll give you another full 24 hours of this ceasefire. And that will continue as long as hostages are released. When it is over, the Israeli military, its defense ministry has said it will resume the fight in Gaza. Some areas of concern, Diane, we understand that uh, many Palestinians have tried to go back to their homes in northern Gaza, having been there twice in the past week. There is not much left to go back to. The inf infrastructure there is completely destroyed. No water, no electricity, no sewage, almost no shelter. Most of the buildings that we saw were either completely destroyed or severely damaged. Northern Gaza does not appear habitable at this point, but we do understand that people are still trying to go to their homes there and to uh, different parts in southern Gaza. Unclear how Israel is going to negotiate this and if this disrupts the ceasefire in any way. But again, everybody here in Israel and in Gaza on tenterhooks for the coming days, Diane. Yeah, it is a lot. All right, Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv. Stay safe, Matt. Thank you. So again, we're seeing those first images of that first group of hostages released from Gaza as part of a deal brokered between Israel and Hamas. They are the first group of what's expected to be roughly 50 hostages released over the next four days, and we will be watching those exchanges very closely. Right now, we'll return you to your regular programming. I'm Diane Macedo. Stay with ABC News for the latest. This has been a special report from ABC News. We First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky. 
No match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. We have breaking news. We're announcing images of the hostages released by Hamas today as part of a deal brokered with Israel. And we're now hearing those hostages are now in Israeli custody. This new video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. This is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, Israel will release a number of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. Those releases started earlier this morning. And this is all happening seven weeks after more than 230 hostages were taken by Hamas during the October 7th terror attack. Still, Israel is stressing these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, joins me now from Tel Aviv. Matt, what's the latest on these hostages, this first group who's been released, and where they are right now? 
They are on what we hope is the last leg of quite a long journey. They were picked up uh, about two hours ago by the Red Cross, taken from Hamas, and then transferred to the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. At that point, Diane, they were checked by the Israeli security services, the Shin Bet, like the FBI, confirmed that these were the hostages. And right now, they're en route from Egypt to Israel. It's about a 30-minute drive. They're in uh, Red Cross vans, and we did see through the windows in these images that you're likely seeing right now uh, a number of elderly senior citizens in those vans, perhaps a girl, a teenager. We also saw some of the Thai nationals. In addition to the 13 hostages that were released, 12 Thai nationals were released from Hamas custody as well after 49 days being held there. They're going to go home to Thailand. The Israelis are going to be brought to Israel, and it's there that an Israeli um, military team with specialized training in dealing with hostages will give them a medical checkup and they'll also give them telephones. They'll be able to call their families for the first time in seven weeks. The adults will get a quick debrief from Israeli intelligence and then they'll be dispersed to a number of hospitals in Israel. All of the children, Diane, are going to Schneider's Children Hospital in Petah Tikva. It's about 20, 30 minutes from where we are right now. There they'll meet their families and actually be physically reunited with their loved ones and also meet teams of psychologists that are on the ground prepared to deal with the intense trauma and intense emotions that they're undergoing. Remember, we understand that these people have been in tunnels underground for seven weeks. So even seeing the light of day, hearing the sound of the helicopters they are going to be flown in, this is going to be sensory overload for a lot of these people. They're going to be in very tenuous condition. Diane. And Matt, we're now hearing from the International Committee of the Red Cross. They are saying that they're relieved to confirm the safe release of 24 hostages. I know originally we were expecting 13 in this first group. What do you make of them now saying it's 24? Well, I heard earlier today there was some concern that the numbers wouldn't match the list that was sent to the Israelis yesterday. Hamas had said it would release 13 hostages, um, women and children. It appears if you do the math, if you subtract the 12 Thai workers who were captured on October 7th, kidnapped on October 7th, and taken into Gaza, plus the 12 that appear to be on this list, one person is missing. We don't know who that is. We don't know why it's not 13 instead of 12. We also don't know the identities of the people who've been brought in. This is all going to be worked out in the coming hours. We will understand more, including whether there were actually children in that convoy as well. Obviously, you can see people here sort of cautiously jubilant, singing. Uh, there were some tears that we saw earlier. Israel is still waiting with bated breath to see what happens next. But again, uh, there are 38 other hostages who are supposed to be part of this deal who are waiting to be released themselves. We don't even know if they've been told that they are part of this deal. In addition to that, Hamas has been told that it will get an additional day of ceasefire beyond the four uh, existing days for every 10 hostages it releases to be able to continue that ceasefire as long as they continue to release these hostages. So uh, everybody on tenterhooks right now here in Israel and, of course, in Gaza as well. Again, ceasefire is holding, and that so far is the best news we've heard in a while. Diane. And, Matt, you can hear the crowds of people behind you. These are people who've been assembling over and over again, wanting to see their loved ones again. What's the reaction like there to know that at least this first group is now in Israeli custody? I think it's relief, Diane, because people didn't think that this would actually pan out. There was so much concern, not only from rank-and-file Israeli citizens here, and you can hear them still singing, they've been out here for two hours, but especially from uh, defense sources, Israeli security sources, political sources that I've been speaking with, they were afraid that there would be a surprise at the very end, or that something would happen that would derail the ceasefire, and if the ceasefire would derail, they were concerned that it, Hamas would pull back the hostages and not allow this release to happen. What is surprising, I think, on both sides is that everything went almost exactly according to plan. Uh, Israel said early this morning that it had started the transfer of the 39 Palestinian women and minors to be released, uh, started to move them from the jails in Israel towards the West Bank, holding them to be released until after those hostages were in Israeli soil. Hamas almost exactly at 4 p.m., just as it was said in the agreement, 
released the hostages to the Red Cross. The Red Cross did its job picking them up, I understand, in two vehicles and taking them to the border. So, so far, everything is working as planned. And I think there's a huge collective sigh of relief in this country, which is why we've been hearing these people singing. Uh, there are dozens of additional people, maybe a couple hundred on the other side. People have been here in this square for hours now, and it shows the letdown, the, the breath of air that people have finally been able to take after so many weeks of suspense and worry about the fate of these hostages. And remember, Diane, there's still about 180, maybe more hostages being kept in Gaza who are not part of this deal. Well, I understand uh, they are men, uh, soldiers, men and women of fighting age as well. And we don't know, and nobody knows their condition, how many of them are alive or dead, and when they will be released. Diane. All right, uh, Matt Gutman there in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. And I want to go over to ABC's Patrick Reval, also in Tel Aviv right now. Uh, Patrick, what's the latest in terms of process now? In terms of the process, I mean, we're going to go through this all over again tomorrow. At least that's the hope. We're going to see that the next couple of days we'll see 10 to 12 hostages released every day. At the moment, this ceasefire is only supposed to be four days long, but both sides have signaled they might be open to an extension and that we could see basically for every 10 hostages released, we could see another day of ceasefire extended, although Israel has hinted they will only allow up to 10 days of ceasefire, so only six more from the four that's already agreed. It's very much signaling that this will only be a temporary pause. But this, of course, very good news. Um, this is a, these are images of hope that we're seeing, seeing this convoy reaching now um, the Egyptian border. But, of course, there are still a, a large number of hostages still held in Gaza. And we know, of course, that only the ones being freed at the moment are women and children. There are still a large number of also IDF soldiers who are being held, and there is a great deal of fear for their relatives that they will not be included in any deal, that Hamas will not let them out, and that they could potentially be held for years here. So, of course, for those families, today is just a pro prolongation of this agony. But there's also, of course, the question of Gaza. I mean, today the ceasefire has held, but there have already been tense scenes where we saw tens of uh, thousands, I should say, of, um, of Palestinian civilians trying to go back into northern Gaza and being prevented by IDF troops who opened fire. There was at least some casualties, at least several people injured, and we believe two people killed. And so every time that you have these sorts of clashes, that of course um, threatens to jeopardize the deal. But for now, the deal is holding, and the hope is that we can see a similar process continue now in, in the next four days. Patrick, the Red Cross is saying uh, that they can confirm 24 hostages released in total. It sounds like from what Matt's saying, that includes 12 Thai citizens. Uh, what's the process for them now? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so in addition to the, the 13 hostages that were promised by Hamas to be handed over today, there are also these 12 Thai citizens. They were workers who were working in one of the kibbutzes that Hamas attacked on October 7th, and they were caught up in this violence, in this conflict. Um, and we know that thanks to the mediation, it seems, in part of Iran, which backs Hamas, uh, and simply because also Hamas doesn't want to pick a fight with Thailand, they've agreed, it seems, to unconditionally release these Thai workers, who now, as we understand, are also in this convoy and are being brought to Egypt. They will also, I'm sure, be you know, provided with medical and psychological support. We know that they are now also out. So, Patrick, 24 um, released so far, again, including those, um, those Thai citizens. You've still got uh, roughly 50 in total that are expected to be released, so you're looking at another 45-ish. Uh, I'm sorry, 35-ish. What happens with that group now, the hostages that are still part of this deal but still haven't been released yet? Yeah, the hope is that they will be released just like today, again being handed over to the Red Cross tomorrow, that we'll see batches of 10 or 12 hostages released each day of this ceasefire, um, which will now go on for another three days, which is incredibly short, really. The hope is that it'll be extended. You know, Israel have said they're open to extending it by a day for every 10 hostages. And so the hope is that the ceasefire will be extended, which will be good news for people in Gaza, but also will allow more hostages to get out. But at the same time, ultimately, Israel making very clear this is is only a temporary pause. I think the fact that they're not allowing Gazan civilians to go back to northern Gaza signals very clearly that they intend to continue their operation once the ceasefire ends. And so while there is a big respite now, and this is, which is very important as well for Gazan civilians, this is very much not the end of the war. No, it's not. All right. Patrick Reval, stay safe there. Thank you.
And I want to bring in ABC News contributor, former senior CIA field operative Daryl Blocker for more. Daryl, I, I know you've worked directly on other hostage situations in the past. So from an intelligence standpoint, how valuable is the information some of these hostages hold? And how careful do you have to be in terms of how you go about asking them these questions, given the trauma they've been through? So, Diane, it is a very fine line between taking care of the physical and mental well-being of these people who are being released and gathering as much inf information from them without making them relive their trauma. So first, first word of order, of course, is to take care of their health, but they have a lot of information in their head. Everything that they've been thinking about over the last seven weeks is going to be of interest and of importance to the intelligence community. The Thai uh, service will now be involved in debriefing their citizens and sharing that information with the with the Israelis. So I think there's gonna be a lot of information that's gonna be gathered and a lot of information that's gonna help them ensure that the next day and the next couple of days uh, go as seamlessly as possible. And what does that look like? If the next few days go as seamlessly as possible, can you just explain what that actually means? Yes, yeah, so this is a, a trust building measure over a, over a series of days. Uh, there's uh, apparently, from what was just reported, there was already some incident that didn't stop it, but people were being killed. Um, so if this gets out of control, then the ones that were planning on coming out will be stuck even longer. So essentially what it looks like is the, the process, the International Red Cross will do its job, Hamas will do its job, and Israel will do its job. And if any of the three uh, aren't, aren't continuing to live up to whatever it was that they agreed to, then that'll be an, be, be an end to it. But debriefing, taking care of their health, making sure that they're uh, not reliving the trauma and recognizing that this is something that's going to be a part of their lives forever and that they're going to be a part of hopefully the solution to the the ultimate problem between the uh, Hamas and and the Israelis. Uh, Daryl, even if this deal and hopefully it does all go according to plan over the next four days and this whole group of roughly 50 is released, you still have an estimated over 100 hostages left behind. What happens to them? Unfortunately, I know everyone keeps talking about the number of people that are missing, but the number of those people that are still alive, it, I don't think those numbers, unfortunately, are going to be that high. But of course, uh, Hamas is hopefully separating the combatants from the non-combatants. That's something they should have done from the very beginning. So the innocents, the children, the Thai workers, the other nationalities that may have been there in the kibbutzes helping, um, helping on the and the farmings and helping on the kibbutz. But soldiers and people of fighting age will probably be held a little longer. All right, Daryl Blocker, senior CIA operative, former senior CIA operative. Daryl, thank you. And I wanna bring in our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, for a little bit more on what's happening for the White House in the midst of all of this. Selena, we know that President Biden and the, the U.S. in general were a big part of helping to broker this deal. So how is the White House reacting now that it's starting to go into effect? Yeah, Diane, well, we know the White House has been closely monitoring this, although the president is here in Nantucket this entire week. He's been working the phone, staying in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this agreed upon deal actually gets carried out throughout and is successfully done. Look, we're only here on day one. This is supposed to be a four day pause. So the White House has been very careful to say that, look, nothing is done here until it's actually completed. Now, President Biden has said yesterday that he may be speaking today, addressing Americans about this, and it's incredibly high stakes high pressure here because of how involved President Biden has been personally in this. Senior administration officials tell me that he's been very hands-on from the beginning. He even personally urged Emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to do so. So throughout this entire time, that has been very careful here for the Biden administration to both show Israel support, but also to look for restraint for humanitarian pauses, for more aid to get into Gaza, as well as for these hostages to get out. Selena, what are the next steps for the administration in terms of trying to ensure that now that this deal is not only done but has started to unfold, how does the administration go about ensuring that it continues to go as planned? 
Well, look, this is only day one, like I said, so there's three more days here, and U.S. officials are hopeful, and they say there's a possibility that the pause could be extended beyond these four days if Hamas is able to gather more of these hostages and to release them. We also know that in calls with regional leaders this week, President Biden spoke about protecting civilian lives, about surging humanitarian aid into Gaza, and also about how to eventually release all of the remaining hostages. There are still several Americans unaccounted for, and many hostages that were not included in this initial deal. Now, U.S. officials have said they're hopeful that three Americans will be included in this initial deal, including that three-year-old Abigail Moridan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. We still don't have a name of the people who were released today or who will be released in the coming days. We also know that U.S. officials want to make use of this pause, not only to surge that humanitarian aid, but also to potentially set up safe zones. But look, all of this is incredibly tenuous and fragile. It's been weeks of what officials say are excruciating difficult negotiations to get to this point. In fact, senior administration officials say that in the early days of the crisis, a quote, secret cell of top Biden aides worked behind the scenes with both Israel and Qatar to try and get this deal through. And in fact, the two Americans that were released last month, they viewed that as a testing ground to prove that this secret cell could work. And from there, they worked on negotiating this broader deal. But it hasn't been smooth sailing the entire time. In recent weeks, talks have stalled. At one point, Hamas even broke off talks. But U.S. officials saying that Biden's personal diplomacy in all of this was critical to getting us to this point. All right, Selena Wang from Nantucket traveling with the president. Selena, thank you. And we will have much more continuing coverage on that hostage release right after the break. Stay with us. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? How <laughs> cute. <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. 
the situation. Drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Hi, I'm Diane Maceda. Welcome to ABC News Live. We're now seeing the first images of hostages released by Hamas today as part of a deal brokered with Israel. This new video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. This is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, Israel will release a number of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. Those releases started earlier this morning. But Israel is stressing these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC's Patrick Rievel is live in Tel Aviv, and we also have senior White House correspondent Selena Wang traveling with President Biden with more info. Uh, Patrick, we're learning some new details now about these hostages. What can you tell us? Hi, Diane. Yeah, I mean, we're literally watching right now images of this convoy of ambulances reaching the Rafa border with Egypt. We're seeing just now the first three hostages um, getting out of those ambulances. There appears to be a couple of older women just stepping down from the ambulances, as well as a woman with a child. Um, for now, we don't know that much details about them. There's been a little bit of confusion around the numbers of hostages released. It appears our sources are telling us that 13 Israeli hostages have been released, as well as, um, t as, well as 10 Thai citizens who were caught up in the Hamas attack and one Filipino citizen, which brings the total to 24. But there are confusing reports. There was also a report of 25 coming out. But for now, our understanding is that it's 13 13 Israeli, um, Israeli hostages have been released, as well as 10 Thai workers and one Filipino citizen. Um, and as I say, we're just, we're just seeing more details now. They're coming. We know that they're going to be brought from, uh, from Egypt. They're going to be flown to a, a military base in southern Israel, where they'll be met um, by medics and be debriefed by Israel's intelligence service. We know then from the, from the military base they'll be brought here to Tel Aviv, we believe, to two hospitals. We know that there are children among the, um, among, uh, the hostages who've been released today. As we, we understand that among the 50 who have been promised to be released over the next uh, three days now, we understand that there are three Americans among them, including Abigail Moidan, the three-year-old girl. For now, we understand that she is not among these hostages. Um, but as we can see, there are, there is, this deal has worked. We have, we have seen a significant number of hostages released, and there's hope that the ceasefire will continue to hold and that we will see more released in the coming days. Uh, Patrick, how is that ceasefire looking? Uh, it does seem like that has been a little bit fragile throughout, and there were concerns that, that maybe someone wouldn't adhere. So what is the latest on this pause in fighting that's supposed to happen over the next four days? Yeah, I mean, there was a huge amount of suspicion, mutual suspicion, between Israel and Hamas. Um, even yesterday, we believed at one point that there was going to be a ceasefire starting yesterday. Hamas said it would begin yesterday at 10 a.m. Then it didn't happen. And it seemed at one point there was a lot of doubt whether this was going forward or not. But clearly, it has gone ahead. And today, we have seen the ceasefire has held. There hasn't been bombing in Gaza. There hasn't been fighting. And, there has, and we know that Israel has stopped overflights for a certain period of the day. But we've also seen some pretty tense scenes because Israel has ordered all Palestinian civilians who have been displaced from northern Gaza has told them not to try to return. But we did see thousands of Palestinian civilians trying to get back up to their homes in northern Gaza to see what was left of them because they've obviously suffered an enormous amount of destruction there. But Israel is not allowing them to come back. And we've actually seen clashes where Israeli troops opened fire on, Israel, on Palestinian civilians trying to get back up there. We know at least several people were injured. We believe two people were killed. And that, of course, underlines the fragility of this, that if there were to be serious clashes, if there were to be serious casualties in Gaza, that, of course, could derail this deal as it goes forward. But for now, we hope that it's going to continue. And both sides have signaled they are open to potentially extending it. Israel saying that they're willing to extend it by a day each time that Hamas releases 10 more hostages. They've said, though, that that could go up to around 10 days in total. But for now, we've only got three days more left of this ceasefire. But we're hoping that we're going to continue to see hostages being released 
released in the next three days at least. And Selena, you say the president has been working the phones to try to ensure that this deal and this release uh, doesn't get derailed, as Patrick is laying out. Are there specific points of concern for the administration? Well, look, as Patrick just said, this is incredibly delicate and fragile. And just to get to this point, it's been what the administration calls weeks of excruciating negotiations. We know that the president is being regularly briefed on this, that the White House and the president are closely monitoring this situation. And in this week, he's been working the phones with regional leaders, including the leaders of Israel, Egypt and Qatar, to ensure that this deal gets carried out through the end. U.S. officials have been very careful that nothing here is done until it's actually completed. We are still on day one, obviously a positive sign, but they're going to be continuing to monitor this closely. Now, this release, the hope was that it would include three Americans, two women, and that three-year-old Abigail Moore Adon. President Biden yesterday said he was keeping his fingers crossed that three-year-old Abigail would be included in this initial batch of releases. But beyond that, there are still several Americans that are still unaccounted for and many hostages that are not included in this deal. U.S. officials have been clear that they believe this deal is structured in a way where it, it incentivizes Hamas to continue to release more hostages. And as Patrick said, if they do so, then Israel will continue the pause in fighting. We have seen President Biden continue to shift his tone from just this full throttled support to now adding in this intense pressure to surge more aid into Gaza, as well as to call for more restraint and for humanitarian pauses. In these calls, we also know that President Biden has been discussing protecting civilian lives, as well as ways to get more of that aid in. We've also learned that U.S. officials are hoping to make use of this pause to also potentially set up safe zones. But again, nothing here is done until it's actually done. So, Patrick, what do we know about these three American hostages uh, that were supposed to be part of this release, uh, the, the total release, and their status right now? Yeah, U.S. officials have said that these three Americans are on this list um, of 50 hostages that are due to be released during this pause. One of them is Abigail Moore Idan, that three-year-old girl um, who was taken during the October 7th attack. Her family obviously desperate for her to be returned. We understand that she is not among the hostages being released in today um, in the, among these 13 who have just been brought to the Rafa crossing. Of course, the family is really hoping that this will now continue. There is, I think, a sense of hope at the moment um, because of the fact is ultimately this has gone as people had hoped it would. You know, they said it, they were actually announced that they've been handed over almost on time, almost to the schedule uh, that Qatar had suggested. But ultimately, as we've been saying, this is an extremely fragile situation. I think I can't really over overemphasize how much suspicion there is here. I mean, talking to people uh, about who've watched this conflict for many years, they say they've seen hostage negotiations like this before, and until it's done, it is not done. They say that they can really that you can really see things just fall apart at the last minute, and so they're praying that this is now going to continue. That in the next three days. We're going to see the rest of these hostages brought out. But, of course, the, the, the terrible truth as well is that there are a large number of other hostages who are not part of this deal. You know, there are 236 hostages held in Gaza. Only 50 so far have been agreed to be released. And most of the people who, are, who so far have not been released are, are young men, are men who, as, who are IDF soldiers. And that will make it a lot more difficult um, to get them out. In the past, we've seen that Hamas... Uh, usually tries to extract a very high price for releasing Israeli soldiers and um, Israeli male soldiers. And so I think this will be very difficult for them. All right. Selena Wang, Patrick Reval, thank you both. Coming up, we have continuing coverage of this hostage release, plus an in-depth report from our chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, retracing the moments and giving a first-hand look at that initial deadly October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. Stay with us. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Traveling with the president in Dublin, Ireland, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We're following the latest developments on the first group of hostages released from Gaza as part of a deal between Israel and Hamas. In Israel, some are celebrating in the streets after many families of those taken have been fighting for weeks to bring them home, some even accusing the government of not prioritizing the hostages' safe return. But despite today's events, the wound is still all too real, especially for those in a kibbutz hit hardest on October 7th. Our Ian panel gained some unrestricted access. They're retracing the horror that went on that day that would ultimately change this community, the country, and even the world. May 2023, the Shavuot festival in kibbutz near Oz, an idyllic place of peace and plenty. An annual celebration of the harvest and a formal welcome to the newest members of this rural community. A time to come together to give thanks, to play, laugh and sing. A home movie haunting in its happiness. Niroz before October 7th was paradise. I was born in Niroz. I lived there all my life. My kids love the place. He puts it, it's like, you know, lovely community. That um, very peaceful, beautiful place like you can see. You feel like you belonging to someone, to something. And this is Kibbutz Niroz today. Six months since that Shavuot festival. A community torn asunder. Burnt, broken and bleeding. This is the story of what happened on Black Saturday, October the 7th. With unprecedented access to hours of security camera footage, Hamas videos and eyewitness testimony. It's the story of an unspeakable few hours of horror that would change a community, a country and a region forever. And unleash a war 
that's brought death and destruction to so many thousands. Six thirty a.m. Saturday, the seventh of October. Air raid sirens break the early morning calm across Israel. For the residents of Neroz, it seemed another routine alert. So our morning started at six thirty with the alarm, jumping, jumping from the bed, running to the safe room. Then we got the alarm of uh, the information that the terrorists in the kibbutz. After an hour or so. Um, there was a report in the community um, group of messages that there are uh, terrorists inside the kibbutz, and we started sounding, um, hearing um, fire, gunshots, and, uh, and, and then all hell breaks loose. Niroz lies less than a mile and a half from Gaza. And within minutes, the militants of Hamas overrun Israeli army border posts and were at the gates to the kibbutz. They know what they do. They plan it in advance. They know exactly where to go, which house to go. The kibbutz emergency response team tried to fight off the attack bravely, but didn't stand a chance. They were among the first to die. Hamas fighters stormed in from four points. And astonishingly, Palestinian reporter Motna al-Najjar crossed with the terrorists from Gaza, live streaming as the attack unfolded. Declaring at one point, I'm inside the settlement. The entire settlement has been seized. His video shows the gunman moving methodically and ruthlessly through the kibbutz, using guns, hammers, and drills to break into the homes of terrified residents locked inside. <laughs> Crying Alu Akbar, God is great, as they led an hours-long bloodthirsty rampage, setting fire to homes, some with families inside, burning vehicles as marauding civilians joined the invasion, plundering and pillaging. Hamas came here to kill, destroy, and to take hostages they could use as bargaining chips. The families of the kibbutz have agreed for us to show this video. The first hostage you see is 11-year-old Erez Calderon. The reporter urges the gunman to take care of the boy, to keep him unharmed. Shiri Bibas Silverman, clutching onto her two sons, four-year-old Ariel and 10-month-old Kfir. That's my house. Terrorists tried to enter to the house, fight with me on the door, even that it was tight, I was holding it. Most of the houses in Neroz have safe rooms, but they're not designed to lock from the inside. I was hoping that nobody will shoot me through the door. So you're literally hanging on? Yeah. For dear life? Yeah, like this. We keep hearing the same story again and again. The attackers trying to force their way into people's homes and people trying to resist. This house, you can see all the bullet holes outside as they try to literally shoot their way in. Just come inside, mind the step and there's broken glass. You can see where the bullets came through. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And tragically, you can see the blood where the people who lived here died. In the house opposite, retired teacher Chaim Perry and his wife Osnat knew they were in trouble. Unable to hold the door closed, Chaim had to make a decision. It's hard to imagine how much terror there must have been in homes like this on Kibbutz near Oz. An elderly couple hunkered down, the terrorists at the door trying to get in. They held them off once, but they realized they were gonna come back. So 80-year-old Chaim Perry, to save his 71-year-old wife, went out that door to surrender, hoping that the militants wouldn't come back. Hamas spurishly claims this was a military operation, but their victims at Neroz, like so many places, were all civilians. Not just kibbutz residents, but also farm laborers from Thailand and elsewhere. They lived in their own quarters on the edge of the kibbutz, not party to any conflict or dispute, not soldiers, not Israelis, not Jews. But still, they were also rounded up, beaten, kidnapped and butchered. They went from every door, shoot, took them out and 
it look like in the end they collect all of them together to this room, put all of them together here. Yeah, going. It's it's unbelievable. Going. It literally is a bloodbath. So people who come from Thailand to earn a living, to try and find a better life, rounded up, put in this room and slaughtered. The rampage at Kibbutz Niroz lasted six hours. By the time soldiers from the Israeli border guard arrived, it was too late. The gunmen, the looters, the hostages were long gone. On the morning of October 7th, there were 400 men, women and children living in Niroz. By the afternoon, over a quarter of all the residents were gone. 39 people were murdered here. 74 were kidnapped, the largest single group of hostages taken in Israel that day. <laughs> and for the survivors, for the relatives, there's guilt, fear and unending pain. Hadass Calderon's mother and niece were killed in the attack. There is nothing left. It's all dark. And her two children, 16-year-old Saha and 12-year-old Erez, seen in the reporter's video, were kidnapped. She counts the days, the hours, unable to properly eat or sleep. What about my children? Who take care of them now? Who take care of them if they're sick? If they heal, if, if they have... You know, and they need medicine. There is a lot of uh, disease now in Aza. It's, uh, it's frightening. Many Niroz residents were lifelong peace activists. Chaim Perry volunteered with an NGO, bringing sick Palestinians from the Gaza border to hospitals in Israel for treatment. Ever since he finished being a soldier, he became a, strongly, uh, a strong peace activist because he said, I've been there and I know what I'm fighting for now. And it's very clear for me, very, very clear, that uh, peace is the only way. Many believe the Israeli government must share some of the blame and that their strategy in Gaza is the wrong one. They feel betrayed. And uh, as it's their right to feel this way, I now urge the government, you've betrayed the citizens. First thing, make it right. Release the hostages. Do whatever needed. Afterwards, when you finish this, thrive towards a, a long-term solution. That's it, that's, that's the only thing, the way I can see. And in Elat, where most of the families from Niroz were evacuated to, there's pain in recuperation and terrible sadness, anger. They took not only life from the dead, they took life from the living. They took away their lives. Amid all the talk of negotiations to release hostages, the families now wait in agonizing limbo. Sometimes Hadass Calderon talks to her missing children. If I talk to them now, yes. I tell them that I fight for them. That I'm going to bring them home, back soon. They're going, going to come back, and their father going to come back, and we're all waiting for them and miss them, miss them, miss them so much. I miss their laugh. I, I miss to laugh with them. I miss to to kiss them, to hug them. Obviously your heart is here in the kibbutz, your friends, your loved ones, and you've gone through so much. Can kibbutz near Oz be the same ever again? Well, no, yeah, it will never be the same, oh, no doubt. But kibbutz near Oz will be again. Will be different. Somehow I don't know, but definitely it always will be here. All right, Ian Panel, thanks for that. And we have much more continuing coverage on that initial release of hostages as part of this breakthrough deal between Israel and Hamas. More coming up right after the break. Stay with us. With so much.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. so many people start their day here from abc news this is start here to be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories a lot of news today so let's get into it listen now to the daily news podcast honored with four edward r murrow awards and see why the new york times calls it a news podcast worth listening to start here abc news make it your daily first listen now that's a part of the story i bet you didn't see coming wherever you get your podcasts start here it's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Matt Gutman reporting in Gaza City right next to Al-Shifa Hospital. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diamond Sato. Welcome to ABC News Live First. We have breaking news now. The Israeli military now says the first group of hostages released by Hamas today have been returned to Israel. This is all part of a deal struck between Hamas and Israel. New video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. And Qatar's foreign minister now confirms 24 hostages were in this first group, 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, 10 Thai citizens, and one Filipino citizen. Now, this is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, Qatar says Israel has now released 39 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. But Israel is stressing that these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is tracking it all from Tel Aviv, Israel, where crowds are gathering and reacting to the news of this release of a first group of hostages. Matt? Hey, Diane, we're in Hostage Square here. There are hundreds of people who are gathered here in what I would call sort of a cautious celebration. I'm going to bring the camera in and raise it up. You can see people singing and dancing here in the center. They have received the news that those hostages are in the hands of Red Cross. They're now in Egypt, we are told by multiple Israeli sources, on their way to being brought into Israel. And it's there that they will be met by a specialized Israeli military unit with training and dealing with hostages. They have pre-programmed uh, lines that they're supposed to talk about. They're not going to talk about what happened to anybody's family members. They'll say, you're safe, you're in good hands, we're going to get you to your loved ones. It's at that stage, right after they greet them, that they will give them a cursory medical check. They'll verify their identification. Israel doesn't know if the people who were on the list given by Hamas yesterday are the same people who they will be receiving today. 
and then they will be handed phones. They will be able to call their loved ones and speak to them for the first time in 49 very long days here. At that point, they'll be taken to hospitals uh, around Israel, six of them. All of the ho all the children will be brought to a single hospital, and that's where they will be united with their family members and get to see them for the first time. There will also be battalions of psychologists and other doctors on hand to help with what we understand is going to be significant trauma. Now, for the Palestinians, Israel says that it's already transferring uh, 39 Palestinian prisoners in Israel's jails to the West Bank. They will actually be released once those hostages are on Israeli soil and confirmed. Now, it seems both sides right now are upholding the ceasefire, both sides living up to the commitments in this agreement. Israel has already received a list of the next batch of hostages for tomorrow. Everybody here, though, is still holding their breath, hoping that the next four days will actually pan out as planned and 50 hostages will be brought back here and Hamas will get 150 Palestinian prisoners and all that aid will be brought into Gaza. And you can hear the singing still picking up. People here are feeling this emotional letdown after seven weeks of this massive tension over the hostages. Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, nice to see a bright spot there at least. And I want to go over to ABC's Patrick Rievel, who is also uh, there in Tel Aviv with the latest. Patrick, how significant is it uh, to now hear that these hostages are back in Israel? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last few minutes, really, we've heard that, the, yes, the, the hostages are now back on Israeli soil. We understand they're going to be taken to a military base in southern Israel where they'll be debriefed um, and then flown as, or brought, I should say, to Tel Aviv uh, where they will be taken to two hospitals. We've also been watching these pictures of this convoy, this Red Cross convoy, arriving at the Rafah crossing at Egypt, watching, um, seeing a couple of the hostages step out of the ambulances. We've seen uh, two older women. Um, one of them, uh, we've just heard from the families actually confirming the identity of two of them. One is a 72-year-old woman, another 78-year-old woman, as well as a nine-year-old boy. Uh, we know so far from Egypt, Israel, and Qatar that there are 13 Israeli hostages that have been freed, in addition to 10 Thai workers who were caught up in the Hamas attack and also taken hostage, as well as one Fili Filipino citizen. They have now all been freed and have been brought by the Red Cross out to Egypt, and now the Israeli hostages have been brought into Israel and uh, now we expect that they will be brought here to Tel Aviv, where you saw um, a little while ago with Matt, we're seeing these celebrations now in what's become known as Hostage Square um, in downtown Tel Aviv. So, Patrick, what's the timeline of how this is all expected to unfold now? Because this is all happening amid this four-day pause in fighting, and we're expecting these hostages just and, and the prisoners being exchanged uh, as well from the Israeli side. It all to kind of happen gradually. Yes, yeah, so of course we now expect to go through this all over again tomorrow. For the next three days, it's hoped that there's going to be hostage releases of around 10 to 12 hostages released every day during this four-day ceasefire. There's also hope that the, the ceasefire will be extended. I mean, both sides have indicated that potentially um, if Hamas is willing to release up to 10 hostages a day, then there could be another day extension of this ceasefire. And it's hoped that that will happen and that we will see more of the two around 236 hostages that have been taken. The, the hope is that more than just the 50 already agreed will be released. As you say as well, we're seeing each day pal Palestinian prisoners released, women and, women and teenagers mainly being released um, by is Israel. We've seen the first 39 are expected to be released right now. Um, and they'll be going back to places like the West Bank, some, some to Jerusalem. Most are not from Gaza, only a handful are from Gaza. And we expect that each day we'll, we should be seeing as well a number of Palestinian prisoners released in exchange um, for these hostages. We're also seeing hundreds of trucks of aid potentially going into Gaza now. Um, as this ceasefire continues, it's hoped that that will ease somewhat the humanitarian disaster that is in Gaza. Uh, Patrick, we saw some of the celebrations there uh, from Hostage Square where Matt is, but where else, uh, what else are you hearing there in, in Tel Aviv? How are people reacting to knowing that at least this first group of hostages is now free? Yeah, I mean, I think the overwhelming emotion is, is relief. But there's been huge tension here. This was a national trauma. Um, the attacks of October 7th obviously have just provoked huge shock and anger and, and fear 
in Israel. And just as, as you say, this was a bright spot. This is a bright spot. This is the first slightly hopeful thing that we have seen um, in seven weeks, really, where you're seeing for the first time these hostages be going free. And not only that, also a ceasefire that for now is holding in Gaza. It began at 7 a.m. this morning. We haven't seen bombing. We haven't seen heavy fighting. We haven't seen any fighting. What we have seen, unfortunately, is clashes because Israel has ordered civilian Palestinian, uh, Palestinian civilians, I should say, not to return to northern Gaza. These, a million people were displaced from northern Gaza by the fighting. Thousands of them tried to start going back today amid the truce, but Israel has said not to come back. And we saw clashes where we, we know that at least several people were injured after IDF troops opened fire. We believe two people were killed, and obviously that underlines the fragility of this truce. If we were to see major violence, major casualties inside Gaza, that could jeopardize the continuation of this deal. But for now, we're seeing that it is happening, and everyone hopes that it's going to continue for the next few days. Uh, so what comes, if all goes according to plan, Patrick, what comes after this four-day temporary ceasefire? I mean, the hope is that it's going to be extended by at least some days because Israel has indicated it's willing to extend this ceasefire by another day for every extra 10 hostages that Hamas releases. But they've indicated it won't be more than a 10-day pause. And Israel in general has made very clear it does not consider this to be anything more than temporary. They've, sig they've signaled at all levels of government, the IDF has signaled they intend to fully go back on the offensive once the ceasefire ends. Before it began, they were indicating they were going to go into, into southern Gaza that they were going to go after the, the Hamas leadership, which they say has taken shelter in Khan Yunis down there. And they say that there is going to be a continuation of this war. They're making very clear that this will not be the end of the war and that we should expect this to continue for months on. All right, Patrick Rebel for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Patrick. And back here at home, President Biden is monitoring that temporary ceasefire and hostage release, working the phones to try to ensure everything gets carried through to the end. U.S. officials also say the U.S. wants to make use of this four-day pause in fighting by surging humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially setting up safe zones. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president. Selena, how's the White House re reacting to news of this first group of hostages now being in Israel? Well, Diane, the president is here on Thanksgiving holiday in Nantucket, but we know he's been regularly briefed on the situation. And as you say, he's been in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. We are only on day one of what is supposed to be a four day pause. And U.S. officials have been very clear that nothing is done here until it's actually happened. Given the fragility of this, senior administration officials have said that in the early days of the crisis, top Biden aides set up a secret cell in order to work behind the scenes to coordinate with Israel and Qatar, which has been acting as this intermediary. And talks have not been smooth throughout this process. Negotiations had stalled several times. Hamas even broke off talks at one point. So a delicate, fragile situation. In the White House, senior administration officials, they've made clear that President Biden's role in this was critical and that he's been hands-on here, even personally urging the Mir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept this deal. So are there any major points of concern here, areas where the White House worries this agreement could fall apart? Well, look, like I just said, it's been incredibly tenuous and the mistrust and the suspicion between both sides, it makes it very concerning that this could fall apart at any moment. And we're only on day one of day four. But U.S. officials have said that this deal is structured in a way to incentivize Hamas to release more hostages in order to allow this ceasefire to last a little bit longer. But U.S. official had been clear before that they don't believe a general ceasefire and entire end to hostilities would be beneficial. They believe that would just give Hamas the ability to regroup and to execute another attack. Now, when it comes to the names on the list, we're still waiting to see who they are. But U.S. officials had said they were hopeful that it would include three Americans, two women and that young toddler, Abigail Moore Adan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. But beyond that, there are still several Americans unaccounted for and many hostages not included in this deal. But U.S. officials say they are not going to stop until all of these hostages are released and they're going to continue to push for that. So, Selena, if everything goes smoothly with this plan, what will the U.S. look to do next? 
Well, even within these four days, we know that there are several things the U.S. wants to accomplish, including surging more humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as potentially setting up those safe zones. But after this, the U.S. is hoping that more hostages will be released, that all of them will be released. They understand that this isn't going to end hostilities, that Israel will continue to get their goal, which is to completely defeat Hamas after this. But they're hoping that this pause will be a critical window to help the civilians in Gaza. We did earlier have a statement from USAID which said this four-day pause this is helpful it gives a chance to get critical water food medical help into Gaza but it's not enough there needs to be a structural change to allow a significant amount of aid to go in but this is still tenuous this is fragile they're hoping more hostages will be released but nothing is set in stone all right Selena Wang there in Nantucket traveling with President Biden Selena thank you Coming up, we have more coverage of this hostage release. I'll speak with an expert on hostage situations and international security. How these negotiations happen when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. I'm Diane Macedo. The Israeli army is now confirming a group of hostages are back in Israel after being released by Hamas. This new video shows the convoy of 24 hostages leaving Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. Assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert, joins me now for more on this. Professor, thank you for being on. I know you're an expert in hostage situations and international security. So first, I just want to get your reaction. What do you think now that you hear that this first group of hostages is back in Israel? 
I'm overjoyed for the hostages and for their families and their communities that have been waiting in agony over the last five weeks uh, after October 7th since they were taken hostage. So it's wonderful news for those who are coming home today and extremely difficult for those whose family members are still held hostage and everyone who's hoping that more hostages continue to come home. What is the process like now for this group that just arrived back in Israel? And what do those around them need to consider uh, before, for example, just sending them home? So former hostages and advocates for hostage recovery will talk about the extremely complicated process that happens when hostages are actually free. They don't simply uh, go back to their normal lives. They have to process in extreme care the trauma, the physical violence, as well as the emotional turmoil that they have been through. And so they are going to be uh, examined medically and treated with uh, mental health professionals not only dealing with the trauma of the last five weeks, but about helping them as they confront the rest of their lives as, as former hostages and the pain that they will live with forever. Now, this is the, the first group of roughly 50 hostages that are expected to be released in total over the next four days. And it was a lengthy process to get to that deal. What stuck out to you most uh, as we reported on the progress being made and finally making the deal and now where we are? Were there any points that you thought, huh, that's strange? Um, so I actually thought that the, the way that the parties who came to these negotiations has been extremely productive and clever. It's uh, long been the case that countries like Qatar and Egypt have played a major role in, uh, in facilitating hostage negotiations. The United States and Qatar have worked together on hostage deals before. So the fact that there were these intermediaries is actually quite common. And the fact that they've structured this hostage release to be what we might call an iterated game, the fact that 10 hostages might be released by Hamas today, and then dozens of Palestinian detainees released, released from Israeli jails and prisons. And the fact that that might continue, that it's left an open-ended ending to the hostage release, that the more hostages that Hamas lets go, the more Palestinian prisoners that Israel will release over time with no set end. So hopefully we can be cautiously optimistic that that will continue for the next several days and hopefully even longer. So, Professor, what are you looking ahead to over the next four days and maybe beyond, as you say, if, if they do release more hostages and this ceasefire, uh, temporary ceasefire continues, what are you looking out for and, and what concerns you most? The thing that probably concerns me most is the fact that because it's this iteration, one side acts, then the other side responds, that all it takes is one person or a small group to potentially spoil the deal. That someone who is not in favor of hostages coming home, who's not in favor of ongoing pause in hostilities, could have the power to ruin it. And so hopefully the different governments that have been involved, all of the advisors and international organizations who are part of this process, are trying to keep their sides in line to ensure that this uh, continues smoothly going forward. All right, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert. Danny, thank you. Thanks for having me. And we will continue with our coverage on this hostage release in the Middle East, but we're also covering some of the other top stories this morning, including major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the 
announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Give it to me. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild crime at Blood Mountain. Streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shohei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league. A side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Here's some of the top headlines we're following for you today. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been imprisoned for nine years for killing his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is facing a new lawsuit by a woman claiming he sexually assaulted her in 1993. The woman filed a summons under New York's Adult Survivors Act, a special law about to expire that creates a year-long suspension of the usual time limit to sue. Adams joined several high-profile celebrities who've been accused of sexual wrongdoing under that special law in the last few days, including Sean Diddy Combs, Jamie Foxx, and Axel Rose. Adam says the accusations against him are absolutely not true. And the Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly airborne car crash set off a fiery explosion. The two passengers in that car identified as husband and wife were killed. One booth agent is injured. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. I'm Diamond Sato. Welcome to ABC News Live First. We have breaking news now. The Israeli military now says the first group of hostages released by Hamas today have been returned to Israel. This is all part of a deal struck between Hamas and Israel. New video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. And Qatar's foreign minister now confirms 24 hostages were in this first group, 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, 10 Thai citizens, and one Filipino citizen. Now, this is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, Qatar says Israel has now released 39 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. But Israel is stressing that these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC's Patrick Rievel, who was up there in Tel Aviv with the latest. Patrick, how significant is it uh, to now hear that these hostages are back in Israel? 
Uh, Dan, yeah, just in the last few minutes, really, we've heard that, the, yes, the, the hostages are now back on Israeli soil. We understand they're going to be taken to a military base in southern Israel where they'll be debriefed um, and then flown, as, or brought, I should say, to Tel Aviv uh, where they will be taken to two hospitals. We've also been watching these pictures of this convoy, this Red Cross convoy, arriving at the Rafah crossing at Egypt, watching, um, seeing a couple of the hostages step out of the ambulances. We've seen uh, two older women, um, one of them, uh, we've just heard from the families actually confirming the identity of two of them. One is a 72-year-old woman, another 78-year-old woman, as well as a nine-year-old boy. Uh, we know so far from Egypt, Israel and Qatar that there are 13 Israeli hostages that have been freed, in addition to 10 Thai workers who were caught up in the Hamas attack and also taken hostage, as well as one Fili Filipino citizen. They have now all been freed and have been brought by the Red Cross out to Egypt, and now the Israeli hostages have been brought into Israel, and uh, now we expect that they will be be brought here to Tel Aviv, where you saw um, a little while ago with Matt, we're seeing these celebrations now in what's become known as Hostage Square um, in downtown Tel Aviv. So Patrick, what's the timeline of how this is all expected to unfold now? Because this is all happening amid this four-day pause in fighting, and we're expecting these hostages just, and, and the prisoners being exchanged uh, as well from the Israeli side, it all to kind of happen gradually. Yes, yeah, so of course we now expect to go through this all over again tomorrow. For the next three days, it's hoped that there's going to be hostage releases of around 10 to 12 hostages released every day during this four-day ceasefire. There's also hope that the, the ceasefire will be extended. I mean, both sides have indicated that potentially um, if Hamas is willing to release up to 10 hostages a day, then there could be another day extension of this ceasefire. And it's hoped that that will happen and that we will see more of the two around 236 hostages that have been taken. The, the hope is that more than just the 50 already agreed will be released. As you say as well, we're seeing each day pal Palestinian prisoners released, women and, uh, women and teenagers mainly being released um, by is Israel. We've seen the first 39 are expected to be released right now. Um, and they'll be going back to places like the West Bank, some, some to Jerusalem. Most are not from Gaza, only a handful are from Gaza. And we expect that each day we'll, we should be seeing as well a number of Palestinian prisoners released in exchange um, for these hostages. We're also seeing hundreds of trucks of aid potentially going into Gaza now um, as this ceasefire continues. It's hoped that that will ease somewhat the humanitarian disaster that is in Gaza. Uh, Patrick, we saw some of the celebrations there uh, from Hostage Square where Matt is, but where else, uh, what else are you hearing there in, in Tel Aviv? How are people reacting to knowing that at least this first group of hostages is now free? Yeah, I mean, I think the overwhelming emotion is, is relief. There's been huge tension here. This was a national trauma. Um, the attacks of October 7th obviously have just provoked huge shock and anger and, and fear in Israel. And just as, as you say, this was a bright spot. This is a bright spot. This is the first slightly hopeful thing that we have seen um, in seven weeks, really, where you're seeing for the first time these hostages be going free. And not only that, also a ceasefire that for now is holding in Gaza. It began at 7 a.m. this morning. We haven't seen bombing we haven't seen heavy fighting we haven't seen any fighting what we have seen unfortunately is clashes because Israel has ordered civilian Palestinian uh, Palestinian civilians I should say not to return to northern Gaza these a million people were displaced from northern Gaza by the fighting thousands of them tried to start going back today amid the truce but Israel has said not to come back and we saw clashes where we, we know that at least several people were injured after IDF troops opened fire we believe two people were killed and obviously that underlines the fragility of this truce if we were to see major violence, major casualties inside Gaza, that could jeopardize the continuation of this deal. But for now, we're seeing that it is happening and everyone hopes that it's going to continue for the next few days. Uh, so what comes, if all goes according to plan, Patrick, what comes after this four-day temporary ceasefire? I mean, the hope is that it's going to be extended by at least some days because Israel has indicated it's willing to extend this ceasefire by another day for every extra 10 hostages that Hamas releases. But they've indicated it won't be more than a 10-day pause. And Israel in general has made very clear it does not consider this to be anything more than temporary. They've, sig they've signaled at all levels of government, the IDF has signaled they intend to fully go back on the offensive once the ceasefire ends. Before it began, they were indicating they were going to go into, into southern Gaza that they were going to go after the, the Hamas leadership, which they say has taken shelter in Khan Yunis down there. And they say that there is going to be a continuation of this war. They're making very clear that this will not be the end of the war and that we should expect this to continue for months on. 
All right, Patrick Rieville for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Patrick. And back here at home, President Biden is monitoring that temporary ceasefire and hostage release, working the phones to try to ensure everything gets carried through to the end. U.S. officials also say the U.S. wants to make use of this four-day pause in fighting by surging humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially setting up safe zones. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president. Selena, how's the White House re reacting to news of this first group of hostages now being in Israel? Well, Diane, the president is here on Thanksgiving holiday in Nantucket, but we know he's been regularly briefed on the situation. And as you say, he's been in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. We are only on day one of what is supposed to be a four day pause. And U.S. officials have been very clear that nothing is done here until it's actually happened, given the fragility of this. Senior administration officials have said that in the early days of the crisis, top Biden aides set up a secret cell in order to work behind the scenes to coordinate with Israel and Qatar, which has been acting as this intermediary. And talks have not been smooth throughout this process. Negotiations had stalled several times. Hamas even broke off talks at one point. So a delicate, fragile situation. In the White House, senior administration officials, they've made clear that President Biden's role in this was critical and that he's been hands on here, even personally urging the mayor of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept this deal. So are there any major points of concern here, areas where the White House worries this agreement could fall apart? Well, look, like I just said, it's been incredibly tenuous and the mistrust and the suspicion between both sides, it makes it very concerning that this could fall apart at any moment. And we're only on day one of day four. But U.S. officials have said that this deal is structured in a way to incentivize Hamas to release more hostages in order to allow this ceasefire to last a little bit longer. But U.S. official had been clear before that they don't believe a general ceasefire and entire end to hostilities would be beneficial. They believe that would just give Hamas the ability to regroup and to execute another attack. Now, when it comes to the names on the list, we're still waiting to see who they are. But U.S. officials had said they were hopeful that it would include three Americans, two women and that young toddler, Abigail Moore Idan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. But beyond that, there are still several Americans Americans unaccounted for and many hostages not included in this deal. But U.S. officials say they are not going to stop until all of these hostages are released and they're going to continue to push for that. So, Selena, if everything goes smoothly with this plan, what will the U.S. look to do next? Well, even within these four days, we know that there are several things the U.S. wants to accomplish, including surging more humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as potentially setting up those safe zones. But after this, the U.S. is hoping that more hostages will be released, that all of them will be released. They understand that this isn't going to end hostilities, that Israel will continue to get their goal, which is to completely defeat Hamas after this. But they're hoping that this pause will be a critical window to help the civilians in Gaza. We did earlier have a statement from USAID which said this four-day pause this is helpful it gives the chance to get critical water food medical help into Gaza but it's not enough there needs to be a structural change to allow a significant amount of aid to go in but this is still tenuous this is fragile they're hoping more hostages will be released but nothing is set in stone all right Selena Wang there in Nantucket traveling with President Biden Selena thank you Coming up, we have more coverage of this hostage release. I'll speak with an expert on hostage situations and international security. How these negotiations happen when we come back. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. 
We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime, Blood Mountain, streaming only on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Welcome back. I'm Diane Macedo. The Israeli army is now confirming a group of hostages are back in Israel after being released by Hamas. This new video shows the convoy of 24 hostages leaving Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. Assistant Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert, joins me now for more on this. Professor, thank you for being on. I know you're an expert in hostage situations and international security. So first, I just want to get your reaction. What do you think now that you hear that this first group of hostages is back in Israel? I'm overjoyed for the hostages and for their families and their communities that have been waiting in agony over the last five weeks uh, after October 7th since they were taken hostage. So it's wonderful news for those who are coming home today and extremely difficult for those whose family members are still held hostage and everyone who's hoping that more hostages continue to come home. What is the process like now for this group that just arrived back in Israel and what do those around them need to consider uh, before, for example, just sending them home? So former hostages and advocates for hostage recovery will talk about the extremely complicated process that happens when hostages are actually free. They don't simply uh, go back to their normal lives. They have to process in extreme care the trauma, the physical violence, as well as the emotional turmoil that they have been through. And so they are going to be uh, examined medically and treated with uh, mental health professionals not only dealing with the trauma of the last five weeks, but about helping them as they confront the rest of their lives as, as former hostages and the pain that they will live with forever. Now, this is the, the first group of roughly 50 hostages that are expected to be released in total over the next four days. And it was a lengthy process to get to that deal. What stuck out to you most uh, as we reported on the progress being made and finally making the deal and now where we are? Were there any points that you thought, huh, that's strange? Um, so I actually thought that the, the way that the parties who came to these negotiations has been extremely productive and clever. It's uh, long been the case that countries like Qatar and Egypt have played a major role in, uh, in facilitating hostage negotiations. The United States and Qatar have worked together on hostage deals before. So the fact that there were these intermediaries is actually quite common. And the fact that they've structured this hostage release to be what we might call an iterated game, the fact that 10 hostages might be released by Hamas today, and then dozens of Palestinian detainees released, released from Israeli jails and prisons. And the fact that that might continue, that it's left an open-ended ending to the hostage release, that the more hostages that Hamas lets go, the more Palestinian prisoners that Israel will release over time with no set end. So 
hopefully we can be cautiously optimistic that that will continue for the next several days and hopefully even longer. So, Professor, what are you looking ahead to over the next four days and maybe beyond, as you say, if, if they do release more hostages and this ceasefire, uh, temporary ceasefire continues, what are you looking out for and, and what concerns you most? The thing that probably concerns me most is the fact that because it's this iteration, one side acts, then the other side responds, that all it takes is one person or a small group to potentially spoil the deal. That someone who is not in favor of hostages coming home, who's not in favor of ongoing pause in hostilities, could have the power to ruin it. And so hopefully the different governments that have been involved, all of the advisors and international organizations who are part of this process, are trying to keep their sides in line to ensure that this uh, continues smoothly going forward. All right, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert. Danny, thank you. Thanks for having me. And we will continue with our coverage on this hostage release in the Middle East, but we're also covering some of the other top stories this morning, including major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are covering breaking news with the latest developments of the hostage release in the Middle East. But for now, we also have some other top stories we're following for you. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been in prison for nine years for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. Also, the Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly airborne car crash set off a fiery explosion there. The two passengers in the car identified as husband and wife were killed. One booth agent is injured. And we're following the latest developments on the first group of hostages released from Gaza as part of a deal between Israel and Hamas. In Israel, some are celebrating in the streets as Israel confirms the identities of the 13 Israeli citizens among the 24 released. The group also includes 10 Thai citizens and one Filipino. Meanwhile, the UN and human rights groups warn violence in the West Bank has risen, with Israeli settlers accused of harassing Palestinians with near impunity in an escalating cycle of violence. Inez de la Quattara has more. The occupied West Bank. 
the heart of historic Palestine. And if from, you see from this, this, this one. That's a settlement. One, okay. two, three, all this is. Everywhere. Yes, this is all. You're surrounded. Surrounded, yes, unfortunately. How do the borders get decided? There's a map, uh, and the map shows where, where the border is. Uh, how the map is made, I don't know. Now, with the world's eyes on Gaza, violence against Palestinians here has been surging. The West Bank has been under Israeli military occupation since 1967, with varying degrees of Palestinian autonomy. But more and more Israeli communities, known as settlements, are being built here, considered illegal under international law. That's the ABC. <laughs> Following the October 7 terror attacks, the IDF conducting near nightly raids, it says, are meant to take out Hamas militants, while settler attacks on Palestinians are also on the rise. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, at least 173 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank since the October 7 attacks, making 2023 the deadliest year in this land since the UN began keeping records in 2005. Among those killed, farmer Bilal Saleh shot while picking olives with his family in their own field. This is uh, the olive picking, it's like a festival for us or carnival. Every year, same time, October, November. It's not something new. We practiced this 100 years before. His family says this video shows the moment settlers came down from across the opposite hillside, gun in hand. A shot rings out. Bilal found dead moments later. He leaves behind four young children, Mohammed, Malak, Maïs, and Musa. <laughs> Bilal's family says settlers have been emboldened by Israel's far-right government and by the war. They come with the forces and with the weapons and they put their containers and the people, you know, they start to make some protesting. They start uh, shouting and screaming, this is our land, this is our... So the things, it's escalating. Allah! The UN says more than 820 Palestinians in the occupied West Bank have been displaced since October 7th. Whole villages forced to leave their homes under the threat of settler intimidation, harassment and violence. They closed the entrance and they didn't allow to anybody. If you have uh, some pregnant, they cannot go to the hospital. If you have some old man, he, he needs to go to hospital. Also, it's not easy. They are saying go to Egypt, go to Jordan. You're asking me to leave my land? The issue of who these harsh lands belong to has never been more fraught. <laughs> with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu allying with Israel's far right to form a government at last year's election. <laughs> far right Minister of National Security Itamar Ben Gavir, a settler himself, loosening gun regulations for Israelis and announcing plans to purchase 10,000 rifles for civilian security teams in the West Bank, in other words, for settlers. Yani I am not expert in weapons, but there is difference between the small one and the big one. They are distributing the gun machines like you are spreading bread to the people. During a visit to the West Bank Wednesday, Prime Minister Netanyahu saying Israel won't tolerate Jewish extremists taking the law into their own hands, condemning what he said was a small minority who were damaging Israel's reputation on the international stage. We cannot tolerate this, he said. We will act against it in all ways. Secretary of State Antony Blinken raising the issue during his recent visit to Israel. What I heard today was a clear commitment from the government uh, to, to deal with extremist violence in the West Bank, uh, to condemn it, to take action to prevent it, uh, to take action uh, against those who perpetrated. We were given rare access to visit the settlement of Batain. Do you want to come in? Where we meet Daniel Winston, an Israeli-American settler originally from Chicago. This is not just real estate. This land is an expression of the fact that if you believe that God who created the whole universe and created this world and that he wrote the Bible, if he says in the Bible, I want the children of Israel to live in the land of Israel. So for me, that's not only an imperative, it's an invitation.
you feel, according to the Bible, this is your land. So what's your response when you hear, you know, that under international law, settlements are considered illegal? Uh, well, the Bible trumps international law. Palestinians say this is their land. They've been here for centuries. How does anyone find a solution here? Before we find a solution, we have to understand what the premises are. The Palestinians can say whatever they want, but the fact is there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. But according to 139 of the 193 UN member states, Palestinian territories are a state. However, key nations like the U.S., the U.K., and France do not recognize Palestine. That's three of the five permanent member states, leaving the official global acknowledgement of Palestine in limbo. <laughs> Daniel is also part of the settlement's security patrol. I'm sure you've seen the reports, the death toll of Palestinians being killed just this month alone. What do you make of that? I have nothing against the Arabs. I have something against the way they're acting. Um, and therefore, I have to do what I have to do. I have to carry a gun. I have to be alert. I have to, you know, and my, the, the soldiers of Israel have to act uh, respond accordingly. But Daniel dismisses the notion that settler attacks are on the rise. You see a video, you see a picture of a Jew carrying a gun, you see them shooting, you don't know what came before, you know what came after, and I'm not trying to justify it, I'm trying to say, if they, if they broke a law, so let the law get involved. In Bilal's case, an off-duty IDF soldier was arrested and later released by a judge who was satisfied he acted in self-defense. Bilal's family now left to pick up the pieces. Four children left to grow up without a father and fearing the worst is still to come. For us as a Palestinian West Bank, Gaza, everywhere we are uh, calling for peace and not for fighting and war. We need to have normal life. Inez de la Quattara, thank you. Meanwhile, Israel has now released the names of the Israeli citizens among those hostages freed today, ranging in age from 85 to just four years old. Doran Katz Asher, Raz Asher, Aviv Asher, Daniel Aloni, Amelia Aloni, Ruth Munder, Karen Munder, Ohad Munder, Adina Moshe, Hannah Katzir, Margalit Moses, Hannah Perry, and Yafer Adar are in that group of Israeli citizens released as part of the larger group of 24 released today. The prime minister's office says they underwent an initial medical examination and that their families have been informed that they're back. The government also confirms 11 foreign citizens were also released in part of that first group. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the tarmac of LaGuardia Airport, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diamond Sato. Welcome to ABC News Live First. We have breaking news now. The Israeli military now says the first group of hostages released by Hamas today have been returned to Israel. This is all part of a deal struck between Hamas and Israel. New video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. And Qatar's foreign minister now confirms 24 hostages were in this first group, 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, 10 Thai citizens, and one Filipino citizen. Now, this is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, 
Qatar says Israel has now released 39 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. But Israel is stressing that these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC's Patrick Rievel, who was there in Tel Aviv with the latest. Patrick, how significant is it uh, to now hear that these hostages are back in Israel? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last few minutes, really, we've heard that, the, yes, the, the hostages are now back on Israeli soil. We understand they're going to be taken to a military base in southern Israel where they'll be debriefed um, and then flown as, or brought, I should say, to Tel Aviv, uh, where they will be taken to two hospitals. We've also been watching these pictures of this convoy, this Red Cross convoy, arriving at the Rafah crossing at Egypt, watching, um, seeing a couple of the hostages step out of the ambulances. We've seen uh, two older women, um, one of them, uh, we've just heard from the families actually confirming the identity of two of them. One is a 72-year-old woman, another 78-year-old woman, as well as a nine-year-old boy. Uh, we know so far from Egypt, Israel, and Qatar that there are 13 Israeli hostages that have been freed, in addition to 10 Thai workers who were caught up in the Hamas attack and also taken hostage, as well as one Fili Filipino citizen. They have now all been freed and have been brought by the Red Cross out to Egypt, and now the Israeli hostages have been brought into Israel, and uh, now we expect that they will be brought here to Tel Aviv, where you saw um, a little while ago with Matt, we're seeing these celebrations now in what's become known as Hostage Square um, in downtown Tel Aviv. So Patrick, what's the timeline of how this is all expected to unfold now? Because this is all happening amid this four-day pause in fighting, and we're expecting these hostages just, and, and the prisoners being exchanged uh, as well from the Israeli side, it all to kind of happen gradually. Yes, yeah, so of course we now expect to go through this all over again tomorrow for the next three days. It's hoped that there's going to be hostage releases of around 10 to 12 hostages released every day during this four-day ceasefire. There's also hope that the, the ceasefire will be extended. I mean, both sides have indicated that potentially um, if Hamas is willing to release up to 10 hostages a day, then there could be another day extension of this ceasefire. And it's hoped that that will happen and that we will see more of the two, around 236 hostages that have been taken. The, the hope is that more than just the 50 already agreed will be released. As you say as well, we're seeing each day pal Palestinian prisoners released, women and, women and teenagers mainly being released um, by is Israel. We've seen the first 39 are expected to be released right now. Um, and they'll be going back to places like the West Bank, some, some to Jerusalem. Most are not from Gaza, only a handful are from Gaza. And we expect that each day we'll, we should be seeing as well a number of Palestinian prisoners released in exchange um, for these hostages. We're also seeing hundreds of trucks of aid potentially going into Gaza now. Um, as this ceasefire continues, it's hoped that that will ease somewhat the humanitarian disaster that is in Gaza. Uh, Patrick, we saw some of the celebrations there uh, from Hostage Square where Matt is, but where else, uh, what else are you hearing there in, in Tel Aviv? How are people reacting to knowing that at least this first group of hostages is now free? Yeah, I mean, I think the overwhelming emotion is, is relief. There's been huge tension here. This was a national trauma. Um, the attacks of October 7th obviously have just provoked huge shock and anger and, and fear in Israel. And just to, as you say, this was a bright spot. This is a bright spot. This is the first slightly hopeful thing that we have seen um, in seven weeks, really, where you're seeing for the first time these hostages be going free. And not only that, also a ceasefire that for now is holding in Gaza. It began at 7 a.m. this morning. We haven't seen seen bombing, we haven't seen heavy fighting, we haven't seen any fighting. What we have seen, unfortunately, is clashes because Israel has ordered civilian Palesti uh, Palestinian civilians, I should say, not to return to northern Gaza. These, a million people were displaced from northern Gaza by the fighting. Thousands of them tried to start going back today amid the truce, but Israel has said not to come back. And we saw clashes where we, we know that at least several people were injured after IDF troops opened fire. We believe two people were killed, and obviously that underlines the fragility of this truce. If we were to see major violence, major casualties inside Gaza, that could jeopardize the continuation of this deal. But for now, we're seeing that it is happening, and everyone hopes that it's going to continue for the next few days. Uh, so what comes, if all goes according to plan, Patrick, what comes after this four-day temporary ceasefire? 
I mean, the hope is that it's going to be extended by at least some days because Israel has indicated it's willing to extend this ceasefire by another day for every extra 10 hostages that Hamas releases. But they've indicated it won't be more than a 10-day pause. And Israel in general has made very clear it does not consider this to be anything more than temporary. They've, sig they've signaled at all levels of government, the IDF has signaled they intend to fully go back on the offensive once the ceasefire ends. Before it began, they were indicating they were going to go into, into southern Gaza that they were going to go after the, the Hamas leadership, which they say has taken shelter in Khan Yunus down there. And they say that there is going to be a continuation of this war. They're making very clear that this will not be the end of the war and that we should expect this to continue for months on. All right, Patrick Reval for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Patrick. And back here at home, President Biden is monitoring that temporary ceasefire and hostage release, working the phones to try to ensure everything gets carried through to the end. U.S. officials also say the U.S. wants to make use of this four-day pause in fighting by surging humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially setting up safe zones. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president. Selena, how's the White House re reacting to news of this first group of hostages now being in Israel? Well, Diane, the president is here on Thanksgiving holiday in Nantucket, but we know he's been regularly briefed on the situation. And as you say, he's been in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. We are only on day one of what is supposed to be a four day pause. And U.S. officials have been very clear that nothing is done here until it's actually happened, given the fragility of this. Senior administration officials have said that in the early days of the crisis, top Biden aides set up a secret cell in order to work behind the scenes to coordinate with Israel and Qatar, which has been acting as this intermediary. And talks have not been smooth throughout this process. Negotiations had stalled several times. Hamas even broke off talks at one point. So a delicate, fragile situation. And the White House, senior administration officials, they've made clear that President Biden's role in this was critical and that he's been hands on here, even personally urging the mayor of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept this deal. So are there any major points of concern here, areas where the White House worries this agreement could fall apart? Well, look, like I just said, it's been incredibly tenuous and the mistrust and the suspicion between both sides, it makes it very concerning that this could fall apart at any moment. And we're only on day one of day four. But U.S. officials have said that this deal is structured in a way to incentivize Hamas to release more hostages in order to allow this ceasefire to last a little bit longer. But U.S. officials had been clear before that they don't believe a general ceasefire and entire end to hostilities would be beneficial. They believe that would just give Hamas the ability to regroup and to execute another attack. Now, when it comes to the names on the list, we're still waiting to see who they are. But U.S. officials had said they were hopeful that it would include three Americans, two women and that young toddler, Abigail Moore Adan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. But beyond that, there are still several Americans unaccounted for and many hostages not included in this deal. But U.S. officials say they are not going to stop until all of these hostages are released and they're going to continue to push for that. So, Selena, if everything goes smoothly with this plan, what will the U.S. look to do next? Well, even within these four days, we know that there are several things the U.S. wants to accomplish, including surging more humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as potentially setting up those safe zones. But after this, the U.S. is hoping that more hostages will be released, that all of them will be released. They understand that this isn't going to end hostilities, that Israel will continue to get their goal, which is to completely defeat Hamas after this. But they're hoping that this pause will be a critical window to help the civilians in Gaza. We did earlier have a statement from USAID which said this four-day pause this is helpful this gives the chance to get critical water food medical help into Gaza but it's not enough there needs to be a structural change to allow a significant amount of aid to go in but this is still tenuous this is fragile they're hoping more hostages will be released but nothing is set in stone all right Selena Wang there in Nantucket traveling with President Biden Selena thank you Coming up, we have more coverage of this hostage release. I'll speak with an expert on hostage situations and international security. How these negotiations happen when we come back. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild crime at Blood Mountain. Streaming only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back. I'm Diana Macedo. The Israeli army is now confirming a group of hostages are back in Israel after being released by Hamas. This new video shows the convoy of 24 hostages leaving Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. Assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert, joins me now for more on this. Professor, thank you for being on. I know you're an expert in hostage situations and international security. So first, I just want to get your reaction. What do you think now that you hear that this first group of hostages is back in Israel? I'm overjoyed for the hostages and for their families and their communities that have been waiting in agony over the last five weeks uh, after October 7th since they were taken hostage. So it's wonderful news for those who are coming home today and extremely difficult for those whose family members are still held hostage and everyone who's hoping that more hostages continue to come home. What is the process like now for this group that just arrived back in Israel and what do those around them need to consider uh, before, for example, just sending them home? So former hostages and advocates for hostage recovery will talk about the extremely complicated process that happens when hostages are actually free. They don't simply uh, go back to their normal lives. They have to process in extreme care the trauma, the physical violence, as well as the emotional turmoil that they have been through. And so they are going to be uh, examined medically and treated with uh, mental health professionals not only dealing with the trauma of the last five weeks, but about helping them as they confront the rest of their lives as, as former hostages and the pain that they will live with forever.
Now, this is the, the first group of roughly 50 hostages that are expected to be released in total over the next four days. And it was a lengthy process to get to that deal. What stuck out to you most uh, as we reported on the progress being made and finally making the deal and now where we are? Were there any points that you thought, huh, that's strange? Um, so I actually thought that the, the way that the parties who came to these negotiations has been extremely productive and clever. It's uh, long been the case that countries like Qatar and Egypt have played a major role in, uh, in facilitating hostage negotiations. The United States and Qatar have worked together on hostage deals before. So the fact that there were these intermediaries is actually quite common. And the fact that they've structured this hostage release to be what we might call an iterated game, the fact that 10 hostages might be released by Hamas today, and then dozens of Palestinian detainees released, released from Israeli jails and prisons. And the fact that that might continue, that it's left an open-ended ending to the hostage release, that the more hostages that Hamas lets go, the more Palestinian prisoners that Israel will release over time with no set end. So hopefully we can be cautiously optimistic that that will continue for the next several days and hopefully even longer. So, Professor, what are you looking ahead to over the next four days and maybe beyond, as you say, if, if they do release more hostages and this ceasefire, uh, temporary ceasefire continues, what are you looking out for and, and what concerns you most? The thing that probably concerns me most is the fact that because it's this iteration, one side acts, then the other side responds, that all it takes is one person or a small group to potentially spoil the deal. That someone who is not in favor of hostages coming home, who's not in favor of ongoing pause in hostilities could have the power to ruin it. And so hopefully the different governments that have been involved, all of the advisors and international organizations who are part of this process are trying to keep their sides in line to ensure that this uh, continues smoothly going forward. All right, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert. Danny, thank you. Thanks for having me. And we will continue with our coverage on this hostage release in the Middle East, but we're also covering some of the other top stories this morning, including major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Stay with us. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime at Blood Mountain. Streaming only on Hulu. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know,
know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine, the USS Kentucky in South Korea, I'm Martha Raddatz. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Grab your coat if you're heading out to shop or travel today because some of the coldest air of the season is moving into parts of the country. Sam Champion is tracking the cold as well as a cross-country storm. Sam? Here's another winter storm, this one coming at the end of the holiday for everyone's travel home. So remember the one coming to the holiday just before it was a little bit troublesome and problematic. This one could slow things down, but it should not shut things down. Let's talk about the winter weather warnings and watches that are out right now for about 14 states. This is about 9 million people that are covered here. And this is where the storm continues to develop today, just kind of sitting still, but then slowly moving east after that. From Denver all the way to Boulder, this is like one to three inches of snow right in that area, but higher in the mountains could be another foot of snow. So as this moves into Kansas City, 7 p.m. Saturday to 5 a.m. on Sunday, that's the time that Kansas City is kind of involved in this. And it's a light snow for KC, but there's a little icy mix in some of that as well. So as we get to Chicagoland, and you're looking at this as an all-Sunday event, 5 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. And Chicagoland, this is not a big snow for us. We kind of get big snows. This is one to three, could be a little bit more in northern areas. But again, this is the kind of thing that might slow you down. It does not stop you. Detroit, the similar situation, most of the snow pushes into Canada, and it becomes a wet system with maybe just a little bit of high elevation northern New England snow, but not much at that. And if you look at the rainfall totals by the time we get to Sunday into Monday, for Boston, it's maybe one to two inches of, of rain. For New York, it's probably about an inch of rain. So that's way different from the storm that got us into the holiday and a lot less rain. Here's your travel Sunday, and you can see how quiet it is out west, so everything should be fine. There should not be any issues here, but there may be just some volume slowdowns. And if you combine that with some of the weather, it could mean the planes don't get where they're supposed to. So still connect your airports, still We'll make sure you know what's going on. Be careful on those roads because there's a lot of volume and just a little slippery mess. Diane? Sam Champion, thank you. And here are some of the top headlines we're following for you today. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been serving a prison sentence for killing his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home on Valentine's Day in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. The Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly crash sent the vehicle soaring through the air and set off a fiery explosion. The car's two passengers, identified as husband and wife, are dead. One booth agent is recovering from non-life-threatening injuries. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> How cute. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diamond Sato. Welcome to ABC News Live First. We have breaking news now. The Israeli military now says the first group of hostages released by Hamas today have been returned to Israel. This is all part of a deal struck between Hamas and Israel. New video shows the Red Cross convoy passing through the Rafah border crossing. And Qatar's foreign minister now confirms 24 hostages were in this first group, 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, 10 Thai citizens, and one Filipino citizen. Now, this is the first group of roughly 50 hostages expected to be released over the next four days. In exchange, Qatar says Israel has now released 39 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails in the West Bank. But Israel is stressing that these developments do not signal the war is over. ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is tracking it all from Tel Aviv, Israel, where crowds are gathering and reacting to the news of this release of a first group of hostages. Matt? Hey, Diane, we're in Hostage Square here. There are hundreds of people who are gathered here in what I would call sort of a cautious celebration. I'm going to bring the camera in and raise it up. You can see people singing and dancing here in the center. They have received the news that those hostages are in the hands of Red Cross. They're now in Egypt, we are told by multiple Israeli sources, on their way to being brought into Israel. And it's there that they will be met by a specialized Israeli military unit with training and dealing with hostages. They have pre-programmed uh, lines that they're supposed to talk about. They're not going to talk about what happened to anybody's family members. They'll say, you're safe, you're in good hands, we're going to get you to your loved ones. It's at that stage, right after they greet them, that they will give them a cursory medical check. They'll verify their identification. Israel doesn't know if the people who were on the list given by Hamas yesterday are the same people who they will be receiving today. And then they will be handed phones. They will be able to call their loved ones and speak to them for the first time in 49 very long days here. At that point, they'll be taken to hospitals uh, around Israel, six of them. All, of the ho all the children will be brought to a single hospital. And that's where they will be united with their family members and get to see them for the first time. There will also be battalions of psychologists and other doctors on hand to help with what we understand is going to be significant trauma. Now, for the Palestinians, Israel says that it's already transferring uh, 39 Palestinian prisoners in Israel's jails to the West Bank. They will actually be released once those hostages are on Israeli soil and confirmed. Now, it seems both sides right now are upholding the ceasefire, both sides living up to the commitments in this agreement. Israel has already received a list 
of the next batch of hostages for tomorrow. Everybody here, though, is still holding their breath, hoping that the next four days will actually pan out as planned, and 50 hostages will be brought back here, and Hamas will get 150 Palestinian prisoners, and all that aid will be brought into Gaza. And you can hear the singing still picking up. People here are feeling this emotional letdown after seven weeks of this massive tension over the hostages. Diane. All right, Matt Gutman, nice to see a bright spot there at least. And I want to go over to ABC's Patrick Rievel, who is also uh, there in Tel Aviv with the latest. Patrick, how significant is it uh, to now hear that these hostages are back in Israel? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last few minutes, really, we've heard that, the, yes, the, the hostages are now back on Israeli soil. We understand they're going to be taken to a military base in southern Israel where they'll be debriefed um, and then flown as, or brought, I should say, to Tel Aviv, uh, where they will be taken to two hospitals. We've also been watching these pictures of this convoy, this Red Cross convoy, arriving at the Rafah crossing at Egypt, watching, um, seeing a couple of the hostages step out of the ambulances. We've seen uh, two older women. Um, one of them, uh, we've just heard from the families actually confirming the identity of two of them. One is a 72-year-old woman, another 78-year-old woman, as well as a nine-year-old boy. Uh, we know so far from Egypt, Israel, and Qatar that there are 13 Israeli hostages that have been freed, in addition to 10 Thai workers who were caught up in the Hamas attack and also taken hostage, as well as one Fili Filipino citizen. They have now all been freed and have been brought by the Red Cross out to Egypt, and now the Israeli hostages have been brought into Israel and uh, now we expect that they will be brought here to Tel Aviv, where you saw um, a little while ago with Matt, we're seeing these celebrations now in what's become known as Hostage Square um, in downtown Tel Aviv. So, Patrick, what's the timeline of how this is all expected to unfold now? Because this is all happening amid this four-day pause in fighting, and we're expecting these hostages just and, and the prisoners being exchanged uh, as well from the Israeli side, it all to kind of happen gradually. Yes, yeah, so of course we now expect to go through this all over again tomorrow. For the next three days, it's hoped that there's going to be hostage releases of around 10 to 12 hostages released every day during this four-day ceasefire. There's also hope that the, the ceasefire will be extended. I mean, both sides have indicated that potentially, um, if Hamas is willing to release up to 10 hostages a day, then there could be another day extension of this ceasefire. And it's hoped that that will happen and that we will see more of the two around 236 hostages that have been taken. The, the hope is that more than just the 50 already agreed will be released. As you say as well, we're seeing each day pal Palestinian prisoners released, women and, women and teenagers mainly being released um, by is Israel. We've seen the first 39 are expected to be released right now. Um, and they'll be going back to places like the West Bank, some, some to Jerusalem. Most are not from Gaza, only a handful are from Gaza. And we expect that each day we'll, we should be seeing as well a number of Palestinian prisoners released in exchange um, for these hostages. We're also seeing hundreds of trucks of aid potentially going into Gaza now. Um, as this ceasefire continues, it's hoped that that will ease somewhat the humanitarian disaster that is in Gaza. Uh, Patrick, we saw some of the celebrations there uh, from Hostage Square where Matt is, but uh, where else, uh, w what else are you hearing there in, in Tel Aviv? How are people reacting to knowing that at least this first group of hostages is now free? Yeah, I mean, I think the overwhelming emotion is, is relief. There's been huge tension here. This was a national trauma. Um, the attacks of October 7th obviously have just provoked huge shock and anger and, and fear in Israel. And just to, as you say, this was a bright spot. This is a bright spot. This is the first slightly hopeful thing that we have seen um, in seven weeks, really, where you're seeing for the first time these hostages be going free. And not only that, also a ceasefire that for now is holding in Gaza. It began at 7 a.m. this morning. We haven't seen bombing. We haven't seen heavy fighting. We haven't seen any fighting. What we have seen, unfortunately, is clashes because Israel has ordered civilian Palesti uh, Palestinian civilians, I should say, not to return to northern Gaza. These, a million people were displaced from northern Gaza by the fighting. Thousands of them tried to start going back today amid the truce, but Israel has said not to come back. And we saw clashes where we, we know that at least several people were injured after IDF troops opened fire. We believe two people were killed. And obviously that underlines the fragility of this truce. If we were to see major violence, major casualties inside Gaza, that could jeopardize the continuation of this deal. But for now, we're seeing that it is happening, and everyone hopes that it's going to continue for the next few days. Uh, so what comes, if all goes according to plan, Patrick, what comes after this four-day temporary ceasefire? 
I mean, the hope is that it's going to be extended by at least some days because Israel has indicated it's willing to extend this ceasefire by another day for every extra 10 hostages that Hamas releases. But they've indicated it won't be more than a 10-day pause. And Israel in general has made very clear it does not consider this to be anything more than temporary. They've, sig they've signaled at all levels of government, the IDF has signaled they intend to fully go back on the offensive once the ceasefire ends. Before it began, they were indicating they were going to go into, into southern Gaza that they were going to go after the, the Hamas leadership, which they say has taken shelter in Khan Yunis down there. And they say that there is going to be a continuation of this war. They're making very clear that this will not be the end of the war and that we should expect this to continue for months on. All right, Patrick Rieville for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Patrick. And back here at home, President Biden is monitoring that temporary ceasefire and hostage release, working the phones to try to ensure everything gets carried through to the end. U.S. officials also say the U.S. wants to make use of this four-day pause in fighting by surging humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially setting up safe zones. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president. Selena, how's the White House re reacting to news of this first group of hostages now being in Israel? Well, Diane, the president is here on Thanksgiving holiday in Nantucket, but we know he's been regularly briefed on the situation. And as you say, he's been in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. We are only on day one of what is supposed to be a four day pause and U.S. officials have been very clear that nothing is done here until it's actually happened. Given the fragility of this, senior administration officials have said that in the early days of the crisis, top Biden aides set up a secret cell in order to work behind the scenes to coordinate with Israel and Qatar, which has been acting as this intermediary and talks have not been smooth throughout this process. Negotiations had stalled several times. Hamas even broke off talks at one point. So a delicate, fragile situation in the White House, senior administration officials, they've made clear that President Biden's role in this was critical and that he's been hands on here, even personally urging the mayor of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept this deal. So are there any major points of concern here, areas where the White House worries this agreement could fall apart? Well, look, like I just said, it's been incredibly tenuous and the mistrust and the suspicion between both sides, it makes it very concerning that this could fall apart at any moment. And we're only on day one of day four. But U.S. officials have said that this deal is structured in a way to incentivize Hamas to release more hostages in order to allow this ceasefire to last a little bit longer. But U.S. officials had been clear before that they don't believe a general ceasefire and entire end to hostilities would be beneficial. They believe that would just give Hamas the ability to regroup and to execute another attack. Now, when it comes to the names on the list, we're still waiting to see who they are. But U.S. officials had said they were hopeful that it would include three Americans, two women and that young toddler, Abigail Moore Adan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. But beyond that, there are still several Americans unaccounted for and many hostages not included in this deal. But U.S. officials say they are not going to stop until all of these hostages are released and they're going to continue to push for that. So, Selena, if everything goes smoothly with this plan, what will the U.S. look to do next? Well, even within these four days, we know that there are several things the U.S. wants to accomplish, including surging more humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as potentially setting up those safe zones. But after this, the U.S. is hoping that more hostages will be released, that all of them will be released. They understand that this isn't going to end hostilities, that Israel will continue to get their goal, which is to completely defeat Hamas after this. But they're hoping that this pause will be a critical window to help the civilians in Gaza. We did earlier have a statement from USAID which said this four-day pause this is helpful it gives a chance to get critical water food medical help into Gaza but it's not enough there needs to be a structural change to allow a significant amount of aid to go in but this is still tenuous this is fragile they're hoping more hostages will be released but nothing is set in stone all right Selena Wang there in Nantucket traveling with President Biden Selena thank you Coming up, we have more coverage of this hostage release. I'll speak with an expert on hostage situations and international security. How these negotiations happen when we come back.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Kana Whitworth at the Apex Summit in San Francisco. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. I'm Diane Macedo. The Israeli army is now confirming a group of hostages are back in Israel after being released by Hamas. This new video shows the convoy of 24 hostages leaving Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. Assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert, joins me now for more on this. Professor, thank you for being on. I know you're an expert in hostage situations and international security. So first, I just want to get your reaction. What do you think now that you hear that this first group of hostages is back in Israel? I'm overjoyed for the hostages and for their families and their communities that have been waiting in agony over the last five weeks uh, after October 7th since they were taken hostage. So it's wonderful news for those who are coming home today and extremely difficult for those whose family members are still held hostage and everyone who's hoping that more hostages continue to come home. What is the process like now for this group that just arrived back in Israel and what do those around them need to consider uh, before, for example, just sending them home? So former hostages and advocates for hostage recovery will talk about the extremely complicated process that happens when hostages are actually free. They don't simply uh, go back to their normal lives. They have to process in extreme care the trauma, the physical violence, as well as the emotional turmoil that they have been through. And so they are going to be uh, examined medically and treated with uh, mental health professionals not only dealing with the trauma of the last five weeks, but about helping them as they confront the rest of their lives as, as former hostages and the pain that they will live with forever. Now, this is the, the first group of roughly 50 hostages that are expected to be released in total over the next four days. And it was a lengthy process to get to that deal. What stuck out to you most uh, as we reported on the progress being made and finally making the deal and now where we are? Were there any points that you thought, huh, that's strange? Um, so I actually thought that the, the way that the parties who came to these negotiations has been extremely productive and clever. It's uh, long been the case that countries like Qatar and Egypt have played a major role in, uh, in facilitating hostage negotiations. The United States and Qatar have worked together on hostage deals before. So the fact that there were these intermediaries is actually quite common. And the fact that they've structured this hostage release to be what we might call an iterated game, the fact that 
10 hostages might be released by Hamas today, and then dozens of Palestinian detainees released, released from Israeli jails and prisons. And the fact that that might continue, that it's left an open-ended ending to the hostage release, that the more hostages that Hamas lets go, the more Palestinian prisoners that Israel will release over time with no set end. So hopefully we can be cautiously optimistic that that will continue for the next several days and hopefully even longer. So, Professor, what are you looking ahead to over the next four days and maybe beyond, as you say, if, if they do release more hostages and this ceasefire, uh, temporary ceasefire continues, what are you looking out for and, and what concerns you most? The thing that probably concerns me most is the fact that because it's this iteration, one side acts, then the other side responds, that all it takes is one person or a small group to potentially spoil the deal. That someone who is not in favor of hostages coming home, who's not in favor of ongoing pause in hostilities, could have the power to ruin it. And so hopefully the different governments that have been involved, all of the advisors and international organizations who are part of this process, are trying to keep their sides in line to ensure that this uh, continues smoothly going forward. All right, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, Danny Gilbert. Danny, thank you. Thanks for having me. And we will continue with our coverage on this hostage release in the Middle East, but we're also covering some of the other top stories this morning, including major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Stay with us. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back. We are covering breaking news with the latest developments of the hostage release in the Middle East. But for now, we also have some other top stories we're following for you. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been imprisoned for nine years for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. Also, the Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly airborne car crash set off a fiery explosion there. The two passengers in the car identified as husband and wife were killed. One booth agent is injured. 
And we're following the latest developments on the first group of hostages released from Gaza as part of a deal between Israel and Hamas. In Israel, some are celebrating in the streets as Israel confirms the identities of the 13 Israeli citizens among the 24 released. The group also includes 10 Thai citizens and one Filipino. Meanwhile, the UN and human rights groups warn violence in the West Bank has risen, with Israeli settlers accused of harassing Palestinians with near impunity in an escalating cycle of violence. Inez de la Quattara has more. The occupied West Bank, the heart of historic Palestine. And if from, you see from this, this, this one. That's a settlement. One, okay. two, three, all this is. Everywhere. Yes, this is You're all. surrounded. Surrounded, yes, unfortunately. How do the borders get decided? There's a map, uh, and the map shows where, where the border is. Uh, how the map is made, I don't know. Now, with the world's eyes on Gaza, violence against Palestinians here has been surging. The West Bank has been under Israeli military occupation since 1967, with varying degrees of Palestinian autonomy. But more and more Israeli communities, known as settlements, are being built here, considered illegal under international law. That's the ABC. <laughs> Following the October 7 terror attacks, the IDF conducting near nightly raids, it says, are meant to take out Hamas militants, while settler attacks on Palestinians are also on the rise. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, at least 173 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank since the October 7 attacks, making 2023 the deadliest year in this land since the UN began keeping records in 2005. Among those killed, farmer Bilal Saleh shot while picking olives with his family in their own field. This is uh, the olive picking, it's like a festival for us or carnival. Every year, same time, October, November. It's not something new. We practiced this 100 years before. His family says this video shows the moment settlers came down from across the opposite hillside, gun in hand. A shot rings out. Bilal found dead moments later. He leaves behind four young children, Mohammed, Malak, Maïs, and Musa. <laughs> Bilal's family says settlers have been emboldened by Israel's far-right government and by the war. They come with the forces and with the weapons, and they put their containers, and the people, you know, they start to make some protesting. They start uh, shouting and screaming, this is our land, this is our... So the things, it's escalating. Allah! The UN says more than 820 Palestinians in the occupied West Bank have been displaced since October 7th. Whole villages forced to leave their homes under the threat of settler intimidation, harassment and violence. They closed the entrance and they didn't allow to anybody. If you have uh, some pregnant, they cannot go to the hospital. If you have some old man, he, he needs to go to hospital. Also, it's not easy. They are saying go to Egypt, go to Jordan. You're asking me to leave my land. The issue of who these harsh lands belong to has never been more fraught. <laughs> with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu allying with Israel's far right to form a government at last year's election. <laughs> far right Minister of National Security Itamar Ben Gavir, a settler himself, loosening gun regulations for Israelis and announcing plans to purchase 10,000 rifles for civilian security teams in the West Bank, in other words, for settlers. Yani I am not expert in weapons, but there is difference between the small one and the big one. They are distributing the gun machines like you are spreading bread to the people. During a visit to the West Bank Wednesday, Prime Minister Netanyahu saying Israel won't tolerate Jewish extremists taking the law into their own hands, condemning what he said was a small minority who were damaging Israel's reputation on the international stage. We cannot tolerate this, he said. We will act against it in all ways. Secretary of State Antony Blinken raising the issue during his recent visit to Israel. What I heard today was a clear commitment from the government uh, to, to deal with extremist violence in the West Bank, uh, to condemn it, to take action to prevent it, 
uh, to take action uh, against those who perpetrate it. We were given rare access to visit the settlement of Batain. Do you want to come in? Where we meet Daniel Winston, an Israeli-American settler originally from Chicago. This is not just real estate. This land is an expression of the fact that if you believe that God who created the whole universe and created this world and that he wrote the Bible, if he says in the Bible, I want the children of Israel to live in the land of Israel, so for me, that's not only an imperative, it's an invitation. You feel, according to the Bible, this is your land. So what's your response when you hear, you know, that under international law, settlements are considered illegal? Uh, well, the Bible trumps international law. Palestinians say this is their land. They've been here for centuries. How does anyone find a solution here? Before we find a solution, we have to understand what the premises are. The Palestinians can say whatever they want, but the fact is there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. But according to 139 of the 193 UN member states, Palestinian territories are a state. However, key nations like the US, the UK and France do not recognize Palestine. That's three of the five permanent member states, leaving the official global acknowledgement of Palestine in limbo. <laughs> Daniel is also part of the settlement's security patrol. I'm sure you've seen the reports, the death toll of Palestinians being killed just this month alone. What do you make of that? I have nothing against the Arabs. I have something against the way they're acting. Um, and therefore, I have to do what I have to do. I have to carry a gun. I have to be alert. I have to, you know, and my, the, the soldiers of Israel have to act uh, respond accordingly. But Daniel dismisses the notion that settler attacks are on the rise. You see a video, you see a picture of a Jew carrying a gun, you see them shooting, you don't know what came before, you don't know what came after, and I'm not trying to justify it, I'm trying to say, if they, if they broke a law, so let the law get involved. In Bilal's case, an off-duty IDF soldier was arrested and later released by a judge who was satisfied he acted in self-defense. Bilal's family now left to pick up the pieces. Four children left to grow up without a father and fearing the worst is still to come. For us as a Palestinian in West Bank, Gaza, everywhere we are uh, calling for peace. I am not for fighting and war. We need to have normal life. Inez de la Quattara, thank you. Meanwhile, Israel has now released the names of the Israeli citizens among those hostages freed today, ranging in age from 85 to just four years old. Doran Katz Asher, Raz Asher, Aviv Asher, Daniel Aloni, Amelia Aloni, Ruth Munder, Karen Munder, Ohad Munder, Adina Moshe, Hannah Katzir, Margalit Moses, Hannah Perry, and Yafer Adar are in that group of Israeli citizens released as part of the larger group of 24 released today. The prime minister's office says they underwent an initial medical examination and that their families have been informed that they're back. The government also confirms 11 foreign citizens were also released in part of that first group. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. 
I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming ABC News Live's continuing coverage of the hostage release in the Middle East. Celebrations are underway in Israel as 24 hostages held in Gaza are now free. Hamas released the Israeli, Thai and Filipino citizens as part of a deal with Israel. The Israeli citizens in the group are now back in their home country. The others are waiting in Egypt to be sent home. The deal also included a four-day ceasefire that started earlier today and a gradual swap of Hamas-held prisoners, or rather Hamas-held hostages for Palestinian prisoners being held in prisons in the West Bank. Now, Qatar is confirming Israel has carried out the release of some of those prisoners held in the West Bank. And, of course, we're going to continue with the latest on those developments. But right now, we also want to go over to the White House, where President Biden is monitoring that temporary ceasefire and hostage release. The White House says he's getting briefed in real time from his national security team. U.S. officials also say the president wants to take advantage of this four-day pause in fighting to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza and potentially set up safe zones for more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's actually in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with President Biden, who's there for the Thanksgiving holiday. Selena, I know the president's not physically at the White House, but how is the White House reacting to news of this first group of hostages being released? Well, Diane, any moment now, we are waiting for President Biden to speak from here in Nantucket to address the release of this first group of hostages. The White House has said that the president has been briefed regularly, including multiple times this morning by his national security team. Now, of course, this is a very positive sign that as of now, this ceasefire for today it seems to be holding and that both sides seem to be holding their side of the deal. But the White House has been very clear that it all comes down to execution and nothing's done until it's actually happened. We're only on day one of four days of this. We've seen the first group of hostages cross, but they're expecting 50 in total. And also the U.S. officials have made clear that the president is determined to have all of the remaining hostages released. They say there's the potential that this four day ceasefire could last for even longer if Hamas continues to gather and release more hostages. Now, we know that President Biden has been very hands-on throughout this negotiation process, even personally, according to senior administration officials, even personally urging the mayor of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept it as well. But given the deep mistrust and the suspicion from both sides, this is fragile and this is delicate. The White House, we know, monitoring it very closely. Uh, Selena... What has this negotiation process been like for President Biden? And what happens now that this deal is going into effect? How do you keep the train on the tracks? Yeah, well, that's what the president has been trying to do this do while he's been here in Nantucket by keeping the train on the track, staying in close contact with regional partners. We know he's been working the phone, speaking to the leaders of Israel, Egypt, as well as Qatar, which has been acting as a critical intermediary. But senior administration officials say that this has been an excruciating process, painstaking, very difficult negotiation process for weeks. They said that, in fact, in the early days of the crisis, beginning all the way back then, a group of top senior officials to President Biden, they set up what they call a secret cell in order to very 
very carefully be in discussion and coordination with both Israel and Qatar to behind the scenes start to work out how to release these hostages. Now you'll remember that two Americans were released last month and officials described that as a test run to prove to show that this secret cell could actually deliver on its promises. And then from there they worked on this broader negotiation to release more hostages. But it was not smooth sailing. Talks stalled multiple times. Negotiations were difficult and at one point Hamas even broke off talks. But officials are saying that President Biden has played a critical role in getting these talks to the point where we are at today. So they are very carefully monitoring this as it's very high stakes and high pressure. So Selena, if everything goes smoothly, what does the U.S. then look to do next? Well, even within these few days, they are going to be looking for more than just the release of the number of hostages agreed upon. They're also wanting to use this period of a pause in fighting to surge humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as to potentially set up these safe zones. And we've heard from USAID saying that, look, this pause is critical for getting some much needed food, water, medical care into Gaza, but that's not enough. There needs to be a long term, sustainable way to get more aid into Gaza, a significant up ramp of aid into Gaza. Gaza over the long term. Now, U.S. officials are hopeful that this ceasefire can last for longer than four days. In fact, last month, I asked President Biden, did you ask Netanyahu for a three-day pause? And at that point, he said, yes, and I've asked for much longer. So look, officials say if Hamas can produce more hostages, then this could last for longer. Again, the goal here is to get all of those hostages out. But Israel has said that they will continue this fighting. It's not over after this. All right, Senior White House Correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket traveling with the President. Selena, thank you. And those released Israeli hostages are now back in Israel thanks to the Red Cross, who played a crucial role in this deal and transfer. John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me now from Geneva with more. John, you guys played such a central role in all of this. Walk me through what went into making this deal happen, and how do you feel now that this day has arrived and this first group is free again? I say the most important part about this is the relief that the families feel, uh, the relief that the hostages feel after seven weeks in captivity, uh, being separated from a family member in a situation of conflict is the most excruciating pain. Uh, people tell us that even if they've lost their homes and, and they're short on food and water, it's really the separation. If, they're, if they've if they become uh, separated from their daughter or their son or their, their, their spouse, that, that's the deepest pain. So the good news today is the alleviation of that suffering that the families have been going through and that the hostages have been going through. So walk us through what the protocol looks like. These hostages are now released. Uh, the Israelis are back in Israel. The others are waiting to make their own way home. What happens now? Well, the important part on this step is the agreement of the parties. The, this, uh, uh, this ceasefire, first of all, and then the agreement to allow the hostages to be released and the detainees uh, held by Israel to be released. Uh, and then our role in this was to go meet Hamas. We had four land cruisers, uh, eight ICRC personnel, meeting these 24 hostages uh, and then moving them across Gaza into safe hands to Egyptian and Israeli authorities. What's next is that, of course, this is just day one. Uh, we expect to repeat this process tomorrow to move even more hostages out of harm's way from their captors back towards their families as well as more Palestinian detainees, also to note, back to their families. So the good news here from our perspective is that we're reducing that family separation, which is the cause of the, of the greatest heartache that you see in war. Now, officials also say that this four-day pause could be extended even further if Hamas continues to release more hostages after this, I shouldn't say initial group, because I feel like today's is the initial group, but after the, these roughly 50 uh, as part of this deal, how likely do you think that is to happen, that they reach the number agreed upon in this deal and Hamas decides, you know what, we'll release some more if you continue this ceasefire? We can only hope that it happens. We can only hope that these initial steps are some sort of confidence building measure and it does lead to a reduction of conflict in the future, whether it's complete ceasefire or reduction. Of course, we support that because we see how much civilian suffering is caused in this earth close in fighting all the damage and destruction that you see in Gaza 
and therefore all the suffering that cascades down to the families. So no predictions on our part. We're happy to continue to play this role of neutral intermediary between the two sides, between Hamas, between Israel, uh, in order to further humanitarian goals and, and hope that that's the track that we're on right now. And of course, many more hostages are still held captive. John, what happens next to this group that is part of this exchange deal? And then what happens to those who aren't? So the group that gets to go, of course, has this nightmare, the seven-week nightmare, uh, come to an end. And they begin the healing process from this experience back with their families, their friends, uh, if they have to meet with counselors or therapists, of course. Um, and now for the other group um, that won't be so fortunate to be released in this four-day operation, the International Committee of the Red Cross since day one has been insisting with direct uh, through direct talks with Hamas that we'd be allowed to visit all of the hostages, check on their welfare, bring medical care if necessary, allow those hostages to be able to communicate with their families. We've had those talks directly with Hamas at the highest level. Our president met the political leader of Hamas in Qatar. Uh, so we continue to insist on that. Um, we don't have any agreements that that's going to take place, but we're still working on it. All right, John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. John, thank you. I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on to share your story. Thanks for your interest. And Israel says today's developments don't mean the war is over. Israel is promising the fighting will continue once this temporary ceasefire ends. ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, is here with more on that. Mick, how crucial are the next steps over the next four days? And what goes into keeping everyone in an agreement like this to hold their words until the full deal uh, has been carried through? So, Diane, the next few days are very critical, not just to get all the hostages out, which is very important, but also going ahead if there's ever another uh, opportunity for a ceasefire, they need to be able to trust each other. And if this mechanism works, uh, you know, brokered by uh, Qatar uh, with these uh, with these group of people, these secret cell of uh, negotiators, uh, if it works, that is really positive, and I think it could really help uh, in the long run with finally getting an end to this conflict once uh, both uh, both parties to this conflict are ready for it. Now, Israel has made clear that this war will resume once this temporary pause is over and that their goal is still to eliminate Hamas entirely. So what's in this for Hamas besides getting these Palestinian prisoners released? So they get this pause, which means, and they actually specifically requested and got uh, that the IDF will not fly drones over Gaza for a certain period of time. I think it's likely they're going to try to reposition themselves, both their command and control, potentially out of harm's way up in the northern part of Gaza, uh, reallocate their troops to, to move around the IDF strong points, uh, potentially in the tunnels, and then, of course, uh, move hostages, hostages they don't intend on releasing anytime soon. So they're, I think, using this to their military advantage. I think the IDF accepted that, uh, but they did so because they, it was that important to get their citizens out of uh, custody. And I think that was something that any soldier would do. But I think you can see that in the next few days. You may see some skirmishes. Uh, it, it's, it requires discipline to maintain a ceasefire. I believe the IDF forces will strong point, but if they're attacked, they'll have self-defense. Hopefully both sides realize that could happen and it doesn't actually rupture the agreement. We're seeing some photos of these hostages come across the screen right now. Mick, while this is happening, there's this four-day ceasefire, and officials are saying they're, they're hoping to take advantage of that to get more aid into Gaza as well, in addition to this prisoner and hostage exchange that's going on. Israel has said it will allow humanitarian aid, including fuel, into Gaza. How important is that, and how significant do you think that could be? It's very important, Diane. Before this conflict started, before October 7th, about 400 trucks came in a day, and about 67% of the population of Gaza will relied on that aid. Uh, today, with this agreement, 200 trucks come in. So it is good, but it is not enough. They need to dramatically increase the capacity of humanitarian aid flowing into Gaza, simply to catch up for all the lack that they've had for uh, a month. Uh, this fuel is very important. It was a concern of the IDF because they believe Hamas will take it 
and use it for their purposes, but it's absolutely critical to because that's what runs these power generators that runs these hospitals. So it is a good thing. It needs to happen. Uh, from our reports, USAID is in there in force, are pushing to get humanitarian aid in, and that is a good thing. That's what the United States should be doing. There's 2 million people uh, in uh, Gaza. Only 40,000 of them are part of Hamas. So, Mick, what are you watching for over these next four days? So I will be looking to see that if each step is successful, that they get more and more confident in this agreement. Uh, like I mentioned, there may be some hiccups. There may be uh, a lone wolf type Hamas person shooting at an IDF position, uh, and they will defend themselves. But I hope that that is considered for what it is, a one-off and not an actual rupture of the agreement. It is important that all of these hostages eventually come out, certainly with the first 50, as was agreed upon. If that works, it's obviously great for the hostages, their families, but it also is an indicator that this system could work long-term for an eventual full ceasefire. So many fingers crossed this goes smoothly. ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy. Mick, thank you. And Israel has now released the identities of the Israeli citizens among that group of 24 hostages released by Hamas today. These are the names of those 13 Israeli citizens ranging in age from two years old to 85. Let's go straight to ABC News Patrick Revel in Tel Aviv for us. Patrick, what do you know about the hostages in this group and those who haven't been released yet? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last hour or so, the IDF has said that 22 of the hostages released have been flown to Hatzeri Air Base in southern Israel. It said two Israeli citizens were taken straight to hospital by ambulance. And we know now that there are 13 Israeli hostages freed. There were 10 Thai citizens freed who were all workers in the kibbutz, as well as one Filipino citizen. And what we know is that most of these uh, 13 Israeli hostages came from the same kibbutz. Twelve of them came from the same kibbutz near Roz, which was very badly hit in the Hamas attack. We know that um, there were 77 residents of that kibbutz taken hostage. Now, th now 12 have been freed. They, uh, what we, what we know as well, oh, just a very loud siren here. What we know as well is that, of course, some of them still have relatives kept in the tunnels um, in Ham by Hamas. They have not yet been released. Um, some of them include uh, some of their husbands and grandfathers. Uh, we know also that some of, the pe some of these hostages were extremely young. You know, the youngest was two years old. Four of them were children. Uh, the oldest was 85. And so, of course, we, as well, over 200 now remain still held hostage by Hamas. There's hope that there, at least 50 of them will be freed in the next three days. And there's a hope, of course, that the, the uh, ceasefire could be extended if Hamas agrees to release 10 more hostages each day. But, of course, this is still good news. The hope is that we'll be seeing something similar in the next few days to come. And, Patrick, how is the ceasefire holding up so far? The ceasefire has so far today held. It began at 7 a.m. and we haven't seen any fighting or any airstrikes continuing in Gaza throughout the day. What we have seen, though, is clashes where we've seen large numbers of Palestinian civilians trying to return home to northern Gaza. A million people were forced out of northern Gaza by the fighting. They've now, we've seen thousands of them trying to return home today. But they've, when they've attempted to, the IDF has said they should not return. And there have been clashes where IDF troops have opened fire on those civilians. We know at least several people were injured and at least two were believed to be killed. And that is a serious problem because, of course, it can potentially jeopardize this deal if we see those sorts of clashes continuing. All right, Patrick, thank you. And now we're going to head over to Nantucket, Massachusetts, where President Biden is speaking about the release of that first group of hostages by Hamas. Let's listen to the president. Of families being recruited and reunited with loved ones who have been held hostage for nearly 50 days. Beginning this morning, under a deal reached by extensive U.S. diplomacy, including numerous calls I've made from the Oval Office to leaders across the region, fighting in Gaza will halt for four days. This deal also is structured to allow a pause to continue for more than 50 hostages to be released. That's our goal. This morning, I've been engaged with my team as we began the first difficult days of implementing this deal. It's only a start, but so far it's gone well. Early this morning, 13 Israeli hostages were released, including an elderly woman, a grandmother, and mothers with their young children, some under the age of six years old. Separately, several Thai nationals and Filipino nationals were also kidnapped by Hamas on the 7th. They were released as well. 
All of these hostages have been through a terrible ordeal, and this is the beginning of a long journey of healing for them. The teddy bears waiting to greet those children at the hospital are a stark reminder of the trauma these children have been through and at such a very young age. Jill and I, and Jill's with me here, are keeping them all in our prayers today. Today, today has been a product of a lot of hard work and weeks of personal engagement. From the moment Hamas kidnapped these people, I, along with my team, have worked around the clock to secure their release. We saw the first results of this effort with the release of two American hostages in late October, followed by the release of two Israeli hostages. I've consistently pressed for a pause in the fighting for two reasons, to accelerate and expand humanitarian assistance going into Gaza, and two, to facilitate the release of hostages. And over the past several weeks, I've spoken repeatedly with the Emir of Qatar, the President of Sisi of Egypt, and Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel to help secure this deal, to nail it down. And I want to thank all three leaders for their personal partnership to get this done. I spoke with the Emir and President el-Sisi and the Prime Minister Netanyahu again on Wednesday to confirm the elements of the engagement. As I said, today's release are the start of a process. We expect more hostages to be released tomorrow, and more the day after, and more the day after that. Over the next few days, we expect that dozens of hostages will be returned to their families. We also remember all those who are still being held and renew our commitment to work for their release as well. Two American women and one four-year-old child, Abigail, who remains among those missing. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza, and we are not wasting one single minute. Since my trip to Israel last month, I've been focused on accelerating the delivery of humanitarian assistance to Gaza in coordination with the United Nations and the Red Cross. I just spoke with my special envoy for the Middle East Humanitarian Issues, David Satterfield, for an update. And I've asked him to monitor our progress hour by hour and keep me personally informed. From the beginning, we put in place mechanisms to prevent Hamas from diverting these supplies. And we're continuing that effort to make sure aid gets to the people who need it. More than 200 trucks arrived at the crossing point in Egypt into Gaza today. These trucks carry food and medicine, as well as fuel, fuel and cooking gas. The fuel will be used not only to power the trucks delivering this life-saving supplies, but to, for desalinization, for water wells, for hospitals, and for bakeries. And hundreds more trucks are getting in position as well, ready to enter Gaza over the coming days to support the innocent Palestinians who are suffering greatly because of this war that Hamas has unleashed. Hamas doesn't give a damn about them. We also look to the future. As we look to the future, we have to end this cycle of violence in the Middle East. We need to renew our resolve to pursue this two-state solution where Israelis and Palestinians can one day live side by side in a two-state solution with equal measure of freedom and dignity. Two states for two peoples. And it's more important now than ever. Hamas unleashed this terrorist attack because they fear nothing more than Israelis and Palestinians living side by side in peace. You know, to continue down the path of terror and violence and killing war is to give Hamas what they seek. And we can't do that. So today, let's continue to be thankful for all the families who are now and those who will soon be brought together again. And I want to once again thank the Emir of Qatar President Sisi of Egypt and Prime Minister Netanyahu for their partnership to make what we've done so far possible and for their continued leadership as we all keep working to implement this deal. And over the coming days, I'll remain engaged with leaders throughout the Middle East as we all work together to build a better future for the region, a future where this kind of violence is unthinkable, a future where all children in the region, every child, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, grow up knowing only peace. 
That's what we do. We're waiting now. Um, it's just a matter of, I thought, maybe even as soon as by the time I got here. But in the next hour or so, we'll know what the second wave of releases are. And I'm hopeful that is, it's as, well, as we anticipate. So thank you all for listening. I'll take a few questions. Mr. President, when will the first American hostages be released since none were included today? We don't know when that will occur, but we're going to be expected to occur. And uh, we don't know what the list of all the hostages are and when they'll be released, but we know the numbers where they're going to be released. And so it's my hope and expectation will be soon. And of the 10 Americans that are unaccounted for, do you know all of their conditions? Are they all alive? We don't know all of their conditions. Mr. President, how long do you expect this war is going to take? And have you encouraged Prime Minister Netanyahu to set a timeline, say, by the end of this year? I've encouraged the Prime Minister to. Uh, to focus on trying to reduce the number of casualties while he is attempting to eliminate Hamas, which is a legitimate objective he has. That's a difficult task, and uh, I don't know how long it will take. My expectation and hope is that as we move forward, the rest of the Arab world and the region is also putting pressure on all sides to slow this down, to bring this to an end as quickly as we can. Mr. President, President do what are the you chances of this uh, troops to be extended by a few days or more? I think the chances are real. Mr. President, there are members of your party who would like to see conditions placed on aid to Israel. What is your view on that? They would like to see, uh, you know, a reduction in the bombing and that sort of thing. Well, I think that's a, 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 a worthwhile thought, but I don't think if I started off with that, we'd ever gotten to where we are today. Mr. We have to take this a piece of the time. Mr. President, do you trust Hamas to uphold their ability? I don't trust Hamas to do anything right. I only trust Hamas to respond to pressure. Mr. President, you said you were hoping to get cooperation from Arab leaders. What are you hearing from them when you talk to them? What would you like to see them do? I'm hearing a lot, but I'm not going to speak to it right now. There's an overwhelming desire on the part of the region to — let me back up. I'm, I cannot prove what I'm about to say, but I believe one of the reasons why Hamas struck when they did was they knew that I was working very closely with the Saudis and others in the region to bring peace to the region by having recognition of Israel and Israel's right to exist. You may recall when we did the G20 about a little while ago, I was able to get a resolution, a, a, a statement passed through there saying we're going to build a railroad from Riyadh all the way through the Middle East into, into Saudi Arabia, Israel, et cetera, and all the way up to Europe. Not the, not the railroad, but it would be an underground pipeline and then railroad. The whole idea is there's overwhelming interest, and I think most Arab nations know it, in coordinating with one another to change the dynamic in their region for longer-term peace. And uh, that is uh, what I'm going to continue to work on. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> That was President Biden speaking after the release of 24 hostages by Hamas as part of a deal the U.S. and Qatar helped broker between Israel and Hamas. Again, 24 hostages released in total, 13 of those Israeli citizens. They are now in Israel, while the foreign nationals are now in Egypt awaiting transfer back to their home countries. We heard the president there talking about this four-day ceasefire that this is all happening amid, hoping to use that four-day ceasefire as an opportunity to get more aid into Gaza. And the president also looking to the future, saying he now thinks a two-state solution is more important than ever so that Israelis and Palestinians can live side by side in peace. I want to bring in ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's traveling with the president in Nantucket, Massachusetts, along with ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy. For more, Selena, you heard President Biden there saying this is just the beginning. How significant is it for the president to have this deal now in motion and to be looking ahead to what's next? 
Well, this is a major diplomatic breakthrough, Diane, especially considering how personally involved President Biden has been throughout this. And we heard him emphasize that during his speech, that he's been in personal contact with the leaders in the region to make sure that this deal actually gets carried through to the end. And we heard the president there give some very sobering remarks. He says he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything, but he does expect Hamas to react under pressure. He also said that he doesn't know the names of the people who are going to be released. He doesn't know the names of the Americans who are going to be released. He doesn't know their conditions, but they do have the number of hostages that are expected to be released. We also heard the president thank the leaders in the region, including of Israel, Egypt, and Qatar, for their partnership in starting this hostage release deal, and the president saying that he's committed to getting all of these hostages out. The president also discussing the need to increase critical aid getting into Gaza, critical food, fuel, water. He said that the United States is now and has been trying to create the conditions so that Hamas does not try to divert that critical food, water and energy. We have heard the president slowly over the last few weeks change his tone from simply a full throttled support of Israel to emphasizing the importance of protecting civilian lives. And just earlier we heard president, the president right there saying that he's encouraging Israel's prime minister Netanyahu to do everything he can to reduce civilian casualties, although that is something Think that's very difficult to do when he's trying when the prime minister is trying to root out Hamas which the president continues to say is a clear objective that he does support the president though shifting that rhetoric emphasizing the protection of civilian lives and aid into Gaza as the president has been under increasing pressure to do so including for members of his own party all right senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket Selena thank you we'll be right back Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us on ABC News Live. We are continuing coverage today of that hostage release in the Middle East and world leaders are reacting to the news that Hamas has now freed 24 hostages held in Gaza with President Biden saying this is just the beginning. Hamas re uh, released rather the Israeli, Thai and Filipino citizens as part of a deal with Israel. Israeli citizens are now back in their home country. The others are in Egypt waiting to head home. And Qatar is also confirming that in exchange, Israel has released some Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails in the West Bank. Then President Biden just delivered those remarks a few moments ago after that first group was released. He spoke from Nantucket, where he's on vacation for Thanksgiving, but monitoring the situation closely and talking about what happens next now that this first group is out of harm's way. 
we also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's traveling with the president in Nantucket, Massachusetts. Selena, the president came off stern and cautiously optimistic here. What was it like in the room? Well, I've been here in Nantucket where the president, he's been giving those remarks and very sobering comments from the president. He said when he was asked when the first group of Americans were going to get out, he said he doesn't know. He doesn't have the names, but he does have the number of hostages that are supposed to get out. And he also doesn't know the conditions of these hostages. But the president being very clear there that he is committed to getting all of the remaining hostages out and ensuring that they're reunited with their families. He also said that he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything, but he does trust that Hamas will react under pressure. The president also focusing his comments on his personal involvement, personal diplomacy, something that I've been hearing from senior administration officials about how involved and hands-on he has been in this negotiation process. The president thanking the leaders of Israel, Egypt, and Qatar, saying he's in close contact with them to ensure that this deal gets carried out to the end. And the president, we've seen him continue to shift his language from simply supporting Israel's right to defend itself to continue to emphasize the importance of protecting Palestinian civilians and increasing the humanitarian aid into Gaza. He said the result of this pause will allow more aid to get in critical food, medicine, water and fuel for the people in Gaza. He said that the U.S. has been and will continue to create structures to ensure that Hamas does not try to divert that energy. The president making clear, though, that this is just the start and it's been weeks of hard work, excruciating negotiations, according to senior administration officials, and the president even personally urging the emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept it. The president, in his remarks, also said that he's been urging the prime minister of Israel to do everything he can to reduce the number of civilian casualties, even as they try to pursue their goal of rooting out Hamas. Uh, Selena, he took a few questions after he made his initial address, too, and in that, he said very bluntly, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So uh, how tricky is this now? He says he's regularly in touch with Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to, to keep this agreement intact. So what goes into that now, and what more do we know about these three Americans that are supposed to be part of this deal but haven't been released yet? Well, you heard the president there saying he doesn't know when they're going to get out. They don't have names. They only have the number of hostages. But we'd heard from in recent days that U.S. officials, they are hopeful and expecting that Americans will be included in this initial hostage release, including two women and now four-year-old Abigail Moridan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. Just yesterday, the president said he was keeping his fingers crossed to ensure that she would be part of this batch of hostages that are getting out. Now, the senior administration officials say that the president, he's going to be continuing to work the phones to ensure that this deal gets carried out and that more hostages can get out. Officials have said that the way this deal is structured is that it incentivizes Hamas to continue to release hostages, which will allow a continuation of this pause in fighting. However, this is not a general ceasefire and overall end to hostilities. The U.S. has been clear that they believe that would only benefit Hamas by allowing them to regroup, but they want to take advantage of this pause. They want it to extend so that as much aid can get in as possible, that more hostages can be released, and clearly they're putting the emphasis on the need for civilian lives to be protected here, but a tall order, as the president said. All right, our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And those released Israeli hostages are now in Israel thanks to the Red Cross, who played a crucial role in this deal and transfer. Earlier, I spoke with a spokesperson from the organization about the next steps ahead for those in their care. John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me now from Geneva with more. John, you guys played such a central role in all of this. Walk me through what went into making this deal happen, and how do you feel now that this day has arrived and this first group is free again? I say the most important part about this is the relief that the families feel, and uh, the relief that the hostages feel after seven weeks in captivity. 
Uh, being separated from a family member in a situation of conflict is the most excruciating pain. The people tell us that even if they've lost their homes and, and they're short on food and water, it's really the separation. If, they're, if they if they become uh, separated from their daughter or their son or their, their, their spouse, that, that that's the deepest pain. So the good news today is the alleviation of that suffering that the families have been going through and that the hostages have been going through. So walk us through what the protocol looks like. These hostages are now released. Uh, the Israelis are back in Israel. The others are waiting to make their own way home. What happens now? Well, the important part on this step is the agreement of the parties. The, this, uh, uh, this ceasefire, first of all, and then the agreement to allow the hostages to be released and the detainees uh, held by Israel to be released. Uh, and then our role in this was to go meet Hamas. We had four land cruisers, uh, eight ICRC personnel, meeting these 24 hostages, uh, and then moving them across Gaza into safe hands to Egyptian and Israeli authorities. What's next is that, of course, this is just day one. Uh, we expect to repeat this process tomorrow to move even more hostages out of harm's way from their captors back towards their families as well as more Palestinian detainees, also to note, back to their families. So the good news here from our perspective is that we're reducing that family separation, which is the cause of the, of the greatest heartache that you see in war. Now, officials also say that this four-day pause could be extended even further if Hamas continues to release more hostages after this, I shouldn't say initial group, because I feel like today's is the initial group, but after the, these roughly 50 uh, as part of this deal. How likely do you think that is to happen, that they reach the number agreed upon in this deal and Hamas decides, you know what, we'll release some more if you continue this ceasefire? We can only hope that it happens. We can only hope that these initial steps are some sort of confidence-building measure, and it does lead to a reduction of conflict in the future, whether it's complete ceasefire or reduction. Of course, we support that because we see how much civilian suffering is caused in this urban setting, uh, this close-in fighting, all the damage and destruction that you see in Gaza, and therefore all the suffering that cascades down to the families. So no predictions on our part. We're happy to continue to play this role of neutral intermediary between the two sides, between Hamas, between Israel, uh, in order to further humanitarian goals and, and hope that that's the track that we're on right now. And, of course, many more hostages are still held captive. Uh, John, what happens next to this group that is part of this exchange deal? And, and then what happens to those who aren't? So the group that gets to go, of course, has this nightmare, the seven-week nightmare, uh, come to an end. And they begin the healing process from this experience back with their families, their friends, uh, if they have to meet with counselors or therapists, of course. Um, and now for the other group um, that won't be so fortunate to be released in this four-day operation, the International Committee of the Red Cross since day one has been insisting with direct, uh, through direct talks with Hamas that we be allowed to visit all of the hostages, check on their welfare, bring medical care if necessary, allow those hostages to be able to communicate with their families. We've had those talks directly with Hamas at the highest level. Our president met the political leader of Hamas in Qatar. Uh, so we continue to insist on that. Um, we don't have any agreements that that's going to take place, but we're still working on it. All right, John Strazio, so spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. John, thank you. I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on to share your story. Thanks for your interest. And I want to bring in ABC News contributor, former Deputy Assistary, Assistant Secretary excuse me, of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Mick, President Biden has reiterated that Hamas can't be trusted. He literally said, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So how does he work with them, with Israel, with Qatar? How does this group come together to try to keep this deal in place? That's right, Diane. So during the Cold War, we said trust but verify. This is basically just verify. Uh, the United States, obviously Israel, does not trust Hamas. There was, after all, a ceasefire on October 6th that they violated it on October 7th, obviously. Uh, so, but that still needs to uh, be in the framework that makes this work. So that's why you see so many incremental steps that is being taken out to get these hostages released, to get the detainees released, 
to get the aid in. It's all step by step because there is no trust. But it has to happen to get these hostages out. And it's going to have to happen to eventually end uh, this conflict in Gaza, this war in Gaza. So this is very important that it gets worked out now and that there is some level of trust that comes out of the end of this. So, Mick, what are you watching for in the next four days? And is there are there any particular areas of concern where you think this thing might fall apart? So, Dan, the thing that I think is most concerning is it relies on so many different factions inside Gaza to abide by the ceasefire. Hamas is about seven or eight separate cells. They don't all talk to each other. There's multiple other militia groups. And then there's, of course, just random people that have weapons. So there could be some small skirmishes. They probably know where the strong-pointed Israeli defense forces are. They could try to take, uh, you know, advantage of that. Uh, hopefully, both sides realize that that doesn't necessarily breach the agreement, that if it holds uh, that most of the fighting has stopped, that this can go forward, because it is absolutely critical to get these hostages out, and it's absolutely critical to get this humanitarian aid in. For both sakes, this should, this should happen, and I think that is why the president came out and emphasized that point today. All right, Mick Mulroy, always great to have your analysis. Mick, thank you. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Before the conflict between Israel and Hamas started, ABC News was given exclusive access when Secretary Blinken visited a training facility in Virginia used to prepare diplomats and State Department personnel for the potential hazards of overseas assignments. ABC's Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has that story. And please note, the artificial explosions and gunshots are all just part of the training demonstrations. Practice escapes. Up, oh, they see me. Ear-shattering controlled explosions. The extreme comes standard here at the State Department's training ground for diplomats and personnel preparing to head off to posts all over the globe. ABC News was granted exclusive access when Secretary of State Antony Blinken paid a visit to the massive facility tucked away in rural Blackstone, Virginia. Talking with ABC News State Department reporter Shannon Crawford. There are so many posts around the world that operate in high-risk security situations. How does the training that happens right here help support that? It makes all the difference because we're putting diplomacy at the very heart of our foreign policy. But in order to do that diplomacy, people have to be out there. Knowing that 
everyone who's going out uh, to a post anywhere around the world is getting this training to deal with any number of situations it gives me a lot of reassurance. That's perfect. The instructors here advocate a hands-on approach for everyone. I got to participate in the, the car ramming exercise. For me, it was particularly fun because in this job, I haven't been able to get behind the wheel for almost three years now. But students have only a limited time to learn potentially vital lessons, training that could be battle tested during their assignments. This year alone, volatile security situations have forced the State Department to fully evacuate one embassy. Let's get right to that dramatic rescue mission. Nearly 100 U.S. Embassy personnel were evacuated in Sudan. And partially evacuate two more. Operations in the past have also proven calamitous. The scramble to flee the Kabul embassy in 2021, a frantic dash to airlift thousands of employees and destroy sensitive documents amid the Taliban takeover. And in 2012, an attack on the American diplomatic mission in Benghazi, Libya, resulted in the death of four Americans, including U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens. Give me your money. The syllabus that Blackstone draws from some of these hard learned lessons with the final exam designed to replicate one very bad day at the office. Diplomatic security is all about making decisions that are life safety critical on the spot. Including responding to a mass casualty event and a sudden attack in the streets. Students retreat to the embassy only to be forced to flee again through thick smoke and darkness before heading off to face the challenges that await in the real world. We've gotten so much feedback at our missions around the world where something's come up and because of something that they learned here, they were able to handle uh, the situation. That's the, the biggest validation you can get. Our thanks to Martha Raditz for that report. And do stay with us for the latest on that hostage release in the Middle East, but also coming up, the major news out of South Africa, why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man when we come back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. We are learning more about the 13 Israeli hostages now free and back in Israel. The Israeli government is confirming their identities, saying they range in age from 85 years old 
to the youngest just two years old. And they're part of a larger group of 24 hostages released today. Let's go to ABC News' Patrick Rievel in Tel Aviv for us. Patrick, what do we know about these Israeli hostages specifically and also the other foreign nationals in this group of 24? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last hour or so, the IDF has said that it has now uh, has now flown um, 22 of the hostages to an air base in southern Israel. They're expected then to be flown from there to here in Tel Aviv to two hospitals where they're going to be treated and give, given a more thorough medical assessment and where they'll also meet their families for the first time. Two of the hostages, two of the Israeli hostages, were taken apparently immediately to hospital in ambulances. We don't know much more about that. We don't know a great deal about their condition right now. As you say, we do know, though, now the names of the 13 Israeli hostages who were released. Almost all of them, 12 of them, came from the same kibbutz near Roz, which was one of the worst hit kibbutzes in Hamas's October 7th attack. 77 residents were taken from there on that day and taken hostage. Um, now, obviously, 12 of them have been released. It should be said that the relatives of some of those released are still trapped there. The oldest was 85. There were four children among those released tonight, the youngest just two years old. But it is obviously very good news for their families. There's now hope that there's going to, we're going to see more of this in the coming days. We heard President Biden just a little while ago there saying that this is just the start and that he hopes dozens of hostages are going to be released in the next few days. I think it was interesting that he seemed to clearly indicate he hoped that it was going to be a longer pause than just four days and that we might see more hostages being released beyond um, that, that, beyond that four-day pause that we're in right now. All right, Patrick Rebel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, just one more quick question for you. Talk us through the ceasefire aspect of this. Are there concerns that this might not hold? I think right now there is, there is hope that it is going to hold because today, so far, thankfully, has gone smoothly. Um, we saw uh, this morning that it began at 7 a.m. There hasn't been any bombardments. Israel just this evening has said that its forces are taking up positions where they and are remaining at the lines that they, were, they already had taken. But we have seen... Uh, we have seen clashes, however, in Gaza today because thousands of Gazan civilians who were forced out from the north of Gaza, where Israel has uh, focused its ground operation, they tried to return today. The IDF said they should not because they are insisting they're going to continue the operation after this pause. And so we actually saw um, IDF soldiers there open fire on Palestinian civilians. We know that several people at least were injured. We believe two people were killed. And the concern, of course, is that if you have these clashes, if you see thousands of people trying to return and Israeli troops opening fire, if there were to be civilians severe casualties at some point that could threaten this ceasefire. But for now, the hope is that this is going to continue. I think President Biden really was signaling that he hopes at least that this is going to continue and that we are ideally going to see a longer pause than just four days. All right. Patrick Rebel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, thank you. And President Biden spoke just a few moments ago about that hostage release, saying that while this is a positive step, that this still is not over. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. And for more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president there. Selena, the president seemed to choose his words carefully here. He wanted to be optimistic, but he also was pretty blunt about things like, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So what goes into this deal now and trying to ensure that everybody keeps their word? Yeah, Diane, the president there being blunt and candid about what he knows and what he doesn't know. When he was asked about when the first Americans are going to be released, he said he does not know and that they don't know the condition of the hostages. They don't have the names, but they do have the number of hostages that are expected to be released. He also, when asked if he really thinks that this ceasefire could be extended beyond four days, he said that there is a real possibility. And in talks there, the president really emphasizing that he's staying in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal stays 
stays on track, that it doesn't go off the rails. As you say, he said he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything right, but what he does trust is Hamas to respond to pressure. And U.S. officials say that this deal is structured to incentivize Hamas to find, gather more of those hostages and release them in order to allow a longer pause in fighting. The president also emphasizing the need to protect civilian lives. He said he's been encouraging Israel's prime minister Netanyahu to try and reduce civilian casualties, which is a tall order given his goal is to try and eliminate Hamas. But the president said it's a priority. All right, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us on ABC News Live. We are continuing coverage today of that hostage release in the Middle East and world leaders are reacting to the news that Hamas has now freed 24 hostages held in Gaza with President Biden saying this is just the beginning. Hamas re uh, released rather the Israeli, Thai and Filipino citizens as part of a deal with Israel. Israeli citizens are now back in their home country. The others are in Egypt waiting to head home. And Qatar is also confirming that in exchange, Israel has released some Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails in the West Bank. Then President Biden just delivered those remarks a few moments ago after that first group was released. He spoke from Nantucket, where he's on vacation for Thanksgiving, but monitoring the situation closely and talking about what happens next now that this first group is out of harm's way. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much needed food, medicine, water and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's traveling with the president in Nantucket, Massachusetts. Selena, the president came off stern and cautiously optimistic here. What was it like in the room? 
Well, I've been here in Nantucket where the president, he's been giving those remarks and very sobering comments from the president. He said when he was asked when the first group of Americans were going to get out, he said he doesn't know. He doesn't have the names, but he does have the number of hostages that are supposed to get out. And he also doesn't know the conditions of these hostages. But the president being very clear there that he is committed to getting all of the remaining hostages out and ensuring that they're reunited with their families. He also said that he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything, but he does trust that Hamas will react under pressure. The president also focusing his comments on his personal involvement, personal diplomacy, something that I've been hearing from senior administration officials about how involved and hands-on he has been in this negotiation process. The president thanking the leaders of Israel, Egypt, and Qatar, saying he's in close contact with them to ensure that this deal gets carried out to the end. And the president, we've seen him continue to shift his language from simply supporting Israel's right to defend itself to continue to emphasize the importance of protecting Palestinian civilians and increasing the humanitarian aid into Gaza. He said the result of this pause will allow more aid to get in critical food, medicine, water and fuel for the people in Gaza. He said that the U.S. has been and will continue to create structures to ensure that Hamas does not try to divert that energy. The president making clear, though, that this is just the start and it's been weeks of hard work, excruciating negotiations, according to senior administration officials, and the president even personally urging the emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept it. The president in his remarks also said that he's been urging the prime minister of Israel to do everything he can to reduce the number of civilian casualties, even as they try to pursue their goal of rooting out Hamas. Uh, Selena, he took a few questions after he made his initial address, too, and in that, he said very bluntly, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So uh, how tricky is this now? He says he's regularly in touch with Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to, to keep this agreement intact. So what goes into that now, and what more do we know about these three Americans that are supposed to be part of this deal but haven't been released yet? Well, you heard the president there saying he doesn't know when they're going to get out. They don't have names. They only have the number of hostages. But we had heard from in recent days that U.S. officials, they are hopeful and expecting that Americans will be included in this initial hostage release, including two women and now four-year-old Abigail Moridan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. Just yesterday, the president said he was keeping his fingers crossed to ensure that she would be part of this batch of hostages that are getting out. Now, the senior administration officials say that the president, he's going to be continuing to work the phones to ensure that this deal gets carried out and that more hostages can get out. Officials have said that the way this deal is structured is that it incentivizes Hamas to continue to release hostages, which will allow the continuation of this pause in fighting. However, this is not a general ceasefire and overall end to hostilities. The U.S. has been clear that they believe that would only benefit Hamas by allowing them to regroup, but they want to take advantage of this pause. They want it to extend so that as much aid can get in as possible, that more hostages can be released. And clearly, they're putting the emphasis on the need for civilian lives to be protected here, but a tall order, as the president said. All right, our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And those released Israeli hostages are now in Israel thanks to the Red Cross, who played a crucial role in this deal and transfer. Earlier, I spoke with a spokesperson from the organization about the next steps ahead for those in their care. John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me now from Geneva with more. John, you guys played such a central role in all of this. Walk me through what went into making this deal happen, and how do you feel now that this day has arrived and this first group is free again? I say the most important part about this is the relief that the families feel, and uh, the relief that the hostages feel after seven weeks in captivity. Uh, being separated from a family member in a situation of conflict is the most excruciating pain. Uh, people tell us that even if they've lost their homes and, and they're short on food and water, it's really the separation. If, they're, if they've, they become uh, separated from their daughter or their son or their, their, their spouse, that, that, that's the deepest pain. So the good news today is the alleviation of that suffering that the families have been going through and that the hostages have been going through. So walk us through what the protocol looks like. These hostages are now released. Uh, the Israelis are back in Israel. The others are waiting to make their own way home. What happens now? Well, the important part on this step is the agreement of the parties. The, this uh, 
this ceasefire, first of all, and then the agreement to allow the hostages to be released and the detainees uh, held by Israel to be released. Uh, and then our role in this was to go meet Hamas. We had four land cruisers, uh, eight ICRC personnel, meeting these 24 hostages uh, and then moving them across Gaza into safe hands to Egyptian and Israeli authorities. What's next is that, of course, this is just day one. Uh, we expect to repeat this process tomorrow to move even more hostages out of harm's way from their captors back towards their families, as well as more Palestinian detainees also to note back to their families. So the good news here from our perspective is that we're reducing that family separation, which is the cause of the, of the greatest heartache that you see in war. Now, officials also say that this four-day pause could be extended even further if Hamas continues to release more hostages after this, I shouldn't say initial group because I feel like today's is the initial group, but after the, these roughly 50 uh, as part of this deal. How likely do you think that is to happen, that they reach the number agreed upon in this deal and Hamas decides, you know what, we'll release some more if you continue this ceasefire? We can only hope that it happens. We can only hope that these initial steps are some sort of confidence building measure, and it does lead to a reduction of conflict in the future, whether it's complete ceasefire or reduction. Of course, we support that because we see how much civilian suffering is caused in this urban setting, uh, this close-in fighting, all the damage and destruction that you see in Gaza, and therefore all the suffering that cascades down to the families. So no predictions on our part. We're happy to continue to play this role of neutral intermediary between the two sides, between Hamas, between Israel, uh, in order to further humanitarian goals and, and hope that that's the track that we're on right now. And of course, many more hostages are still held captive. Uh, John, what happens next to this group that is part of this exchange deal? And then what happens to those who aren't? So the group that gets to go, of course, has this nightmare, the seven-week nightmare, uh, come to an end, and they begin the healing process from this experience back with their families, their friends, uh, if they have to meet with counselors or therapists, of course. Um, and now for the other group um, that won't be so fortunate to be released in this four-day operation, the International Committee of the Red Cross since day one has been insisting with direct uh, through direct talks with Hamas that we'd be allowed to visit all of the hostages, check on their welfare, bring medical care if necessary, allow those hostages to be able to communicate with their families. We've had those talks directly with Hamas at the highest level. Our president met the political leader of Hamas in Qatar. Uh, so we continue to insist on that. Um, we don't have any agreements that that's going to take place, but we're still working on it. All right, John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. John, thank you. I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on to share your story. Thanks for your interest. And I want to bring in ABC News contributor, former Deputy Assistary, Assistant Secretary excuse me, of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Mick, President Biden has reiterated that Hamas can't be trusted. He literally said, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So how does he work with them with israel with Qatar? how does this group come together to try to keep this deal in place that's right diane so during the cold war we said trust but verify this is basically just verify uh the united states obviously israel does not trust hamas there was after all a ceasefire on october 6 that they violated it on october 7 obviously uh so but that still needs to uh E in the framework that makes this work. So that's why you see so many incremental steps that is being taken out to get these hostages released, to get the detainees released, to get the aid in. It's all step by step because there is no trust. But it has to happen to get these hostages out. And it's going to have to happen to eventually end uh, this conflict in Gaza, this war in Gaza. So this is very important that it gets worked out now and that there is some level of trust that comes out of the end of this. So, Mick, what are you watching for in the next four days? And is there are there any particular areas of concern where you think this thing might fall apart? So, Dan, the thing that I think is most concerning is it relies on so many different factions inside Gaza to abide by the ceasefire. 
Hamas is about seven or eight separate cells. They don't all talk to each other. There's multiple other militia groups. And then there's, of course, just random people that have weapons. So there could be some small skirmishes. They probably know where the strong-pointed Israeli defense forces are. They could try to take uh, you know, advantage of that. Uh, hopefully, both sides realize that that doesn't necessarily breach the agreement, that if it holds uh, that most of the fighting has stopped, that this can go forward, because it is absolutely critical to get these hostages out, and it's absolutely critical to get this humanitarian aid in. For both sakes, this should, this should happen, and I think that is why the president came out and emphasized that point today. All right, Mick Mulroy, always great to have your analysis. Mick, thank you. We'll be right back. Ready, America? Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Before the conflict between Israel and Hamas started, ABC News was given exclusive access when Secretary Blinken visited a training facility in Virginia used to prepare diplomats and State Department personnel for the potential hazards of overseas assignments. ABC's Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has that story. And please note, the artificial explosions and gunshots are all just part of the training demonstrations. Practice escapes. Up, oh, they see me. Ear-shattering controlled explosions. The extreme comes standard here at the State Department's training ground for diplomats and personnel preparing to head off to posts all over the globe. ABC News was granted exclusive access when Secretary of State Antony Blinken paid a visit to the massive facility tucked away in rural Blackstone, Virginia. Talking with ABC News State Department reporter Shannon Crawford. There are so many posts around the world that operate in high-risk security situations. How does the training that happens right here help support that? It makes all the difference because we're putting diplomacy at the very heart of our foreign policy. But in order to do that diplomacy, people have to be out there. Knowing that everyone who's going out uh, to a post anywhere around the world is getting this training, to deal with any number of situations it gives me a lot of reassurance. That's perfect. President. The instructors here advocate a hands-on approach for everyone. I got to participate in the, the car ramming exercise. For me, it was particularly fun because in this job, I haven't been able to get behind the wheel for almost three years now. But students have only a limited time to learn potentially vital lessons, training that could be battle-tested during their assignments. This year alone, volatile security situations have forced the State Department to fully evacuate one embassy. Let's get right to that dramatic rescue mission. Nearly 100 U.S. Embassy personnel were evacuated in Sudan. And partially evacuate two more. Operations in the past have also proven calamitous. The scramble to flee the Kabul embassy in 2021, a frantic dash to airlift thousands of employees and destroy sensitive documents amid the Taliban takeover. And in 2012, an attack on the American diplomatic mission in Benghazi, Libya, resulted in the death of four Americans, including U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens. Give me 
your money. The syllabus at Blackstone draws from some of these hard-learned lessons with the final exam designed to replicate one very bad day at the office. Livermax Security is all about making decisions that are life safety critical on the spot. Including responding to a mass casualty event and a sudden attack in the streets. Students retreat to the embassy, only to be forced to flee again through thick smoke and darkness before heading off to face the challenges that await in the real world. We've gotten so much feedback at our missions around the world where something's come up, and because of something that they learned here, they were able to handle uh, the situation. That's the, the biggest validation you can get. Our thanks to Martha Raditz for that report. And do stay with us for the latest on that hostage release in the Middle East, but also coming up, the major news out of South Africa. Why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcast. I'm Wade Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We're following the latest developments on the first group of hostages released from Gaza as part of a deal between Israel and Hamas. In Israel, some are celebrating in the streets after many families of those taken have been fighting for weeks to bring them home, some even accusing the government of not prioritizing the hostages' safe return. But despite today's events, the wound is still all too real, especially for those in a kibbutz hit hardest on October 7th. Our Ian panel gained some unrestricted access. They're retracing the horror that went on that day that would ultimately change this community, the country, and even the world. May 2023, the Shavuot festival in kibbutz near Oz, an idyllic place of peace and plenty. An annual celebration of the harvest and a formal welcome to the newest members of this rural community. A time to come together to give thanks, to play, laugh and sing. A home movie haunting in its happiness. Niroz before October 7th was paradise. I was born in Niroz. I lived there all my life. My kids love the place. He puts it, it's like, you know, lovely community. That, um, very peaceful, beautiful place like you can see. You feel like you belonging to someone, to something. And this is Kibbutz Niroz today, six months since that Shavuot festival, a community torn asunder, burnt, broken, and bleeding. This is the story of what happened on Black Saturday, October the 7th. With unprecedented access to hours of security camera footage, Hamas videos, and eyewitness testimony. It's the story of an unspeakable few hours of horror that would change a community, a country, 
and a region forever and unleash a war that's brought death and destruction to so many thousands. Six thirty a.m. Saturday, the seventh of October. Air raid sirens break the early morning calm across Israel. For the residents of Neroz, it seemed another routine alert. So our morning starts at six thirty with the alarm, jumping, jumping from the bed, running to the safe room. Then we got the alarm of uh, the information that the terrorist in the kibbutz. After an hour or so. Um, there was a report in the community um, group of messages that there are uh, terrorists inside the kibbutz, and we started sounding, um, hearing um, fire, gunshots, and, uh, and, and then all hell breaks loose. Niroz lies less than a mile and a half from Gaza. And within minutes, the militants of Hamas overrun Israeli army border posts and were at the gates to the kibbutz. They know what they do. They plan it in advance. They know exactly where to go, which house to go. The kibbutz emergency response team tried to fight off the attack bravely, but didn't stand a chance. They were among the first to die. Hamas fighters stormed in from four points. And astonishingly, Palestinian reporter Motna al-Najjar crossed with the terrorists from Gaza, live streaming as the attack unfolded. Declaring at one point, I'm inside the settlement. The entire settlement has been seized. His video shows the gunman moving methodically and ruthlessly through the kibbutz, using guns, hammers, and drills to break into the homes of terrified residents locked inside. <laughs> Crying Alu Akbar, God is great, as they led an hours-long bloodthirsty rampage, setting fire to homes, some with families inside, burning vehicles as marauding civilians joined the invasion, plundering and pillaging. Hamas came here to kill, destroy, and to take hostages they could use as bargaining chips. The families of the kibbutz have agreed for us to show this video. The first hostage you see is 11-year-old Erez Calderon. The reporter urges the gunman to take care of the boy, to keep him unharmed. Shiri Bibas Silverman, clutching onto her two sons, four-year-old Ariel and 10-month-old Kfir. That's my house. Terrorists tried to enter to the house, fight with me on the door, even that it was tight, I was holding it. Most of the houses in Neroz have safe rooms, but they're not designed to lock from the inside. I was hoping that nobody will shoot me through the door. So you're literally hanging on? Yeah. For dear life? Yeah, like this. We keep hearing the same story again and again. The attackers trying to force their way into people's homes and people trying to resist. This house, you can see all the bullet holes outside as they try to literally shoot their way in. Just come inside, mind the step and there's broken glass. You can see where the bullets came through. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And tragically, you can see the blood where the people who lived here died. In the house opposite, retired teacher Chaim Perry and his wife Osnat knew they were in trouble. Unable to hold the door closed, Chaim had to make a decision. It's hard to imagine how much terror there must have been in homes like this on Kibbutz near Oz. An elderly couple hunkered down, the terrorists at the door trying to get in. They held them off once, but they realised they were going to come back. So 80-year-old Chaim Perry, to save his 71-year-old wife, went out that door to surrender, hoping that the militants wouldn't come back. Hamas spurishly claims this was a military operation, but their victims at Neroz, like so many places, were all civilians. Not just kibbutz residents, but also farm laborers from Thailand and elsewhere. They lived in their own quarters on the edge of the kibbutz, not party to any conflict or dispute, not soldiers, not Israelis, not Jews. But still, they were also rounded up, beaten, kidnapped, and butchered. So they went from 
every door shoot took them out and it looked like in the end they collect all of them together to this room put all of them together here yeah going it's it's unbelievable going It literally is a bloodbath. So people who come from Thailand to earn a living, to try and find a better life, rounded up, put in this room and slaughtered. The rampage at Kibbutz Niroz lasted six hours. By the time soldiers from the Israeli border guard arrived, it was too late. The gunmen, the looters, the hostages were long gone. On the morning of October 7th, there were 400 men, women and children living in Neroz. By the afternoon, over a quarter of all the residents were gone. 39 people were murdered here, 74 were kidnapped, the largest single group of hostages taken in Israel that day. <laughs> and for the survivors, for the relatives, there's guilt fear and unending pain. Oh, God, where are you? Hadass Calderon's mother and niece were killed in the attack. There is nothing left. It's all dark. And her two children, 16-year-old Saha and 12-year-old Erez, seen in the reporter's video, were kidnapped. She counts the days, the hours, unable to properly eat or sleep. What about my children? Who take care of them now? Who we'll take care of them if they're sick, if they heal, if, if they have, you know, and they need medicine. There is a lot of uh, disease now in Aza. It's, uh, it's frightening. Many Niroz residents were lifelong peace activists. Chaim Perry volunteered with an NGO, bringing sick Palestinians from the Gaza border to hospitals in Israel for treatment. Ever since he, he finished being a soldier, he became a strongly uh, a, a strong peace activist because he said, I've been there and I know what I'm fighting for now. And it's very clear for me, very, very clear that uh, peace is the only way. Many believe the Israeli government must share some of the blame and that their strategy in Gaza is the wrong one. They feel betrayed and uh, as it's their right to feel this way, I now urge the government, you've betrayed the citizens. First thing, make it right. Release the hostages. Do whatever needed. Afterwards, when you finish this, thrive towards a, a long-term solution. That's it. That's, that's the only thing, the way I can see. And in Elat, where most of the families from Neros were evacuated to, there's pain in recuperation and terrible sadness, anger. They took not only life from the dead, they took life from the living. They took away their lives. Amid all the talk of negotiations to release hostages, the families now wait in agonizing limbo. Sometimes Hadass Calderon talks to her missing children. If I talk to them now, yes. I tell them that I fight for them. I'm going to bring them home, back soon. They're going, going to come back, and their father going to come back and we're all waiting for them and miss them, miss them, miss them so much. I miss their laugh, I, I miss to laugh with them, I miss to, to kiss them, to hug them. Obviously your heart is here in the kibbutz, your friends, your loved ones, and you've gone through so much. Can kibbutz near Oz be the same ever again? No, yeah, it will never be the same, no, no doubt. But Kibbutz Neroz will be again. It will be different. Somehow I don't know, but definitely Neroz will be here. All right, Ian Panel, thanks for that. And we have much more continuing coverage on that initial release of hostages as part of this breakthrough deal between Israel and Hamas. More coming up right after the break. Stay with us.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us on ABC News Live. We are continuing coverage today of that hostage release in the Middle East and world leaders are reacting to the news that Hamas has now freed 24 hostages held in Gaza with President Biden saying this is just the beginning. Hamas re uh, released rather the Israeli, Thai and Filipino citizens as part of a deal with Israel. Israeli citizens are now back in their home country. The others are in Egypt waiting to head home. And Qatar is also confirming that in exchange, Israel has released some Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails in the West Bank. Then President Biden just delivered those remarks a few moments ago after that first group was released. He spoke from Nantucket, where he's on vacation for Thanksgiving, but monitoring the situation closely and talking about what happens next now that this first group is out of harm's way. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. For more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who's traveling with the president in Nantucket, Massachusetts. Selena, the president came off stern and cautiously optimistic here. What was it like in the room? Well, I've been here in Nantucket where the president, he's been giving those remarks and very sobering comments from the president. He said when he was asked when the first group of Americans were going to get out, he said he doesn't know. He doesn't have the names, but he does have the number of hostages that are supposed to get out. And he also doesn't know the conditions of these hostages. But the president being very clear there that he is committed to getting all of the remaining hostages out and ensuring that they're reunited with their families. He also said that he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything, but he does trust that Hamas will react under pressure. The president also focusing his comments on his personal involvement, personal diplomacy, something that I've been hearing from senior administration officials about how involved and hands-on he has been in this negotiation process. The president thanking the leaders of Israel, Egypt, and Qatar, saying he's in close contact with them to ensure that this deal gets carried out to the end. And the president, we've seen him continue to shift his language from simply supporting Israel's right to defend itself to continue to emphasize the importance of protecting Palestinian civilians and increasing the humanitarian aid into Gaza. He said the result of this pause will allow more aid to get in, critical food, medicine, water, and fuel for the people in Gaza. He said that the U.S. has been and will continue to create structures to ensure that Hamas does not try to divert that energy. The president making clear, though, that this is just the start, and it's been weeks of hard work, excruciating negotiations, according to senior administration officials, and the president even personally urging the emir of Qatar to press Hamas to accept this deal and for Israel's prime minister to accept it. The president, in his remarks, also said that he's been urging the Prime Minister of Israel to do everything he can to reduce the number of civilian casualties, even as they try to pursue their goal of rooting out Hamas. Uh, Selena, he took a few questions after he made his initial address, too, and in that, he said very bluntly, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So uh, how tricky is this now? He says he's regularly in touch with Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to, to keep this agreement intact. So what goes into that now, and what more do we know about these three Americans that are supposed to be part of this deal but haven't been released yet? 
Well, you heard the president there saying he doesn't know when they're going to get out. They don't have names. They only have the number of hostages. But we had heard from in recent days that U.S. officials, they are hopeful and expecting that Americans will be included in this initial hostage release, including two women and now four-year-old Abigail Moridan, whose parents were killed by Hamas. Just yesterday, the president said he was keeping his fingers crossed to ensure that she would be part of this batch of hostages that are getting out. Now, the senior administration officials say that the president, he's going to be continuing to work the phones to ensure that this deal gets carried out and that more hostages can get out. Officials have said that the way this deal is structured is that it incentivizes Hamas to continue to release hostages, which will allow the continuation of this pause in fighting. However, this is not a general ceasefire and overall end to hostilities. The U.S. has been clear that they believe that would only benefit Hamas by allowing them to regroup, but they want to take advantage of this pause. They want it to extend so that as much aid can get in as possible, that more hostages can be released. And clearly, they're putting the emphasis on the need for civilian lives to be protected here, but a tall order, as the president said. All right, our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And those released Israeli hostages are now in Israel thanks to the Red Cross, who played a crucial role in this deal and transfer. Earlier, I spoke with a spokesperson from the organization about the next steps ahead for those in their care. John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me now from Geneva with more. John, you guys played such a central role in all of this. Walk me through what went into making this deal happen, and how do you feel now that this day has arrived and this first group is free again? I say the most important part about this is the relief that the families feel, and the relief that the hostages feel after seven weeks in captivity. Uh, being separated from a family member in a situation of conflict is the most excruciating pain. Uh, people tell us that even if they've lost their homes and, and they're short on food and water, it's really the separation if they're if they they become uh, separated from their daughter or their son or their 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 spouse that, that that's the deepest pain. So the good news today is the alleviation of that suffering that the families have been going through and that the hostages have been going through. So walk us through what the protocol looks like. These hostages are now released. Uh, the Israelis are back in Israel. The others are waiting to make their own way home. What happens now? Well, the important part on this step is the agreement of the parties. The, this, uh, uh, this ceasefire, first of all, and then the agreement to allow the hostages to be released and the detainees uh, held by Israel to be released. Uh, and then our role in this was to go meet Hamas. We had four land cruisers, uh, eight ICRC personnel, meeting these 24 hostages uh, and then moving them across Gaza into safe hands to Egyptian and Israeli authorities. What's next is that, of course, this is just day one. Uh, we expect to repeat this process tomorrow to move even more hostages out of harm's way from their captors back towards their families as well as more Palestinian detainees, also to note, back to their families. So the good news here from our perspective is that we're reducing that family separation, which is the cause of the, of the greatest heartache that you see in war. Now, officials also say that this four-day pause could be extended even further if Hamas continues to release more hostages after this, I shouldn't say initial group, because I feel like today's is the initial group, but after the, these roughly 50 uh, as part of this deal. How likely do you think that is to happen, that they reach the number agreed upon in this deal and Hamas decides, you know what, we'll release some more if you continue this ceasefire? We can only hope that it happens. We can only hope that these initial steps are some sort of confidence-building measure, and it does lead to a reduction of conflict in the future, whether it's complete ceasefire or reduction. Of course, we support that because we see how much civilian suffering is caused in this urban setting, uh, this close-in fighting, all the damage and destruction that you see in Gaza, and therefore all the suffering that cascades down to the families. So no predictions on our part. We're happy to continue to play this role of neutral intermediary between the two sides, between Hamas, between Israel, uh, in order to further humanitarian goals and, and hope that that's the track that we're on right now. And, of course, many more hostages are still held captive. Uh, John, what happens next to this group that is part of this exchange deal? And then what happens to those who aren't? 
So the group that gets the go, of course, has this nightmare, the seven week nightmare uh, come to an end and they begin the healing process from this experience back with their families, their friends, uh, if they have to meet with counselors or therapists, of course. Um, and now for the other group um, that won't be so fortunate to be released in this four day operation, the International Community of the Red Cross since day one has been insisting with direct uh, through direct talks with Hamas that we'd be allowed to visit all of the hostages, check on their welfare, bring medical care if necessary, allow those hostages to be able to communicate with their families. We've had those talks directly with Hamas at the highest level. Our president met the political leader of Hamas in Qatar. Uh, so we continue to insist on that. Um, we don't have any agreements that that's going to take place, but we're still working on it. All right, John Strazio, so spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. John, thank you. I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on to share your story. Thanks for your interest. And I want to bring in ABC News contributor, former Deputy Assistary, Assistant Secretary excuse me, of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Mick, President Biden has reiterated that Hamas can't be trusted. He literally said, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So how does he work with them, with Israel, with Qatar? How does this group come together to try to keep this deal in place? That's right, Diane. So during the Cold War, we said trust but verify. This is basically just verify. Uh, the United States, obviously Israel, does not trust Hamas. There was, after all, a ceasefire on October 6th, but they violated it on October 7th, obviously. Uh, so, But that still needs to... Uh, E in the framework that makes this work. So that's why you see so many incremental steps that is being taken out to get these hostages released, to get the detainees released, to get the aid in. It's all step by step because there is no trust. But it has to happen to get these hostages out. And it's going to have to happen to eventually end uh, this conflict in Gaza, this war in Gaza. So this is very important that it gets worked out now and that there is some level of trust that comes out of the end of this. So, Mick, what are you watching for in the next four days? And is there are there any particular areas of concern where you think this thing might fall apart? So, Dan, the thing that I think is most concerning is it relies on so many different factions inside Gaza to abide by the ceasefire. Hamas is about seven or eight separate cells. They don't all talk to each other. There's multiple other militia groups. And then there's, of course, just random people that have weapons. So there could be some small skirmishes. They probably know where the strong-pointed Israeli defense forces are. They could try to take uh, you know, advantage of that. Uh, hopefully, both sides realize that that doesn't necessarily breach the agreement, that if it holds uh, that most of the fighting has stopped, that this can go forward, because it is absolutely critical to get these hostages out, and it's absolutely critical to get this humanitarian aid in. For both sakes, this should, this should happen, and I think that is why the president came out and emphasized that point today. All right, Mick Mulroy, always great to have your analysis. Mick, thank you. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the scene of a massive earthquake along the Turkey-Syria border, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Before the conflict between Israel and Hamas started, ABC News was given exclusive access when Secretary Blinken visited a training facility in Virginia used to prepare diplomats and State Department personnel for the potential hazards of overseas assignments. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has that story. And please note, the artificial explosions and gunshots are all just part of the training demonstrations. Oh 
Practice escapes. Up, oh, they see me. Ear shattering controlled explosions. The extreme comes standard here at the State Department's training ground for diplomats and personnel preparing to head off to posts all over the globe. ABC News was granted exclusive access when Secretary of State Antony Blinken paid a visit to the massive facility tucked away in rural Blackstone, Virginia. Talking with ABC News State Department reporter Shannon Crawford. There are so many posts around the world that operate in high-risk security situations. How does the training that happens right here help support that? It makes all the difference because we're putting diplomacy at the very heart of our foreign policy. But in order to do that diplomacy, people have to be out there. Knowing that everyone who's going out uh, to a post anywhere around the world is getting this training to deal with any number of situations it gives me a lot of reassurance. That's perfect. The instructors here advocate a hands-on approach for everyone. I got to participate in the, the car ramming exercise. For me, it was particularly fun because in this job, I haven't been able to get behind the wheel for almost three years now. But students have only a limited time to learn potentially vital lessons, training that could be battle-tested during their assignments. This year alone, volatile security situations have forced the State Department to fully evacuate one embassy. Let's get right to that dramatic rescue mission. Nearly 100 U.S. Embassy personnel were evacuated in Sudan. And partially evacuate two more. Operations in the past have also proven calamitous. The scramble to flee the Kabul embassy in 2021, a frantic dash to airlift thousands of employees and destroy sensitive documents amid the Taliban takeover. And in 2012, an attack on the American diplomatic mission in Benghazi, Libya, resulted in the death of four Americans, including U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens. Give me your money. The syllabus at Blackstone draws from some of these hard learned lessons with the final exam designed to replicate one very bad day at the office. Diplomatic security is all about making decisions that are life safety critical on the spot. Including responding to a mass casualty event and a sudden attack in the streets. Students retreat to the embassy only to be forced to flee again through thick smoke and darkness before heading off to face the challenges that await in the real world. We've gotten so much feedback at our missions around the world where something's come up and because of something that they learned here, they were able to handle uh, the situation. That's the, the biggest validation you can get. Our thanks to Martha Raditz for that report. And do stay with us for the latest on that hostage release in the Middle East. But also coming up, the major news out of South Africa. Why convicted killer Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcast. Hit me with them good vibes, bitches on my phone lives. Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine. Dance a more, just a little bit. Breathe a more, just a little bit. Smile a little more, and I'm in a way. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. You're
watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. We are learning more about the 13 Israeli hostages now free and back in Israel. The Israeli government is confirming their identities, saying they range in age from 85 years old to the youngest, just two years old. And they're part of a larger group of 24 hostages released today. Let's go to ABC News' Patrick Rievel in Tel Aviv for us. Patrick, what do we know about these Israeli hostages specifically and also the other foreign nationals in this group of 24? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last hour or so, the IDF has said that it has now, uh, has now flown um, 22 of the hostages to an air base in southern Israel. They're expected then to be flown from there to here in Tel Aviv to two hospitals where they're going to be treated and given, given a more thorough medical assessment and where they'll also meet their families for the first time. Two of the hostages, two of the Israeli hostages, were taken apparently immediately to hospital in ambulances. We don't know much more about that. We don't know a great deal about their condition right now. As you say, we do know, though, now the names of the 13 Israeli hostages who were released. Almost all of them, 12 of them, came from the same kibbutz, near Roz, which was one of the worst hit kibbutzes in Hamas's October 7th attack. 77 residents were taken from there on that day and taken hostage. Um, now, obviously, 12 of them have been released. It should be said that the relatives of some of those released are still trapped there. The oldest was 85. There were four children among those released tonight, the youngest just two years old. But it is obviously very good news for their families. There's now hope that there's going to, we're going to see more of this in the coming days. We heard President Biden just a little while ago there saying that this is just the start and that he hopes dozens of hostages are going to be released in the next few days. I think it was interesting that he seemed to clearly indicate he hoped that it was going to be a longer pause than just four days and that we might see more hostages being released beyond um, that, that, beyond that four-day pause that we're in right now. All right, Patrick Rebel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, just one more quick question for you. Talk us through the ceasefire aspect of this. Are there concerns that this might not hold? I think right now there is, there is hope that it is going to hold because today, so far, thankfully, has gone smoothly. Um, we saw uh, this morning that it began at 7 a.m. There hasn't been any bombardments. Israel just this evening has said that its forces are taking up positions where they and are remaining at the lines that they, were, they already had taken. But we have seen... Uh, we have seen clashes, however, in Gaza today because thousands of Gazan civilians who were forced out from the north of Gaza, where Israel has uh, focused its ground operation, they tried to return today. The IDF said they should not because they are insisting they're going to continue the operation after this pause. And so we actually saw um, IDF soldiers there open fire on Palestinian civilians. We know that several people at least were injured. We believe two people were killed. And the concern, of course, is that if you have these clashes, if you see thousands of people trying to return and Israeli troops opening fire, if there were to be civilians severe casualties at some point that could threaten the ceasefire. But for now, the hope is that this is going to continue. I think President Biden really was signaling that he hopes at least that this is going to continue and that we are ideally going to see a longer pause than just four days. All right. Patrick Rievel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, thank you. And President Biden spoke just a few moments ago about that hostage release, saying that while this is a positive step, that this still is not over. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. And for more, let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president there. Selena, the president seemed to choose his words carefully here. He wanted to be optimistic, but he also was pretty blunt about things like, I don't trust Hamas to do anything. So what goes into this deal now and trying to ensure that everybody keeps their word? Yeah, Diane, the president there being blunt and candid about what he knows and what he doesn't know. When he was asked about when the first Americans are going to be released, he said he does not know and that they don't know the condition of the hostages. They don't have the names, but they do have the number of hostages that are expected to be released. He also, when asked if he really thinks that this ceasefire could be extended beyond four days, he said that there is a real possibility. And in talks there, the president really emphasizing that he's staying in close contact with regional leaders to ensure that this deal stays 
stays on track, that it doesn't go off the rails. As you say, he said he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything right. But what he does trust is Hamas to respond to pressure. And U.S. officials say that this deal is structured to incentivize Hamas to find, gather more of those hostages and release them in order to allow a longer pause in fighting. The president also emphasizing the need to protect civilian lives. He said he's been encouraging Israel's prime minister Netanyahu to try and reduce civilian casualties, which is a tall order given his goal is to try and eliminate Hamas. But the president said it's a priority. All right, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Martha Raddatz in Lviv, Ukraine. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin with the latest on the release of 24 hostages being held in Gaza. 13 Israeli citizens ranging in age from 85 years old to the youngest just two years old are now in Israel. The other 11 foreign nationals are now in Egypt waiting to make their way home. In exchange, Israel has released more than two dozen Palestinian prisoners. It's the first in a series of expected hostage and prisoner exchanges amid a temporary ceasefire over the next four days. President Biden is calling the development something to be thankful for, but also emphasizing this is just the first step with many hostages still being held captive. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang is in Nantucket, Massachusetts, traveling with the president. Uh, Selena, President Biden sounded cautiously optimistic here. How significant is this initial release? And what are the main areas of concern when it comes to ensuring both sides carry out the rest of this deal? 
Well, Diane, even this first day of the pause is a major diplomatic breakthrough, but the president there very sober in his remarks that there is a lack of trust here, that he doesn't trust Hamas to do anything right, but he does expect Hamas to react under pressure. So U.S. officials here have been clear that this deal is structured to incentivize Hamas to keep its side of the bargain and potentially to even allow this pause to go for longer if Hamas is able to produce and to collect and release more of those hostages. The president being clear there that he's staying in touch with regional contacts, regional leaders in order to ensure that this deal gets carried through to the end. The president there also emphasizing the need to search humanitarian aid, 200 trucks getting to the border just today, but saying that is not enough. The president there also saying that he doesn't know when the first Americans are going to be released, but that he is hopeful that it will happen in the coming days, that it will happen soon. But the U.S. doesn't know the names of the hostages, the Americans. They just have the number of hostages that are expected to be released, but they also don't know the condition of these hostages. So still here, a lot of questions in a very fragile and tenuous deal that U.S. officials are worried could break down, but still the fact that day one was positive is a positive sign for the coming days that this deal could be upheld. Now, there was an interesting moment when the president was asked about placing conditions on aid to Israel. What did you make of his response? Well, the president was very careful in his response. He basically said, well, look, that's an interesting idea, but if I had agreed to that, then we wouldn't be where we are. The president is trying to toe this very careful line. He's facing increasing pressure with, from within his own party, especially from the more progressive Democrats, to do more to call for restraint from Israel, to have conditions on the aid that the U.S. sends to Israel. The U.S., however, has continually pushed back with officials saying that Israel has a right to defend itself, that it has a legitimate right to try and eliminate Hamas. We heard the president again reiterate that today in his speech, but he did couch that with saying Israel, and he's been encouraging the prime minister to try and reduce civilian casualties as he attempts to root out Hamas. But that rhetoric from the president, it has changed significantly in the last few weeks. He started out by giving that full throttled support to Israel and its right to defend itself. And now we've heard more and more from the president, from his top, from his top aides, from U.S. officials, banging that drumbeat that civilian lives must be protected but still many within his party say it is not enough but the president there diane being very careful in his choice of words yeah he also made clear that this is just the first step uh, part of this four-day deal but on the other hand he did take this long-term view talking about the importance of a two-state solution for israelis and palestinians to be able to ultimately live in peace side by side so what does that tell you? If this four-day ceasefire holds and this whole deal runs smoothly, could it pave the way for a longer-term deal down the road? Well, the hope that is that it will lower tensions, it will lower some of the temperature here, and that it will allow more aid to get in. But Israel has been clear that they will resume the fighting after this pause and if they don't get more hostages out. But we know that President Biden, top officials, they have been reiterating to Israel that they want to see restraint, they want to see civilian lives protected, they do not want public opinion to turn against Israel. And from the early days, the president told the prime minister, do not be consumed by rage. That being said, to your point, the president still giving Israel the right to defend itself. But we have seen more calls from President Biden and from his top aides about this two-state solution, about how there needs to be an end to this cycle of violence, that we cannot return to the status quo before October 7th. However, the U.S. has said that ultimately they want to see the Palestinian Authority, a revitalized one, govern Gaza. But there's a lot of skepticism with that idea, given that to many Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority is seen as weak and out of touch. The president making clear in his previous statements that this may seem far out, but they need to be looking ahead at the future. They need to be looking at how to stop this cycle. All right, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Nantucket. Selena, thank you. And with the first group of hostages now free, focus is shifting to what comes next. Dozens of hostages are still waiting to be released as part of this deal, and many more have no idea if and when they could be free. ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy is here with more on that. Mick, how crucial are the next steps over the next four days? And what goes into keeping everyone to their word now that this deal has started going into effect? So, Diane, the next few days are very crucial. Obviously, for getting the hostages out, but building the trust between the two parties to this agreement is also crucial because as the president stated, there is really no trust. 
Uh, but now they're going to see these incremental steps. And that's why it's so uh, orchestrated to have these groups do what they're doing right now, to move them to a certain point, to have the other group move, and another, and another. And that is going to start building the confidence from the Israeli side, especially, uh, to continue with the truth, to continue with the humanitarian aid uh, coming into large numbers to include fuel. That is going to be really important, not just for the hostages, but also if there's ever a chance to have a real ceasefire uh, down the road where we could start moving into talking about a two-state solution in the political process. This could lead to that because this mechanism might be one of the ways uh, that could be used to do that. Now, officials have said these ceasefire deals, that, that they, they could go beyond just this four days if Hamas decides to release more hostages after the initial deal terms are met. How likely do you think that is at this point? And what are the incentives there? So Hamas is likely using this truce, and that is why they've been so specific about not wanting the surveillance drones flown by the IDF during certain times, that they're likely doing it to try to get some kind of military advantage. So they're moving their command and control, they're moving their troops to probably get in a better position uh, as a, you know, compared to the IDF, and they're also probably moving the hostages they intend to keep long term. So if they find an advantage uh, to keep doing this, to have more days to do just that, and, of course, to bring in humanitarian aid, then they might do it. I think the IDF fully knew that they were giving away this tactical advantage to get their hostages out, and they were fully accepting of that. But I do think, from Hamas's side, that is that is a lot of why they are doing this agreement right now. Uh, Israel is also uh, agreeing to let humanitarian aid, including, including fuel, into Gaza. U.S. officials also say they're trying to take advantage of this pause in the fighting to get more aid in. How big of an impact could that have? It could have a huge impact because it is, it is woefully low on supplies in Gaza. Around 400 trucks a day came in prior to October 7th. Uh, there's been nowhere near that amount coming in. Even today, with this agreement, only 200 trucks came in. So there needs to be an, a really big plus up to be able to feed all the people in Gaza. After all, there's 2 million plus people in Gaza, only 40,000 of them are boss. So they have to be able to get food in. USAID has really increased their presence there. It's, it's obvious the United States is trying to do everything they can. They might have to uh, organize a new pathway, potentially a maritime pathway, because of the damaged infrastructure in Gaza right now, makes distribution of food and fuel very difficult. But I think the international community is going to come together and try to catch up to where they need to be to sustain life uh, in the way, in the fashion it should be in Gaza right now. So, Mick, what happens next? So, I, I think if we get to the end of this truce and uh, and the, the 50 hostages come out and there's no extension, it's important to note that this is a truce. So the whole entire time, it's presumed that fighting will start again. And the fighting is going to start, and it's going to be just as intense, and it may get even more intense in the future, because Hamas, the actual fight between the IDF and Hamas, has really just begun. Uh, there's estimates, and I don't know how accurate they are, that only about 2,000 Hamas fighters have been killed. But there's 40,000 Hamas fighters. So even if that's anywhere close, it just shows you that this fight, if the intent of the IDF is still to destroy Hamas is far from being accomplished. And that is why I think the president's hesitant uh, to say just how long this is going to last, because quite frankly, I don't think people know how long it's going to last. All right. National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy, thank you. And those released hostages are now out of Gaza thanks to the Red Cross, who played a crucial role in this deal and transfer. Earlier, I spoke with a spokesperson of the organization about how it all went down and what happens next. John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me now from Geneva with more. John, you guys played such a central role in all of this. Walk me through what went into making this deal happen, and how do you feel now that this day has arrived and this first group is free again? I'd say the most important part about this is the relief that the families feel, and the relief that the hostages feel after seven weeks in captivity. 
Uh, being separated from a family member in a situation of conflict is the most excruciating pain. Uh, people tell us that even if they've lost their homes and, and they're short on food and water, it's really the separation if they're if they they become uh, separated from their daughter or their son or their 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 spouse that, that that's the deepest pain so the good news today is the alleviation of that suffering that the families have been going through and that the hostages have been going through so walk us through what the protocol looks like these hostages are now released uh the israelis are back in israel the others are waiting to make their own way home what happens now well, the important part on this step is the agreement of the parties, the, this, uh, uh, this ceasefire, first of all, and then the agreement to allow the hostages to be released and the detainees uh, held by Israel to be released. Uh, and then our role in this was to go meet Hamas. We had four land cruisers, uh, eight ICRC personnel, meeting these 24 hostages uh, and then moving them across Gaza into safe hands to Egyptian and Israeli authorities. What's next is that, of course, this is just day one. Uh, we expect to repeat this process tomorrow to move even more hostages out of harm's way from their captors back towards their families, as well as more Palestinian detainees also, to note, back to their families. So the good news here from our perspective is that we're reducing that family separation, which is the cause of the, of the greatest heartache that you see in war. Now, officials also say that this four-day pause could be extended even further if Hamas continues to release more hostages after this, I shouldn't say initial group because I feel like today's is the initial group, but after the, these roughly 50 uh, as part of this deal. How likely do you think that is to happen, that they reach the number agreed upon in this deal and Hamas decides, you know what, we'll release some more if you continue this ceasefire? We can only hope that it happens. We can only hope that these initial steps are some sort of confidence building measure and it does lead to a reduction of conflict in the future, whether it's complete ceasefire or reduction. Of course, we support that because we see how much civilian suffering is caused in this urban setting, uh, this close-in fighting, all the damage and destruction that you see in Gaza, and therefore all the suffering that cascades down to the families. So no predictions on our part. We're happy to continue to play this role of neutral intermediary between the two sides, between Hamas, between Israel, uh, in order to further humanitarian goals and, and hope that that's the track that we're on right now. And of course, many more hostages are still held captive. Uh, John, what happens next to this group that is part of this exchange deal? And then what happens to those who aren't? So the group that gets to go, of course, has this nightmare, the seven week nightmare uh, come to an end and they begin the healing process from this experience back with their families, their friends, uh, if they have to meet with counselors or therapists, of course. Um, and now for the other group um, that won't be so fortunate to be released in this four-day operation, the International Committee of the Red Cross since day one has been insisting with direct, uh, through direct talks with Hamas that we be allowed to visit all of the hostages, check on their welfare, bring medical care if necessary, allow those hostages to be able to communicate with their families. We've had those talks directly with Hamas at the highest level. Our president met the political leader of Hamas in Qatar. Uh, so we continue to insist on that. Um, we don't have any agreements that that's going to take place, but we're still working on it. All right, John Strazuso, spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. John, thank you. I know it's a busy day. We appreciate you coming on to share your story. Thanks for your interest. Coming up, brace for a deep freeze where a cross-country storm is headed and the cold hitting much of the country. Also ahead, the latest on the ongoing hostage release in the Middle East, what we're learning about the hostages already free and what's next for those still being held. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <laughs> Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We're learning new details about the 24 hostages released by Hamas as part of a four-day ceasefire deal with Israel. The Israeli government is confirming the identities of 13 Israeli citizens in the group, saying they range in age from 85 years old to the youngest at just two years old. Let's go to ABC News, Patrick Revel in Tel Aviv for us. Patrick, what do we know so far about the hostages in this first group of 24, 13 Israelis, and then the other four nationals? Hi, Dan. Yeah, just in the last few minutes, we've heard that those freed hostages have now been flown from the airbase in southern Israel and have been taken to hospitals where they're going to meet with their families for the first time in 49 days. It will be the first time that they've, the, the families have seen them in person. Um, as you were saying, you know, we now know the identities of these hostages. Most of them are from the same kibbutz that was attacked on October 7th by Hamas. It's from New Roz. Twelve of the hostages are from there. Several of them are from the same families. Four of them are children. The oldest was 84 five and the youngest was just two years old. There were also there were these ten uh, Thai nationals who were workers in the kibbutz who were, who were caught up in the attack and who were released unconditionally by Hamas and we believe after some mediation involving Iran um, as well as one Filipino worker who was a care worker at the, um, at the kibbutz. As I, say, as I say they're now in the hospitals there um, in terms of who wasn't released, we know that we were, there was a lot of hope that perhaps um, the Americans, the three Americans currently being held by Hamas would be released. As we understand it, they are on the full list of the 50 hostages to be released in this four-day pause. And that includes three-year-old Abigail Moore Edin, um, whose parents were murdered in that attack, but she was not in the exchange today. I should say as well, we've also seen t this evening the release of the 39 Palestinian um, women and teenagers who were held in an Israeli prison. There's celebrations tonight in um, the West Bank's capital, Ramallah, big crowds there waving flags. And so we now we, we wait to see if this will all be repeated again tomorrow with the next batch of hostages. So what about the hostages who are part of this deal but haven't been released yet? You say we're waiting to see what's going to happen with them. Uh, how concerning is that aspect of things and the possibility that this deal might fall through? Yeah, I think, you know, there's still a huge amount of apprehension for the families here that, you know, already today there was immense nerves whether this would happen or not. And we're going to see tomorrow if it's going to happen all over again when they try to release another batch of 10 hostages. We've just heard again in the last few minutes um, that Israel has received a list of names. We don't yet know who is on that. I think we probably likely won't know until tomorrow when we hopefully will see them brought out again. Of course, there is over 200 hostages still being held in, um, in captivity by Hamas, and only 50 at the moment are agreed to be released. But as you heard from President Biden earlier, he hopes that this is just the beginning and that dozens of hostages are going to be freed in the next few days with this idea that potentially the ceasefire 
ceasefire can be extended from beyond four days. In theory, Hamas, if it releases another 10 hostages each day, will get another day of ceasefire. And so it's hoped that we'll start to see more people released. But I think there is a belief that the male hostages, particularly those who are IDF soldiers, will be a lot more difficult to get Hamas to release. And so there is this fear. There's a great deal of fear for them still. And Patrick, how's the ceasefire holding up so far? How fragile does that feel right now? Yeah, so the ceasefire has held today. It began at 7 a.m. We haven't seen any airstrikes from the Israeli side. We haven't seen any shelling. We haven't seen any fighting. What we have seen, though, is clashes when um, basically Israel has told civilians who were displaced by the fighting not to come back to northern Gaza. Um, obviously, a million people were displaced by the fighting up there. They tried today to start going back. Thousands of Palestinian civilians tried to move back up to the north to try and see what was left of their homes and to see what had happened to their homes. We know that Israel blocked them and that IDF troops actually opened fire on some Palestinian civilians um, and wounded a number of them and at least two are believed to have been killed and that obviously is very concerning because if something like that was to be repeated and we saw uh, significant casualties I think that's something that could potentially threaten this deal. All right, Patrick Rival for us in Tel Aviv. Stay safe, Patrick. Thank you. Coming up, major news out of South Africa. Why convicted killer and former Paralympian Oscar Pistorius could soon be a free man. Also ahead, the travel crunch is on. Find out if severe weather will interfere with your plans as Americans head out in record numbers this Black Friday. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, Reed? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Chicago. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Grab your coat if you're heading out to shop or travel today because some of the coldest air of the season is moving into parts of the country. Sam Champion is tracking the cold as well as a cross-country storm. Sam? Here's another winter storm, this one coming at the end of the holiday for everyone's travel home. So remember the one coming to the holiday just before it was a little bit troublesome and problematic. This one could slow things down, but it should not shut things down. Let's talk about the winter weather warnings and watches that are out right now for about 14 states. This is about 9 million people that are covered here. And this is where the storm continues to develop today, just kind of sitting still, but then slowly moving east after that. From Denver all the way to Boulder, this is like one to three inches of snow right in that area, but higher in the mountains could be another foot of 
snow. So as this moves into Kansas City, 7 p.m. Saturday to 5 a.m. on Sunday, that's the time that Kansas City is kind of involved in this. And it's a light snow for KC, but there's a little icy mix in some of that as well. So as we get to Chicagoland, and you're looking at this as an all Sunday event, 5 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. And Chicagoland, this is not a big snow for us. We kind of get big snows. This is one to three, could be a little bit more in northern areas. But again, this is the kind of thing that might slow you down. It does not stop you. Detroit, the similar situation. Most of the snow pushes into Canada, and it becomes a wet system with maybe just a little bit of high elevation, northern New England snow, but not much at that. And if you look at the rainfall totals by the time we get to Sunday into Monday, for Boston, it's maybe one to two inches of, of rain. For New York, it's probably about an inch of rain. So that's way different from the storm that got us into the holiday and a lot less rain. Here's your travel Sunday, and you can see how quiet it is out west, so everything should be fine. There should not be any issues here, but there may be just some volume slowdowns. And if you combine that with some of the weather, it could mean the planes don't get where they're supposed to. So still connect your airports, still make sure you know what's going on. Be careful on those roads because there's a lot of volume and just a little slippery mess. Diane? Sam Champion, thank you. And here are some of the top headlines we're following for you today. Former Paralympian and convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius will soon be out on parole. The runner has been serving a prison sentence for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Pistorius was one of the world's most admired athletes before he shot Steenkamp multiple times through a bathroom door in his home on Valentine's Day in 2013. South African authorities say Pistorius will be released on January 5th. The Rainbow Bridge border crossing between the U.S. and Canada near Niagara Falls is now open after a deadly crash sent the vehicle soaring through the air and set off a fiery explosion. The car's two passengers, identified as husband and wife, are dead. One booth agent is recovering from non-life-threatening injuries. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We heard the loudest series of pops. Like pop, 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 pop. Sounded like balloons. So I try and turn to see what's going on, and then that's when I get hit in the arm and fall to the side and 
in my scissors. Yeah, I get hit in the leg, and then I, I fall as well. I swiveled with my body. I could see the silhouette of a dark man in the doorway to the club. He'd already made it around, uh, wielding something with a flashlight on it and a red laser dot. <laughs> The first thing that Giancarlo said to me oh, after I asked him what is happening is just know that I love you and I'll always love you. That was the thing that he said to me while we were bleeding on the ground. And I hit the ground. First time I walked into the bar, ever going to queue, well, to perform, Daniel greeted me at the door. I said, I don't know where I'm supposed to go with my stuff. He said, that way, do you want me? I'll take you. He took my bag, walked me to the back. For the first week or so that I was working at Q regularly, another queen turned to me and said, so what do you, like, what do you think of Daniel? I was like, I don't, I'm gonna marry that man. I'm the drag queen, he's the bartender. The most incredible, like, power duo for a bar. <laughs> it was actually at Club Q where we met. It was a drag show. Derek and Daniel served us drinks that night. There was the upper bar, and then there was the lower area where the stage was. Right next to us, they sat John Carlos. <laughs> so, and we were all just sitting there. I heard him cheering. I heard him getting really excited. I looked over, and I'm like, He's actually cute. And so the show ends, right? He sat next to me. I'm just kind of glancing over at him. Keisha gets up, walks over to John Carlos, and is like, this is my friend James. He wants to talk to you. OK, bye. <laughs> I was like, hi. <laughs> and then, yeah, we, we sat and we talked for the entire night until the bar closed. Daniel, he just had this ways creeping under your skin and making you feel safe and at home. It was pouring rain, and he came to visit me at work. He left on my car under the windshield wiper, wrapped in bubble wrap and saran wrap so it wouldn't get wet, an envelope with a uh, brown paper bag <laughs> inside of it that he cut one side of the brown paper bag off and wrote a poem on. And it says, uh, I wish my hands could speak so they could say what it is that lights my every fiber on fire when I touch your face. My cousin was the one that took me to Club Q for the first time. He introduced me to a few people, so the only, the only people I've ever really known in the community have been, uh, have been through Q. Yeah, I don't make it out much uh, <laughs> outside of that. It was my birthday that night. I requested to be in the show because I wanted to do something on my birthday. Everyone in that crowd was there to hang out with me, which is I'm not... It was family. Happy birthday. And we watched the drag show, and it was great. We had a great time. We were having lots of fun. And there's a picture of, you know, us that kind of sort of went viral, where we all three took the photo. And this was, like, right at the end of the drag show. Potted was dating Daniel. There was just some ribbing going on. And the last thing I shouted to Daniel was, we love you, Daniel, because Potted was doing some ribbing with the drag show. We were rather clandestine, well, at least we tried to be, about our relationship at the bar. Did not hide that very well. So we danced on the dance floor for a little bit. And I'm like, OK, so I'm ready to you know, get out of here. It was getting close to midnight. So we went around and started saying our goodbyes to everybody because we knew everybody there. I saw Daniel on the corner of the bar. I gave him a hug and a kiss. And uh, I said, I'll meet you outside. We'll go smoke in a minute. Uh, and I said, I love you. I'll see you soon. And started talking to Kelly. 
But then we heard the loudest series of pops. And I hit the ground. And Kelly fell on top of me, and Ed fell on top of her. And my beer was everywhere. <laughs> so much beer. I'm soaking wet, and I'm cold, and I'm shaking. And I can hear moaning and screaming and gunfire. And so I called 911. <laughs> and I'm on the, uh, the line with dispatch. I'm like, we just need help, we need help. And I think shock set in because I hung up. <laughs> I was like, I don't want him to hear me, so I hung up. I didn't want to sit up because at one point my wig was covering my face. At one point I saw legs just walk up in front of me. I thought, this is it. And he said, do you need tourniquets? <laughs> and that's when I knew it was more OK for me to sit up, because gunfire isn't going to start again. People are helping each other. All I remember is just looking around, and I'm like, I'm seeing people not moving. This person sticking out from the bar area is dead. That was Raymond. And then I saw Kelly, and then I saw Ashley. I, I didn't see Daniel, and I didn't see Derek, because they were in two separate areas where I couldn't see. And Ed is holding pressure on Kelly's chest, and I pull my hand out from under me, the one that helped call 911. I was just squeezing her hand. And I was saying, give me another squeeze, baby. Give me another squeeze, baby. You're doing so good. Just keep breathing and keep squeezing me. You keep squeezing me, you're here with me. People start to get up and start to run around and start applying, like, first aid and, and start helping other people. And, like, I remember having someone come up to me. They got rags and stuff, and they're like, are you hit? I'm, are you hit? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm hitting my arm. And they're like, yeah, you're bleeding there. Here, apply this to the wound. And then they, like, kissed my forehead, and they're like, you're going to be OK. The sheriff <laughs> finally arrived. It was like five minutes, and then the cops arrived. So it was really a short but very long moment in time. We rolled her over, and she took this really big, deep breath. And I said, you're doing OK, baby. You're still here with us. And gave her a kiss on the cheek. And that's when they pulled her out. And I looked at this other sheriff, and I said, what do I need to do to help you? He said, the best you can do is just leave. <laughs> and I walk out, yeah. step over, face down, body in a pool of blood. And I go out the silver door into the parking lot, and it hits me. Where is Daniel? When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. 
Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. I thought he was on the smoking patio. It's where I was told he was headed. And so I called him. I heard people are leaving from the smoke. I don't know what's happened. And his phone rings four times and doesn't answer. I called him three times. And out in the parking lot, I just screamed at the top of my lungs. Where? Like, what? Heard nothing. Couldn't sleep. Just walked, paced the floor. And, um, it's nine in the morning, we haven't heard anything. It's 10 in the morning. It's 11.30. I get a text from this number that says, I'm so sorry he never left. All we can hope is that it was quick. <laughs> and I didn't know how to process it, so I just called the number. And Jeff said, I'm sorry. He never left Q. And that night backstage was <laughs> A vase of roses, four packs of strawberries, two packs of blueberries, and a letter that he wrote to me. I read that letter probably a week after when they finally got it to me. The detectives were so amazing about that. They said, if anything, I, I know that letter is still back there. We're going to get it for you. Yes. Those written words are like every everything you'd want to hear. He said, uh, First of all, I believe you can never have too many flowers, especially not on your birthday, especially not from your lover. You deserve much more, in fact. Also, you can never have too much attention or appreciation especially for a drag queen, and especially not on her birthday. So allow me to give some to you. Every day, I am enamored by you. I know I've told you a hundred times, but I've never felt this way about anyone ever. <laughs> Since I've met you, I've been short of breath. Now you're all I think about. I love you so crazy much. I'm so happy you exist. And that today is a holiday for me too. Love always, Daniel. someone that you're just so at ease with. <laughs> and we would look at each other sometimes and say, is this moving too fast? <laughs> I've never felt like this about another human being. Not really, either of us in our whole lives. And it was just, it was 
so clear. I've got some of his vinyl records. I can pull one of those bad boys out. This one was his. This is a bop. I don't know if you're uh, familiar. Hang on, Sloopy by the McCoys. That was a hit. Dug this out from under his bed. <laughs> from, from Bang Records. Ain't that foreshadowing? Sorry, too, too soon. Like on an airplane? Grab those boots, and then we can bring them down with us, and then you get a, get a good look at all the junk from my dead fiance. The jokes about how many are you gonna make in, in the conversation. Yes. Do you find healing in the comedy? Why do you think you, you know, keep going back to that um, and you're referencing the tragedy in, in your jokes? That's a really good question that I don't know if I have the answer to or my therapist has the answer to. Um, I think it's easier, it's an easier way to talk about the situation, and I think it's also just an easy way to cope. And I, I do it because, I don't know, it's ingrained in my personality at this point. You know, it is a part of who I am. But I think it's mostly just, I mean, I'm already doing something that makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> So why not push it a little bit further? Because what's wrong with being uncomfortable, right? So many of us are too comfortable. So what's a shooting joke gonna do to you? <laughs> When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. There are a lot of unheard stories after the fact, right? It becomes, for the first week, it is this whirlwind of media. And they're like, what happened, what happened, what happened? And then there is very little follow-up afterwards. We're almost at the six-month mark, and in all technicality, my arm is still, the, the, the humerus is still shattered. I had x-rays done about a month ago. I had to have a surgery to put a rod in my arm, and it's still heavy. I still sometimes have to take pain meds just to, you know, because it still hurts, and I don't have as much strength in the arm, and I mean, just even doing dishes is sometimes a struggle. And then, of course, psychologically, there's a lot of PTSD for me. I struggle sometimes with going out, to, especially to queer spaces. Now we're a larger target. Now people know. 
know, you know, they've already known. We've already been a large target, but it's, uh, it's happened. I don't want to imagine what may happen had the shooter not been taken down that night. Five wonderful people were still murdered, and may we never forget their names. Ashley Pa, Raymond Green Vance, Daniel Aston, Derek Rump, and Kelly Loving. We miss each of you. Club Q was a second home and safe space, not just for me, but for all of us. Outside of these spaces, we are continually being dehumanized, marginalized, and targeted. The fear-based and hateful rhetoric surrounding the LGBTQ plus community, especially around trans individuals and drag performers, leads to violence. It incites violence. We shouldn't have to fear being shot when we go to our safe spaces, or anywhere for that matter. Since then, you know, the healing process, him being there for me when I, while I was still getting use of my arm, we've done so much, and it's, for me at least, it's made me feel uh, closer every single every single day is just closer and closer. I feel much much closer to him, and even I think it strengthened our relationship in a in a turnaround way. <laughs> so while he was in the hospital, I, I stayed with him, and uh, I would cry myself to sleep, and he would he would help me <laughs> well, work through my emotions, my feelings. That actually really helped me to to recover. Yeah, after that, since then, I was. All the fun experiences we've had, <laughs> we've been able to have yeah. brought us closer. Yeah. of your flags, but sometimes it's nice to be greedy for a while, isn't it, babe? stuff. Oh, come on. You guys got way too serious for that one. It was hard for me for a while to even look at myself in the mirror in makeup. And I was afraid of what it would do to me because the last time I was in makeup was that night. And so I was afraid of, you know, if it might put me back. Yeah, I feel pretty. It's stupid. Put on some lashes now. She was there. She kind of took the trauma for me, in a sense. And then I could set her aside and come back to her in a couple of months. And say, OK, well, if that's what feels comfortable, we can go that way. But then it was, you know, if I get back on this stage, I mean, they're already going to think I'm so strong, so stupid stuff like that. A lot of us queens get into the job because we want to be pretty, we want free drinks, and we want attention. I loved that. But now we have work, and now we have a community to hold. And uh, I think that's how, mostly how drag has changed for me. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, keep the noise going. My name is Potted Plant. I'm going to do a bit of a memorial piece for you all. And it's this one. Please don't cry. 
my message uh, since day one with Club Q, my message has been that we can't let these people try and force us back into whatever closet they want us to be in. Now there's drive, there's purpose. It just hurts. I think it's part of our queer identities to confront death. It's something that we've always been doing. You never think that it's gonna hit that close. You know, this was, we, we should be on the other side of queer history. There's work to do, which is the work they were doing to begin with. But now we have to, we have to uplift. I've already been shot with a bullet. But what more can you do to me? You can bet I'm gonna be loud, I'm gonna be proud, I'm gonna be fighting for every single person that is, you know, being forced back into that closet, that is being forced to be something that they're not. And I'm, I'm here for them. We always will love them. And, you know, whoever might see this and feel trapped, I, I want them to know that there is a community here that will support you. There are people that you can reach out to. Find me, reach out to me. I will always support you. There is love. There, there, there are always going to be people that love you. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Matt Gutman reporting in Gaza City right next to Al Shifa Hospital. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. A divorce war that leads to murder. And the verdict just in this week. 2020 starts right now. 
he says, are you sitting down? And, and I knew right away in his voice that this was not a good story. And what a story. Call this one a love-hate triangle. Husband, wife, and wife's family. They hate Danny in a way. I've never seen this kind of obsession. This wasn't a normal divorce case. Did any of you ever think that it could get violent? Never. A murder mystery we've been following for years. Someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. Now, finally, a courtroom verdict. I don't want him to think I'm the one convicting him or something. If I say yes, I saw them, and then that puts him in prison for life. The driver's side window is all bashed in. He's inside, the car is running, and he's got blood all over his head. It looks like he's been shot at a very close range. Why would you do this? I don't know. Would you ever ask someone to do something like this? I have something I want to tell you. I'm concerned about my safety with what I'm going to tell you. I do have some ideas. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. They say the wheels of justice turn slowly. All right. In this case, almost 10 years. The court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Stephen Everett now presiding. In many murder trials, there's the deceased and the defendant. State calls Wendy Adelson. But this one is unusual because this is a story about a family. Please say and spell your name. Wendy Adelson. W-E-N. One that seemingly has everything. Devotion, wealth, influence, and something else. Back in 2014, the Adelson family had a big problem. And that so-called problem leads this family here. From the very outset, the state suspected the Adelsons, the family. While the defendant's choices helped solve a problem within his family, they came at a very high price. That price, prosecutors say, was murder. Bible, it says there's exodus, the Jews left Egypt, and I, I always say the second exodus of the Jews was from New York to South Florida. Michael Weinstein is a criminal defense attorney who grew up in South Florida. My parents came down back in the 70s, and it was 30 degrees in New York and 70 degrees here, and that was a pretty easy decision for them. They settled in Coral Springs, a community about an hour north of Miami Beach. Coral Springs is kind of like a suburb of nowhere, but there wasn't really a big city that it was attached to. Among the Weinstein family's many friends were the Adelsons. Here's the matriarch Donna Adelson appearing on Wheel of Fortune in 1989. Um, I'm a domestic coordinator. Uh, I'm responsible for the activities, classes, and lessons of my son Robert, who is 16, Charlie, who is 12, Wendy, who is 10, my husband Harvey, who's in the audience. Harvey Adelson is someone I've known my entire life. He's a dentist, and he was married to Donna. And he had three kids, Robert, Charlie, and Wendy. Harvey was extremely successful dentist. He runs at the Adelson Institute of Dentistry. Donna helped as the office manager. Donna was always a bright smile. You know, you'd walk into the dental office and she was always warm. You know, walking to her home, it was always clean, immaculate. And the kids were always well behaved and appropriate and dressed well. And she was always a bright light to those children. By all accounts, the Adelson children are exceptional. They're smart, athletic, and driven to succeed. The three Adelson siblings, Rob was the oldest. Rob goes to medical school and falls in love with a fellow student there. Donna doesn't approve of him marrying her because she didn't have a Jewish background. Rob marries his girlfriend, falls out of favor with his mother, and becomes estranged from the Adelsons. So, focus shifts to the younger children, Charlie and Wendy. And they will be central to the story. They were closer in age, so I think Charlie and Wendy were a unit to a certain extent. 
Charlie and Wendy were at high school at the same time. Charlie was class of 95, Wendy was class of 97, so two years apart. Daryl Gold went to high school with the Adelson siblings. Charlie was always kind of a goofy kid in high school. He was a jokester, and he was, a, I guess, a social butterfly. Charlie went to dental school, got his degree, came back, and then he was helping Harvey in his practice. So it was a father and son practice, and Harvey was successful, but the Charlie helped bring it to a new level. Wendy was always an all-star. She was incredibly bright as a child. She did phenomenally well in high school, incredibly smart and gregarious and well-loved by everybody. Friends say she isn't only smart, but also a lot of fun, characteristics that were on display when she, like her mother before her, appeared on a game show. What have you always wanted to do? Weakest Link. When I was little, I wanted to be a giraffe. <laughs> Wendy Adelson does something a little different than everyone in her family. She goes into law. Wendy has an internship in Washington, D.C., where another young lawyer is just starting out. Danny studied in Harvard undergrad. He went to Cambridge, England. He went to Israel for a year. And after that, he finished law school, and we went to live in Washington. Danny was a very warm person to start with, with everybody. He never greeted people with a handshake. It was always a hug. Dan was raised in a conservative Jewish household in Toronto, Canada. It's a word in Yiddish, he would be a mensch, a real guy with great character and great personality. A young woman uh, named Wendy Adelson uh, searched him on J-Date, the Jewish dating service, and she was sitting with her mother Donna searching for a candidate for her to meet. And so they're looking up Dan Markell, he and Wendy share a passion for the law and seem like a great match. There was a really strong connection, and she, you know, was really drawn to him. And what did you think of this young woman? She was a very warm, she's a very attractive person, and we were so pleased that, you know, Danny was happy. Wendy's beautiful. She's adorable. She's uh, bright. And it was a beautiful thing to see Danny in love. You must have been elated. Here is this beautiful, well-educated, bright, warm woman who comes from a great family, who is in love with your son. They're going to make great grandbabies. Everybody should be happy. We were. Wendy and Dan's relationship moves quickly, and in less than a year, they're engaged. They decide to have their wedding in South Florida. Donna Adelson was very involved in the planning of this extravaganza for her only daughter. Daniel Markell was devout in his Jewish faith. It was important for him to have a traditional Jewish marriage, specifically in that the wedding would be entirely kosher. He was very invested in it being a kosher wedding so that the rabbis would be comfortable being there. When Dan's family and friends travel down from Canada for the big day, they're in for a surprise. Daniel Markell shows up at his own wedding and discovers that the catering is not kosher. I think he sort of had the rug pulled out from under him because the rabbis were going to have to leave, and I think that was a very devastating moment for him. Donna approached me and she said, why is Danny so kosher? You're not even that kosher. And she already had started to move towards that as kind of a bit of a divisive issue. Do you think that this is malicious? No. I think that it was a bit of sabotage, a little bit of lack of respect. There was a third person in this relationship, and that's what we have here. So Donna was the third person in the relationship between Wendy and Danny. Absolutely. Lots of people whose in-laws are paying for the wedding end up with not the wedding of their dream. It's only in retrospect that it looks like a harbinger of things to come.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <laughs> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day. On the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Sure, you could go outside, but why? The temperature is well below freezing. Cozy up instead with Freeform's 30 Days of Disney every day. It's kind of a big deal. I'll bring the snack! There will be so many Disney movies. How many? There must be dozens! We're all going to a movie, too. Don't mind us. This is what we've been training for. The entertainment. Cuddle close. Ooh, but don't touch it. 30 Days of Disney. Watch all November on Freeform. I've been described this way. Dry and mighty. <laughs> Let's talk dirty. When you got number two. You do do. Excuse me. <laughs> always end this way. Let me guess, these are things that end with crying? <laughs> Michael Strahan hosts The $100,000 Pyramid, Wednesdays, 10, 9 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. I know you've been thinking a lot about tonight. A big part of this is it's all about hope. Hope is something I think we'll find a lot of tonight.
Welcome to Generation Gap. Thursdays. What is secretariat? A secretary? That's a woman? Kelly Ripa hosts the comedy game show where nobody acts their age. Juniors and seniors work together to flex their pop culture knowledge for big prizes and bigger fun. Who is this mister? Mr. Rockstar? Mr. T is going to be very upset with all of us. Generation Gap, Thursdays on ABC and stream on Hulu. After their wedding, Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell settle into a life together. They move to Tallahassee, the capital of Florida. Both Dan and Wendy get jobs at Florida State University Law School. So if you're not from Florida, there's a saying, the farther north you go, the more south you get. Northern Florida is really southern Georgia. When you think about Florida, maybe you think about Disney World. Do so you think about Miami with the beaches and the nightlife? And Tallahassee is not seen as that sophisticated. It's a much slower pace here. Dan and Wendy start their life together in this neighborhood called Baton Hills. It is a kind of upscale neighborhood. This is a quiet place. This is where kids run around, you know, ride their bikes up and down the street. And they have, from the outside, what seems like a pretty idyllic life. They were very lovey, happy. We went to dinner once uh, at their house, and we left kind of going like, oh feeling my God, inadequate. like inadequate so. as a married couple because they were dancing and singing yeah. and. And they called each other the Bears. The Bears. So. <laughs> and Mr. Bear was Danny, yeah. and Mrs. Bear was Wendy. In the leafy enclave filled with families, Wendy and Dan start one of their own and they have two boys within two years. Danny was a great father. So with all his accomplishments, to me, I'm the proudest of him as a father. His boys were the entire world to him. He was a professor in a demanding job. He traveled, but he managed to arrange his schedule as much as he could to spend a lot of quality time. They would go to the local pool, they would go to the park. He was really invested in their early growing up years. Dan's career really takes off. He was like a star on the rise. Well, Dan Markell was a passionate guy who cared deeply about learning and teaching. Dan Markell speaking about retributive justice. He's a criminal law specialist. Murder, for example, is a kind of law that I think everyone... He could talk for hours about principles of justice and uh, jurisprudence. In terms of sentencing. Issues of the death penalty of criminal justice. Passes Dan starts rational. a blog for law professors, and his friends say it might have made him some enemies. We're in a profession where most of the people are type A personalities. Most people are a little aggressive. Dan liked to argue, and he liked to make sure people understood his arguments. Friends of Dan's will tell you that he liked to needle people. He liked to push and poke and prod. While Dan is relishing life in Tallahassee, Wendy is not as content. She's longing for South Florida, where her parents and brother live. Under the old adage, a happy wife, happy life, he tried to get a job in Miami, which would have been closer to Wendy's parents, and then was unsuccessful. That was very dispiriting for both, I think, him and Wendy. She was talking to him about being unhappy, and he was insisting they had no problems. They had come into their marriage as equals, well-educated lawyers with ambition and promise. But over time, her friends say Wendy begins to feel a sense of imbalance in their relationship, something that she talks about openly on a podcast she does for a writing class. Our marriage dissolved after the children arrived, as the loneliness of being married to someone that didn't view me as an equal crept in. Danny was brilliant. He was top notch in his field. And I think she struggled with being in his shadow. And I think it was hard for her to navigate her role in the marriage. He was fairly controlling and pretty unkind to my friend. And I was, you know, around on a number of occasions when he put her down, and it was really hard to be around for that. 
Roughly six years into their marriage, Wendy writes a novel. It's called This Is Our Story. It's a work of fiction, but those close to Wendy notice the parallels to her own life. In fact, Wendy laments Dan's unwillingness to read her book in her podcast. I do believe he loved me the best way he knew how. I mean, he didn't like fiction, so why read my novel? It was logic, not a lack of love. In the book, one of her characters was a woman who fell out of love. And perhaps that's why she wanted Dan to read it. My childhood friend Lisa told me this weekend that she never even knew I was unhappy in my marriage. I had no idea I hid it so well. At this point, Dan is traveling frequently for work while Wendy stays behind, literally and figuratively, working and caring for their two young sons. I see Dan in New York, and he's telling me that he thinks his marriage is, is unwinding. So I try to encourage him to just stick it out, stay home more, don't go to as many conferences, just try to work your way through it. It's during one of these trips to a conference in New York City that Wendy calls Dan to deliver some devastating news. She says, I'm leaving, it's over. Dan says, please don't do this. We can still work this out. She calls him in New York, he changes all his plans, he cancels the lecture, and he gets on a flight to come back to Tallahassee. He walks into the bedroom, and he, there was divorce papers on the bed. Half the furniture is missing. Even half the dining room chairs were gone. He came home to a house that was literally half emptied. Even though she was just filing for divorce, but Correct. she preemptively took everything, including the kids. Then he called this Pearl Harbor. It was kind of shocking, you know, all of a sudden he was sneak attacked on a Sunday morning, essentially. Even in his wildest imagination, when he's describing what he's taking to be his wife's disengagement, he doesn't think that this is going to happen. Danny was devastated from the divorce. This wasn't a normal divorce case. It was incredibly litigious. <laughs> you know, I guess you might expect that with two law professors. The accusations are flying at this point. Wendy accuses Dan of hiding assets, while Dan accuses Wendy of taking hundreds of thousands of dollars. He said that she stole assets, wouldn't give back a diamond ring from one of his aunts in the Holocaust. It was really acrimonious. Wendy accuses Dan of emotional abuse and claims he tells their colleagues at FSU that she has, quote, mental health issues. They each vehemently deny the claims of the other. It was almost like a tennis match, you know, going back and forth with these filings that only the two of them really were involved in the match at that point. And everybody else was just kind of standing on the outside watching. There was lack of communication. There was rancor. Did any of you ever think that it could get violent? Never. But there was a third party involved in this divorce. Let's show this what will make him absolutely miserable. Wendy's mother, Donna. Gibbers hasn't beaten the Adelson family yet. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. There's something wrong here. All I could see was the torso and the feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. At some point, there will be more victims. We were against the clock. Find that evidence and bring it to justice hunt humans as prey. I've never saw that kind of evil before. Just the devil incarnate. It's like a cat and mouse game. I know it's him. That just scared everybody. You guys gotta hurry. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. Send a few cold chills down my spine. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime at Blood Mountain. Streaming only on Hulu. I'm Selena Wang in Hanoi, Vietnam. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Less than seven years after exchanging wedding vows, Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell are exchanging accusations in divorce court. 
The divorce got really nasty, and I think the boiling point was when Wendy couldn't leave Tallahassee, couldn't relocate to South Florida. Dan wouldn't agree to it. Wendy made it extremely clear to almost anyone who would listen that she did not like Tallahassee, she did not want to live here, and she wanted to move to South Florida. And the only way she could do that is if he agreed or he died. She's allowed to leave him, right? She's allowed to divorce. But she's not allowed to just take his kids and move them seven hours to South Florida. She filed a motion to relocate the children, and that was flatly denied. The judge ruled over the protests of Wendy and Wendy's family that she could not move to Miami. Donna and Harvey, Wendy's parents, had always been actively involved in Wendy's life and in the grandkids' life. It's like 700 miles. It's a day drive. It, it was quite inconvenient for them. To listening. have to keep going up to Tallahassee. Yeah. And Donna would be back and forth quite often. When the divorce happens, they maintain a closeness to the situation. They are extremely involved. And the news that Wendy and the kids will not be able to move to South Florida apparently does not sit well with her mother, Donna. Donna began this campaign. She wrote these lengthy emails to Wendy. Donna refers to uh, Dan Markell as gibbers, which is clearly a derogatory term. It's time to take control of your life and not let Jibbis think he's won anything by having you remain in Tallahassee. A month before their next court appearance, Donna sends Wendy a long email suggesting ways to needle her soon-to-be ex-husband. Remember, this is the woman who helped her daughter find Dan on J-Date eight years earlier. Now Donna says she wants that same man to suffer. Let's show this what will make him absolutely miserable. You know his weak points, money, religion, control. Donna advocates using religion to pressure Dan. Let Jibbers know that your children will be baptized in the Catholic Church. Donna even suggests paying Dan off. We plan to make a financial offer to him to allow this relocation. She suggested to Wendy that they should go three ways to pay Danny a million dollars, her and Harvey, Charlie, and Wendy. And Donna reminds Wendy she's not alone in this fight. Jibbers hasn't beaten the Adelson family yet. You have a very strong family behind you. Just remember that. I don't think at this point money, threats of Catholic school, you name it, we're going to convince Dan to be separated from his kids. <laughs> Although their divorce is technically finalized in July 2013, things aren't over just yet. The following spring, old wounds reopen after the boys visit their grandma, Donna. Donna was telling the boys how stupid their father was. How did Danny even find out that Donna was maligning him the to kids, his own children? The boys were told him. He says, well, Daddy, Grandma Donna was saying that you're stupid. And Danny was now getting agitated about the fact that there was this bad meddling going on. That obviously infuriates him. Your ex-mother-in-law is trying to poison your kids against you. He felt like her family was alienating the children from him. So Dan files a motion that will take Wendy back to court. And he was making the argument to the court that the grandmother should not be able to have the kids unsupervised. They had a lot of issues post-divorce, which made it even difficult to have smooth communications uh, between them. There was lack of communication, anger. Did any of you ever think that it could get violent? Never. Despite the heated language in divorce court, in their personal lives, Dan and Wendy appear to be moving on. Soon, there's a new man in her life. Wendy was introduced to a social work professor at FSU, Jeff Lacasse. One of the first things that people point out about Jeff is that he looked a little like Dan. Dan is dating as well, and they became relatively serious, too. It was beautiful. He, he fell in love again, and that was a nice experience for us, really, to see him in a much better moment after all of the other things that were going on. It took a while, but I thought he was really regaining his footing. But that would all change on a hot July morning in 2014. Dan Markell is on summer break from FSU Law School. 
He drives the children to the preschool. He drives to Premier Gym. Dan Markell was coming back to his home from the gym. He's on the phone. I remember very specifically, he says to me, my, I have to make one more call. Dan makes that call and is pulling into his driveway when he notices something unsettling. He says, there's someone in my driveway that I don't know. And as the man is on the phone, he hears some exchange, then hears a muffle, a sound, a grunt. He never hears Dan Markell again. At around 11 AM, shots ring out. A neighbor finds Dan Markell slumped over in the front seat of his Honda, calls 911. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, it's right next door to my house. OK, what, what's, he, what's going on with him? I don't know. The, the, the driver's side window is all bashed in. He's inside. The car is running. And he's got blood all over his head. He's not responding to me. And this phone call came in from the police. The dummy was shot. The hell is in shock. Your mind goes blank. It's not possible. It's, it's, they're making a mistake. All you could think about is your body's totally traumatized. It, it was horrific. It was just something that out of this world. In the beginning, no one really knew what happened. Police ask Dan's ex-wife, Wendy, what she knows. Why would you do this? I don't know. Would you ever ask someone to do something like this? Not in a million years. Wendy does not hold back in this interview. Do you think someone would do this for your benefit without asking them? No. Even my family, who felt like I had been mistreated, would never do something like this, never. It is perhaps the biggest mystery in this case, exactly what was going through Wendy's brain in that interview room. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight, we are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? 
Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. Nine one. What's the address of your emergency? Uh, it's right next door to my house. This was a horrifying scene for that neighbor who first walked over and looked and wasn't sure what had happened. Okay, what, what's, he, what's going on with him? He's not responding to me. The neighbor sees Dan Markell with a gunshot to the forehead, to the face, and his glasses are shattered. It looks like he's been shot at a very close range, and Dan Markell is still breathing. Once the paramedics arrive, he's quickly rushed to the hospital. Police track down his ex-wife, Wendy, who is out to lunch with friends, and bring her to the police station. There was a shooting at your ex-husband's home. Daniel uh, has been taken to the hospital. Um, he's not going to survive. Oh, my God. OK? What happened? Well. Before we get into everything, I have to establish where you were and who you were with and so forth. Okay. Okay. I just don't understand. How did this really happen? She sits down for hours, and then during that time, the police look at her phone, they look at her ID, they swab her for fingerprints. Everything that you would do with a potential suspect. They never call her a suspect, and it's an interview, not an interrogation. But she does provide all of this willingly. I understand why you but, think uh, I'm but, the primary suspect. No, you're not the primary suspect. My ex husband caused me a lot of grief. <laughs> I would never do something like that. I, <laughs> I understand why I okay. would be the person you would think would do something. But well, we have to work just as hard to eliminate. It's people. fine. I want to figure out who this is. Wendy does not hold back in this interview. She talks about how bad the divorce was. She talks about how Dan was emotionally abusive to her. She talks about how she wants to get down to Miami. He never hurt me physically, but he was he was emotionally abusive. Okay. And I didn't tell most people that, so all most people know is we, it just didn't work out. While Dan Markell clings to life, his parents are located and told the devastating news. Phil, it was you who got the original call. I was visiting friends, and this phone call came in from the police saying that Demi was shot and that somebody from the hospital doctor is going to call me. Phil called me. I got the call, and he says, are you sitting down? And, and I knew right away in his voice that this was not a good story. And then he told me that Danny was shot, which was horrific. Dan Markell died in the hospital less than 24 hours after he'd been shot. I had wished that I could at least hold his hand before he passed away. I regret that very much. Dan's death was felt by so many. There were headlines all across Florida and that covered his death, his murder, and the memorial for him because he touched so many lives. So many people came out to support his family, to remember him. I was unbelievably moved. Just the outpouring of love for him. I literally sat in my seat and cried because I found out things about Danny, my own son, that I didn't even know myself. 
Tallahassee police now scrambling to unravel the riddle of who killed Florida State University professor Dan Markell. This was the crime that sent shockwaves through the community. I just could not believe it because I know Danny, I know how he is. Who would shoot him really is what was going through my mind. The overall response was shock and horror and a lot of questions like, why would anyone want to kill Dan Markell? After Dan Markell is killed, it's a complete mystery as to who did this. No evidence seems to have been left behind. It's as if the murderer vanished into thin air. With him being so prominent in the legal world, there was a lot for investigators to chew on. One theory is that Dan made enemies over his provocative legal blog that he'd founded and wrote for, and he'd recently received online threats. So it, my first thought was, and I shared it with the police at that moment, that maybe it was a disgruntled, perhaps, student or other person professional on the blog. They also looked, of course, in a college town, you're going to say was an unhappy student. I just thought, my god, this happened to one of us, and another one of us might be next. Detectives also begin to look at people in Wendy and Dan's lives, starting with someone that Wendy herself brought up during her long police interview. Basically, the hours after the murder, Wendy pretty much immediately started pointing fingers at a few different people. She talked about a guy she knew she was dating, Jeffrey Lacasse. I see why he's a good suspect. Like, what if it's Jeff? He didn't like Danny because Danny hurt me. Police track down her former boyfriend and bring him in for an interview. I'm surprised you guys didn't call me earlier, though, because I probably said a hundred times in public that I like to kick his ass. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
my favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. While all of these theories about who murdered Dan Markell were circulating, police started to think this was more personal. Maybe it had something to do with Wendy. Maybe someone who loved her. She talked about a guy she knew she was dating, Jeffrey Lacasse. Jeffrey Lacasse comes in to talk to police willingly three times. He keeps coming back because it seems that he has a story to tell. Your name did come up uh, because you were associated at some point with Wendy. Of course. I mean, spent a lot of time with Wendy. I mean, she really has this charisma and this sexuality. And so, you know, you throw yourself in front of a bus for this girl. This is a new kind of thing for me. But I was in love with this girl, man. Jeff's interview, maybe more so than Wendy's, is extraordinary because he's a boyfriend who is in the process of breaking up with Wendy, and it's a contentious breakup by both of their admission. I'm surprised you guys didn't call me earlier, though, because I probably said a hundred times in public that I like to kick his ass because he kept like, really making me when he suffer and things like that. Right. But no, I would never. I'm a professor. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything like that. No, no. He's right up front about saying that he didn't like this guy. He also has an ironclad alibi. He was out of town. I stayed at a really crappy day's end, maybe 20 miles south of Atlanta. He's got the receipts. He was not here, so that immediately puts him in the clear. You know, right away, something clicks in his head. And he seems to say, I think I know what happened. I'm concerned about my safety with what I'm going to tell you, to be honest. So, Danny Markell just got killed, and I don't want to be next. I'm sorry if that sounds paranoid, but uh, I do have some ideas. And Lacasse points to Wendy's family, her parents and her brother, who run that very successful South Florida dental clinic. A family desperately wants her back in South Florida. They hate Danny in a way. I've never seen this kind of obsession. Like their hobby is hating Danny. <laughs> Maya and Alex Greenberg tell police about this ire uh, from the Adelsons towards Dan Marco. They hated Danny, really. They hated, they hated, Danny. They hated Danny. I think they're mean. I think they, I mean, to do some of the stuff that they did during this divorce with Danny is just not reasonable. Hi, Mom. How's it going? I need you to sit down. So during this police interview, Wendy asks if she can call her mother. And she tells Donna that Dan has been shot. He's not expected to live. Danny has been shot. There was a point where she was just kind of saying she was relieved to find that her mom was surprised at the news. Well, my parents sounded really surprised, so it's at least a relief. I was trying to think of who would be angry enough to do something to him. My parents would be angry, but they're not capable of this. And Wendy makes this startling comment about something her brother Charlie once said to her. My brother, um, the one his name's Charlie, the one I'm really close to, he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste, and it was a joke he made. Oh, I looked into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV, so instead I got you this TV. It was my divorce present. Such a horrible thing to say. Would well, you think that this guy Charlie would even be capable of doing something like this? No. no. Let's just talk. He's the Joker. Okay. Charlie was always someone who was smiling, always someone who would have a good time. Wendy's older brother Charlie had 
reputation as a fast-living, fun-loving playboy. He's so smart, he's intelligent, and he's fun. He throws his money around, he's a bit of a player. Charlie always has a girl that I can't keep up. It seemed like Charlie had two different types of friends. You know, people we kind of grew up with, like normal, nice people. He also seemed to have maybe friends that were from the wrong side of the tracks. Somebody tried to kill my ex-husband. They should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Regardless of who it is. I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother, but I don't think it was my family. Uh, anyone outside my immediate family, that's a tough one. Okay. But I don't think my immediate family did this. So okay. if it's anybody else, yeah. And it turns out that Wendy's family was nowhere near Tallahassee the day Dan was shot. Wendy later releases a statement through her attorney saying, my family had nothing to do with this and quickly moves to South Florida with her two sons. Meanwhile, as police continue their investigation, they have just a single solid lead from the crime scene. The neighbor did see a car backing away, something that looked similar to a Prius. And that's all that police had to go on. You said there was another vehicle that you well, saw driving away? Yes, and it, it left the scene rapidly. It looked sort of like a Prius. Police are able to identify a green Toyota Prius at the fitness center where Dan Markell worked out the morning he was shot. He exercises, comes back out, goes to his car in the same vehicle, which hasn't left the parking lot, is then seen pulling out of the parking lot, following behind the victim. The Prius was really the thing that they focused on initially. They had surveillance video of it from city buses that it had driven by. Intersection cameras were able to capture it. Well, we also find that car on video on a bus camera pulling into the victim's neighborhood or thereabouts shortly before the murder. And they notice there's a sun pass. It's the, uh, the toll road pass. Now, in Tallahassee at this time, we don't have any toll roads, so people don't go around with sun pass screeners. They then began this absolutely extensive search all over the state for this type of color, this type of Prius with the sun pass on it. When police pulled those toll records, it led them here to this hole-in-the-wall rental agency here in Miami that rents mostly hybrids. Now, inside, a contract was signed leading police to the men who rented that green Prius. And when they went and looked at who signed for the car to be rented, their names were right there. Who are these two men? I want to know what made them come to Tallahassee and kill our friend. It's very strange. I mean, people, they don't know him, they never heard of him. The mystery surrounding those two men would lead to an undercover encounter in South Florida. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? How you doing? Just want to give you this. Oh, uh, listen. You? <laughs> and a cryptic call between mother and son. I've got some, I've got some paperwork and delivery to me. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably both of them. You probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, then he got murdered. A law school professor is shot down in cold blood. Now, the murder trial... All right, for the jury. ...teaming with hired hitmen, hidden recordings, and family secrets. When Wendy Adelson walked into the courtroom to take the stand, how does she feel about the fact that the state is saying her family is involved in this murder? And Charlie is basically your prime suspect, at least within that family. I mean, he's a suspect. Wendy Adelson had a problem, and her problem was named Dan Markell. Dr. Adelson, were you involved in a plot to kill your brother-in-law, Dan Markell? Before the shooting, did you ever discuss hiring a hitman? Somebody hired him, but who? What will the jury decide? If they think the police are coming to you to talk to you, they will kill you. Look at what they did to Professor Markell. Tallahassee police now scrambling to unravel the riddle of who killed Florida State University professor Dan Markell. Tomorrow marks one year since his death. So far, there are no good leads, so they're asking for your help. Does the story kind of just drop off? It did. There was not a whole lot of information that came out, really, almost two years with no answers. The community thinking, what happened? Do Cops just not have any information, no leads. I was thinking that, my God, it's never going to go anywhere. It's two years and nothing, nothing. What is so sad for the Markells, besides this horrible, violent death of their son, they don't have connection to his children. After Dan was murdered, the children went back to South Florida with Wendy. And then a series of things happened afterward that compounded that grief for the Markells. One of those things was learning that Wendy had changed the boy's last name from Markell to Adelson. Her excuse was that she was concerned for the safety of the kids. I was shocked. I was angry. They just want to wipe the Markell family off the, off the earth. We don't exist. So the Adelsons are still running their dentistry practice in South Florida. They're probably living their lives down there. The children are growing up. They have adamantly denied any connection to the homicide or any involvement. It appears that the Adelsons get what they wanted. Wendy finds a law job in Miami. She enrolls her sons in school. She even makes time to take a podcasting class where she lays bare her feelings about her ex-husband, Dan Markell. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. 
She makes this joke in the podcast that she doesn't know how to refer to Dan. I don't know whether to call him my ex-late spouse or my late ex-spouse. Except that late ex-spouse sounds like late ex-spouse. For Dan Markell's survivors, of course, it didn't play well. It feels sacrilegious these days, even to suggest something less than heroic about my late ex-husband because he was murdered. I don't think she set out to disparage Danny so much as she, you know, was reflecting honestly on what the experience was like for her. Behind the scenes, Tallahassee police are homing in on who was driving that green Prius away from the crime scene. Through meticulous police work, they traced the car to a rental lot in Miami. And when they went and looked at who signed for the car to be rented, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, Sigfredo signed it that he was the brother of Luis Rivera. Sigfredo Garcia was a low-level criminal, had some drug arrests down in Miami. Luis Rivera, however... Uh, more of a hardened more, criminal. More hardened criminal involved in a lot of gang activity. Luis was a, an acknowledged member of the Latin Kings. He was a crone. He was a, a big deal in the Latin Kings. They rented it in their names, with their phone numbers, with a sun pass. They had their phones on while they were driving up there. Essentially, they just wrote a map for the cops. Investigators were able to later use cell phone tower pings to show when phone calls were made from Sigfredo Garcia. They placed Garcia near Dan Markell's neighborhood at about the time of the homicide using the cell phone data. We also have the ATM video where on the day of the homicide, the two killers are seen driving through an ATM in that Pine Mica Prius. The police, they had a substantial amount of information to begin collecting a warrant to, to arrest these guys. Police think they figured out who committed the murder and how they did it, but they're left with the question of why. Why would someone commit this crime? Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera didn't even know Dan Marco. They discover that there is a link and there's a, a, a mysterious woman who will be connected to this case. In what way are the alleged killers linked to the Adelsons? Through Catherine Magbanua. And who is she? She is Garcia's child's mother. Uh huh. And she is also the former girlfriend of Charlie Adelson. How long were she and Charlie together? I think they were together for quite some time before the homicide. Katie becomes this conduit, this, this connection point between the Adelsons and Dan Markell's murder. Absent her, you have nothing that links any of these people directly. Investigators start to form a picture of a complicated web involving two accused hitmen, a female companion, and the brother of Dan Markell's estranged ex-wife. As police try to piece this puzzle together, they start by building a timeline of the suspect's actions. And that means looking at their phone records. And once you get that phone you think is involved, then you get a pen register. Who'd they call? Katie Meg Bonawa, the intermediary. And then they get her phone. Who's she calling the day of the crime? Charlie Adelson. So investigators set out to follow the money. So the strategy would be to work yourself to the money man, to the, the heart of the conspiracy. Katie was the alleged facilitator. Investigators discover that in the months after the murder, Katie Magbanua makes some large cash deposits and also receives checks from the Adelson Institute. She was collecting checks from the dentistry. Uh, you know, it was not necessarily clear what she was doing for her, the payment there. And Katie buys a luxury car from the Adelsons for below sticker price. When you dig a little bit deeper into the various ways that Katie may have been compensated, one way it is through breast augmentation surgery. Although there's no direct paper trail, investigators suggest Charlie Adelson may have helped pay for her procedure. The allegation is that Katie may have enhanced her physique on the Adelson's dime. So cars, surgery, 
cash, and then a job that wasn't really a job. Who launched the conspiracy? Whose idea was it in the first place? The cops felt it was Charlie Hamilton's, but they still can't get to him. You've got the circumstantial evidence of Charlie and Katie uh, being involved in this, but uh, what they're going to need is somebody who's going to tell them exactly what happened, probably a jailhouse snitch. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. When it came to identifying possible suspects who might want Dan Markell dead, detectives felt compelled to circle back to that startling statement Wendy made to them early in the investigation. My brother, um, the one his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to, he makes a lot of jokes in bad taste, and it was a joke he made. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman, and it was cheaper to get you this TV, so instead I got you this TV. <laughs> But Wendy's former boyfriend, Jeff Lacasse, told police that when she related the account to him, there was nothing funny about it. She told me that Charlie had looked into having Danny killed in the summer of 2013. She meant it dead serious. I could just say, I would be investigating Charlie Hales. Now, I don't know if he did this. If you're looking at somebody, don't miss him. 
With the Adelsons firmly on their radar, investigators in South Florida now put the family under surveillance. Police need more information on the Adelsons. They want to see if they can prove this conspiracy. But because there is no hard evidence directly linking the Adelsons to Dan's murder, investigators come up with an audacious plan to confront Donna Adelson outside her luxury condo building in Miami Beach. She's got sunglasses on, she's got a black top body bag, and her hair is pulled back in a movie They decided to do something called a bump, which is what it sounds like. Let's see if what we can shake loose. Donna Adelson is approached on the street by a man she's never seen before. This person turns out to be an undercover FBI agent. Excuse me, this is Adelson? How you doing? Just want to give you this. Um, oh, listen. You. <laughs> You're scary. No, don't be scared. And he says that he was uh, the brother of one of the assailants and that uh, they needed something a little extra to take care of. He helped your family with this problem you guys had up north. He's going through some rough times. The undercover detective says that I want $5,000 for you to help my family. So we want to make sure that you take care of what he's going through the way you're taking care of Katie and Susa. I don't Well, this will explain it. Thank you. He hands her a piece of paper that has a press release of Dan's murder on it, and it has a phone number for her to call to make that transaction with the money. And Donna eventually calls the guy. Hello? I, I have to tell you, I mean, this is important. I, I have been so stressed out because I don't know your friend who is in jail. I never met him. Let's stop around, OK? You know who Katie is. And you know that Katie has somebody that knows Tato, and they took care of a problem for you people. You talk to the right people, you talk to people, you make this 5K come to me. That's all I need. Just do it and get it to me. I'll call you Bye. back. When Donna called her son, Charlie, it led to a cryptic conversation. I got some, I got some paperwork hand delivered to me. Does it involve me or other people? Well, Probably both of us. You probably have a general idea what I'm talking about. All right. So let's let's just find some time to talk to each other. She doesn't use the words murder or Dan Markell. She just refers to it as you know about it. We'll talk later. It may have to do with the two of us. The string of calls went Donna to Charlie, then Charlie to to Katie. It's either somebody's pulling your bones. Somebody is just harassing you, or somebody's trying to get something out of you. When they do catch the person, they're going to be asking him lots of questions about who Katie is. All I'm saying is find out who the f it is and tell them to stop playing their games. I don't know who you have to talk to, but it's it needs to be nipped in the bud. So you don't think that that f scares the f out of me? Like somebody f saying my name out loud or whatever, well, whatever. If okay, someone's messing with you, they're messing with me. So what I'm saying is. Find out who the f no, where the is. F word. While there's no confession on tape, police prepare arrest warrants for the alleged hitmen, Katie Magbanua and Charlie Adelson. But at this point, prosecutors are only ready to pull the trigger on charging two of them. One of the men accused of killing FSU law professor Dan Markell is now behind bars. On May 25th, 2016, the news breaks in Tallahassee of Sigfredo Garcia's arrest for the murder of Dan Markell. Soon after, Luis Rivera is also charged for the murder. We can provide additional information regarding this investigation. Just eight days later, the police released the probable cause affidavit for Sigfredo Garcia. In it, investigators allege his involvement in this murder stemmed from the desperate desire of the Adelson family to relocate Wendy and the children to South Florida. They are mentioned in this probable cause affidavit. They are the only connection between Sigfredo Garcia and Dan Markell. Later, the Adelson family released a statement saying there's been a lot of unsupported speculation that the Adelsons had something to do with the murder. That speculation is categorically false. To be clear, none of the Adelsons, Wendy, her brother Charlie, or their parents Donna and Harvey had anything to do with Dan's murder. 
was all over the news. So there's some feeling of, oh, wow. We just pray that those involved have to pay the price for what they've done. Charlie Adelson was approached by one of our 2020 producers and asked about his alleged involvement in the murder plot. Dr. Adelson? Yeah. Were you involved in a plot to kill your brother-in-law, Dan Markell? Before the shooting, did you ever discuss hiring a hitman? To the frustration of Dan's friends, months go by with no further arrests. There is definitely a growing sense of frustration, wondering how the people who had been hired to commit this act were all in jail, but the people who had allegedly hired them were not. Then, in October 2016, there is a dramatic breakthrough. Prosecutors announce a plea deal with Luis Rivera. They say he's ready to reveal how he says Dan Markell was killed. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. <gasps> Our winner of Crux 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. You saw me swear or affirm at the evidence you are about to give me is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. In October 2016, Louis Rivera really broke open the case. He confesses. He showed you a picture of Markel. Markel. And said, y'all were gonna go kill him. Mm -hmm. Rivera says they've already been given $5,000 in traveling expenses from a mysterious person that Garcia would only refer to as the lady. I asked him why you want to kill this guy, because the lady 
once or two kids back. The Rivera plea deal was important because although he was a gang member and part of this murder, everything he said was corroborated by the other evidence. Went to Marquez's house. I see it jumps out. He goes around the car where he's driving. Shot him twice. Got in the car. He left. He calls Katie. We had dumped the gun. And then he called her. And he said, everything is it's done. Make sure you have my money. I'm on my way. Once Luis Rivera starts talking and gives all of this information to police, they now have enough to bring down their next suspect, Catherine McBanawa. Police in Florida arresting a single mom, accusing her of arranging the killing of a prominent Florida state law professor. She was arrested and was offered full immunity. Get out of jail for a card. And she turned it down. After Katie was arrested, Charlie's anxiety just spiked 100%. June Umchinda was dating Charlie at the time of Katie's arrest. Once Katie got arrested, he would tell me like how horrible it would be in prison. Like they're getting food from a tray and it's like isolation and this is a murder case, so it would be for life. While June says Charlie is sweating it out, in September of 2019, his previous girlfriend, Katie Magbanua, goes on trial. It's a high-profile case that's garnering attention across the world. Everybody be seated, please. It was a big deal that this was going to trial five years after Dan Markell's murder. Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McVanawa are tried together. We'll start with the state of Florida. Wendy Adelson had a problem, and her problem was named Dan Markell. And the solution to that problem was McVanawa, Rivera, and Garcia to execute Mr. Markell in cold blood. Though prosecutors are bringing this trial against Sinfredo Garcia and Catherine McBanawa, they spent a lot of time during their case pointing the finger at Charlie Adelson. As the prosecution calls its witnesses, one of them causes jaws to drop in the courtroom. It's Wendy Adelson testifying under a limited immunity agreement about the bad blood between her family and Dan Markell. She fought tooth and nail against testifying. I'm gonna show you dates exhibit 36. Is that a photograph of you and Catherine McDonald at the beach? With her friend, yeah. And did you say how you know Ms. McDonald? I, she was dating my brother. Is it fair to say that your brother is very protective of you? I think that's fair to say. Did he ever joke about hiring a hitman? He did make that joke. But the prosecution's star witness is convicted killer Luis Rivera, testifying as part of his plea deal for a reduced sentence. All right, so Garcia hired you to do a murder, didn't he? Yes, ma'am. And who hired him? The um, Addison family. Who gave you the money? Garcia. All right, and tell us about the money. How was it packaged? Money, a hundred. It was stapled. Stapled? A thousand dollars stapled, each, each one of them. When Charlie's girlfriend, June, takes the stand, she describes the curious way he stashes his cash. In fact, you said that the money was stapled into stacks of $100 bills, didn't you? Um, they were hundreds, yes. And okay. I don't know if they were stacks, but there was a staple on it. I thought it was so odd. Why do you have a staple in your money? Gianna, at this time, the defense calls Captain McDonald to the time. Katie took the stand in her own defense. Did you have anything to do with the murder of Dan Markell? No, ma'am. Did you get the father of your children, Mr. Garcia, to commit a murder on behalf of Mr. Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. Based on everything you've seen, do you think Charlie was involved in this? Yes. At the end of this trial, the jury believed Luis Rivera and his testimony for the prosecution that Sigfredo Garcia was involved in Dan Markell's murder. We, the jury, find as follows as count one, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. But as for Katie McBanawa, it was a hung jury. As to Ms. McBanawa, I will declare this case mistried. 
I'm certainly happy with the outcome for Mr. Garcia and hope we can have a similar one for Ms. Magdanawa, whether it be today or in the future. For Katie, that future came two and a half years later when she is retried on largely the same evidence. She again testifies that she had nothing to do with the murder and once again points to Charlie as the culprit. Do you believe that he should be prosecuted for his involvement in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. OK. She said that she believes he's guilty and that she had nothing to do with it. So this time, though, it did not seem to sway the jury in the way that it did the first time. Uh, in the state of Florida versus Catherine Magbanawa, on count one, which is first degree murder, you have been found guilty uh, by a jury. You will be adjudicated guilty and you will be sentenced to life in prison. Now prosecutors have three convictions for Dan Markell's murder. And it turns out in the time between Katie's two trials, there was another huge development. This one involving Charlie Adelson. According to authorities, newly enhanced audio from the FBI exposed details from a secret meeting between Katie and Charlie back in 2016. Here's a guy who had all the swagger in the world, who was sort of daring police to come after him. And Charlie's words might just come back to haunt him. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. There's something wrong here. All I could see was the torso and the feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. At some point, there will be more victims. We were against the clock. Find that evidence and bring them to justice. We hunt humans as prey. I've never saw that kind of evil before. Just the devil incarnate. It's like a cat and mouse game. I know it's him. That just scared everybody. You guys gotta hurry. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. Send a few cold chills down my spine. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime at Blood Mountain. Streaming only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. In April of 2016, investigators secretly record a meeting between Charlie Adelson and Katie McVanua at a South Florida strip mall. It was so noisy inside, it was hard to make heads or tails of what was being said. But then, six years later, the FBI is able to enhance that audio, and for prosecutors, it's a game changer. The thing that sealed the deal for Charlie Adelson was the Dolce Vita recordings. He's saying, if I thought they had enough evidence, I'd be at the airport, suggesting that he would skip town if he thought there was more evidence out there against him. A grand jury has now indicted Charlie Adelson in Markel's death. It was unbelievable to hear. It was relief because it's taken so long. I want the people that are involved to pay the price. Adelson is charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. He pleads not guilty to all charges. On October 23rd, Charlie goes on trial. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The attorneys are going to present their opening statements. Prosecution tells the jury that Donna Adelson turned to her son, Charlie, to help her get Wendy and the kids back to South Florida. This defendant carried out his plan to hire a hitman to kill Ann Markell. He conspired and he solicited Catherine McManua to get this murder done. The state's case against Charlie Adelson is a case of assumptions. It's a case of guesses. During his opening statement, defense attorney Daniel Rashbaum stuns the courtroom by saying Charlie Adelson wasn't the mastermind of the murder plot. He was the victim. Rashbaum tells the jury that his client was being extorted by the killers for about $330,000 after Markel's murder. You will learn that Charlie Adelson was told if he didn't pay within the next 48 hours, he or one of his family members would be next. It was a jaw drop moment. Now, I'm scratching my head thinking, is that going to work? Is that going to fly in this courtroom? The prosecution starts out by calling many of the same witnesses who testified during Katie's trial, including June Umchinda, Charlie's former girlfriend, and Charlie's sister, Wendy Adelson. Wendy testifies she had no idea her family was allegedly being blackmailed by the killers. When did you learn that Catherine Magbanoa was blackmailing your brother for the murder of your ex-husband? Today. Hmm. So he never told you? No. Your brother has known who killed your child's father, and you didn't know. I did not know. The courtroom is buzzing as the prosecution calls a bombshell witness, Katie McBanua. And this time on the stand, Katie does a complete 180. She not only testifies she was in on the murder plot, she also testifies that it was orchestrated by Charlie. She was the one connecting all of this. She reveals that it had been nine months before he was killed that she was approached by Charlie Adelson. He asked me a question. Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Sigfredo. So you knew that the person that was going to be initially harmed was Wendy's husband? Yes, ma'am. Katie also testifies about how she says Charlie directed her to transfer the money to the hitman. And where did you get the money from to do that? From Charlie Adelson. How was the money packaged when you got it? I think you said you got it the next morning. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay. It How was, was it packaged? The money was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag, and then like a grocery bag over it. He said he wore a glove so that there's no fingerprints on it. Katie then goes on to strongly deny being part of any blackmail plot against Charlie Adelson. Did you ever blackmail Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you ever threaten him in any way? No, ma'am, I did not. But then on cross-examination, Rashbaum goes on the attack. They have to poke holes in her story and show that she is lying this time by raising the issue of the immunity, the get out of jail free card that she was offered. You were offered to cooperate against Charlie Adelson and the other Adelsons, and you would get to go home to your kids, right? Yes, sir. You still didn't cooperate. Still, the deal was still open, right? Well, the deal was to give up Charlie. And you couldn't do that? Because in order to give up Charlie, I had to give up the cradle of the father of my children, so I couldn't do that. Again, you lied when you testified that you didn't know anything about the murder of Professor Markell, right? Yes, sir. I told you I lied in my first and second trial to save myself. Oh. Is it true that you were the mastermind behind Professor Markell's murder? No, sir. That was Charlie. With Katie sticking to her guns, there's only one other person who can confirm the details of the alleged extortion plot for the defense, and that's their own client, Charlie Adelson. That jury was on the edge of their seats. That's high stakes. And that's where the rubber meets the road. How do you feel right now? I'm really nervous. Why are you nervous? You know, my whole life depends on it. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crooks 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives and the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news.
A packed courtroom watches as Charlie Adelson takes the stand in his trial for first degree murder. Please raise your right hand. The courtroom is abuzz with the anticipation of what is he going to say. Nine years after that brazen daylight killing of Dan Markell, his former brother-in-law speaks for the first time. How do you feel right now? I'm really nervous. Why are you nervous? My, my whole life depends on it. Dan Markell's whole family was there, his sister and both of his parents. On the other side of the gallery, no support for Charlie Adelson. His father, Harvey, his mother, Donna, they haven't been there at all. With his client facing a potential life sentence, defense attorney Daniel Rashbaum takes a calculated risk putting Charlie Adelson on the stand. Now, do you recall making a joke that buying her a TV was cheaper than hiring a hitman? It was the stupidest thing I ever said in my life. And I, I said it as a complete joke, and it was stupid, but I do that a lot. Did you ever say that joke to Catherine Magbanoa? Yes, I did. Just to be clear, did you ever look into hiring a hitman? No, never. We're leaning in to hear how he is going to pin all of this on Katie. Right out of the gate, Adelson puts it all on his former girlfriend, testifying that the night of Markel's murder, she makes a shocking admission. She said, listen, this is all my fault, but I had no idea anything was going to happen. I spoke in too much detail about your family's personal problems. Charlie Adelson is claiming that Katie told her ex, Secreto Garcia, a secret, that the Adelson family had planned to offer Dan a million dollars to agree to allow his ex-wife to relocate to South Florida after their divorce. Just like my friend killed Dan, and he wants to be paid a third of a million dollars. Incredibly, Charlie Adelson claims that he was told just hours after the murder who killed Dan Markell. That was a big shocker. He testifies that the hitmen wanted in on that million dollars. So they murdered Dan Markell, essentially on spec, the idea being kill now, blackmail Charlie, collect the money later. And I'm like, Katie, I'm not going to be part of paying for a murder. This is insane. And, she, and she's like, look, if you don't pay in 48 hours, they will kill you. That's why Charlie testifies he paid her. And that same night, he gives Katie $138,000 from his safe. Over the months that followed, he admits he paid Katie thousands more and asked his mother, Donna, to put Katie on the payroll at the family dental practice. She said, was well, Katie going to be coming into the office? Is she going to start working for us? And I said, no, she's, she's not. And Charlie claims the police got it all wrong when they heard him on that Dolce Vita tape that he isn't the ringleader, but rather a victim of this scheme. What do they think? They think it was a murder for hire. And that's, what was it? It was a, an extortion. During Charlie's second day on the stand during cross-examination, prosecutor Georgia Kappelman goes right after his claim of extortion. Doesn't blackmail or extortion usually involve the extortionist having some kind of dirt on the victim? I know how this was done to me. I, I know what, I'm just telling you what happened to me. I don't, I'm not an expert in it. And she wants to know, when Charlie's life is being threatened, why didn't he go to the police? So, you knew you'd be believed if you went to the police, right? I didn't, I didn't know I'd be believed, but I, I feared for my life. And what about Katie, Charlie's one-time girlfriend, who he claimed to really care about? You didn't offer to testify in her trial. You let her get convicted and get life in prison, didn't you? I, I thought the truth was going to come out. Ultimately, the prosecution hammers Charlie on the stand for two hours. But he sticks to his narrative that he was a victim extorted by the hitmen and Katie. It was the truth. Closing arguments is that's the last chance you get to speak to that jury. He's got no more chances to try to sell this story. If this was a murder for hire, why was payment not made before? See, because he had no idea it was going to happen. That's the only thing that makes sense. He didn't do it. 
He didn't conspire to do it. He didn't solicit it. In her closing arguments, prosecutor Georgia Kappelman takes the jury back to the motive for the murder. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. The prosecutor says this was all about helping Wendy. Wendy appears to be the weakling of the pack. She needs to be saved by Donna and the defendant. Donna is the overbearing matriarch who nags everyone to death. And this defendant fancied himself the savior of this family. Equal parts black sheep and mama's boy. And she attacks the suggestion that Charlie Adelson is an innocent victim in this murder scheme. Latin King extortion payment plans, hit men that hire themselves. And most unreasonable of all is probably that Charlie Adelson, an arrogant man of extraordinary resources, a prize fighter of verbosity, would just lay down and take it in silence. This might be a good time to remind you that the jury room is not a place to check your common sense. We want you to bring it in there and render a verdict that speaks the truth. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live.
nine years after Dan Markell was brutally murdered in the garage of his Tallahassee home. It's judgment day for his former brother-in-law, Charlie Adelson. After deliberating for just three hours, the jury's verdict is delivered to a packed courtroom. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the indictment, first degree murder. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Charlie Adelson is also found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation to commit murder. He looked devastated, deflated. You just saw Phil Markell let out this big exhale and lean all the way over with his head in his hands. Could you just describe the moment for us? Unbelievable. Joy, happiness. Um, <clears throat> Joy and happiness is a funny thing to say, well, but it's, it's yeah. sort of tinged with this feeling of relief. The relief. It's, it's, it's relief. relief. It's a long time. It's been so long. Charlie Adelson is a convicted murderer. Now the state's going to focus on others who were involved. Is the investigation still going on? Yes. Yes. But as this nearly decade-old case continues, what sometimes gets overlooked is that at the heart of this story are two young boys. These are our memories. After the Adelsons' alleged link to the murder plot was disclosed in 2016, the Markells were cut off from Dan's sons. These boys are missing out on a set of grandparents that have all this warmth and desire to spoil them and be grandparents to them. Ruth told me she despaired of ever seeing her grandkids again. But with the help of Dan's friend, Karen Cyphers, she successfully fought for the passage of a bill known as the Markell Act. It allows grandparents to ask a court to order a visitation if a parent is found responsible for the other parent's death. I know that this bill does not, at this moment, apply to the Markells. Wendy has not been found responsible by a criminal or a civil court. That said, within an hour of the Senate passing the bill, Wendy reached out to Ruth and offered her a visit with the kids. You got to see the kids again. What was that like? I hadn't seen these boys in six years. I had no idea what they looked like. And we were shocked. The kids were smiling. They were warm. And I said, can we give you a hug? And they really responded. It lit a spark of hope that something was going to happen, that we might have more communications with them. The Markell said that the very next day, those hopes they had were dashed when Charlie Adelson was arrested. Since then, they say the relationship with the kids has again become strained. And we just hope and pray that uh, one day things will change. There is still hope. There's always hope. living with that hope. And we should mention that Charlie Adelson is scheduled to be sentenced this coming December. His defense team, David, telling us that they are likely going to appeal his conviction. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Deborah Roberts. And I'm David Muir from all of us here at 2020 and ABC News. Good night. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us on this Black Friday. Our network-wide reporting on the power of water focused on the 2 billion people worldwide without access to clean water and the much-needed solutions. What if you could make water literally out of thin air? Well, the technology already exists and is helping communities around the world to get access to clean water, but can families actually rely on it? ABC's chief meteorologist and managing editor of our climate unit, Ginger Z, filed this in-depth report. Across this desolate, dehydrated land in the Mojave Desert, the first drops of water made out of thin air. A new innovation for a small but now famous community. Their groundwater was poisoned decades ago. What the people who lived around here didn't know was that the water they were drinking, bathing in, and letting their children play in was contaminated with a dangerous chemical, chromium-6. Tell me, what are these stairs? These are my stairs going up to my house. You can mm -hmm. see where all that, that was my house up back here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Roberta Walker. Her name you may not know, but her story you likely do. That's not what our doctor said. He said that, well, that one's got absolutely nothing to do with the other. In the 2000 Hollywood film, Aaron Brockovich. But pg e paid for that doctor. <sighs> this is public code. Roberta was the real-life woman that worked with the real-life Aaron to file lawsuits alleging that California energy giant PG&E contaminated drinking water sources in and around the town of Hinkley, California and nearby Kettleman City with a carcinogenic form of chromium. The company settled the suits, agreeing to pay about $628 million. She takes us back to those memories as she was raising her daughters. Did they have symptoms, the girls, originally? Um, Were they in the nosebleeds? The, yeah, the nosebleeds. My daughter's blood would come out of her eyeballs. Despite the three decades that have passed since that original lawsuit, the dangerous chemicals still haunt this town. That's got to be so upsetting. It, it, it is. You the know, movie we, ended, yeah, the story yeah. doesn't. No, we didn't take, uh, you know, a giant down. All we did was wake him up. You know, and it's just so, so sad that um, people think that we are walking around with $5 million, you know, when we didn't even get a fraction of that. These stairs are all that's left of Roberta's second home, the dream home she built after the movie. We were here up until 2020. We had to move again. And you had to move again because? The plume had moved northwest of PG&E and, um, it hit our land again. You've had to move twice. We were hit by the same, yeah. Because of PG&E's yeah. plume. Same gun, different bullet. Even though PG&E bought most of the homes dotting the now deserted alfalfa farmlands of Hinkley, about 300 people still live here. Largely because Hinkley, as you can imagine, now boasts some of the most affordable land in the state. And that's what's so upsetting because that's where PG&E is still affecting people in other ways, not just 
the contamination, but they didn't buy all the land. So people who live here, who still own land, they can sell it to other people. They're taking advantage of people that can't afford to buy or build anywhere else or even rent anywhere else because this is the cheapest place you can, you can go. Because it's a toxic. Because it's a toxic wasteland. That is what, not my words, those are the words from the assessor's office. But amid this toxic wasteland, down the street from what's left of Roberta's dream home, another home still stands. And what might sound like a pipe dream is becoming reality. Behind us is the first source hydro panel system here in Hinkley, California. Safe drinking water made out of thin air. It's coming out. And I can just drink this right away? Totally. Wow. It's hard for people to conceive of. You can make water from the water in the air. How much? <laughs> Absolutely. So our team of researchers at Arizona State University like 10 years ago tried to say, how can we take the principles of renewable energy and apply it to drinking water? And what they developed was the hydro panel, which uses a clever combination of a special material that absorbs hydrogen and oxygen, as well as a really clever thermodynamic process to get not only energy from the sun, but heat from the sun to make hot air. And that combination allows us to convert the vapor in the air into liquid drinking water without needing any power or water connections at all. You can quite literally, you know, put these on the ground, point them towards the sun and make your own drinking water. It's a fresh way to get safe drinking water in a community that just can't touch the groundwater. This hydro panel relies solely on the sun and the moisture in the air. And then in its base is where it condenses and then it pumps up here. Yeah, the internal water storage tank inside each of these units. So each one of these holds about 60 water bottles worth of water. And again, there's no power plugging these things in anywhere. Right. All right, there's no water connection anywhere. This is a fully off-grid autonomous technology. Hydro panels have brought drinking water to some of the most rural communities, like deep in Navajo Nation, where it is so sparsely populated, it's basically like one person every six miles. About 40% of Navajo families have no running water at all. Many are forced to drive, often for hours, to either gather water or buy it from the store. But the Navajo government contracted the installation of hydro panels on more than 500 homes. There are so many places around the world that could utilize this. We have source panels in over 50 countries globally around the world trying to work with communities to really understand the dynamics to help solve their water problem. But as you said, right, there's a lot of acute drinking water challenges yeah. that don't allow people to drink what mm -hmm. comes out of their tap, and so they have to go buy it in a plastic bottle. Now, a hydro panel system lasts up to 20 years and costs about $4,000 up front. It's about 15 cents, so it's about seven and a half cents a water bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so again, more, more cost effective currently than commercial, commercially available bottled water. But some will say it is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It may be fitting for some cases, but not for others, just like any other, you know, technology. Dr. Yoram Cohen is the director of the Water Technology Research Center at UCLA, and he says depending on where you want to build the hydro panels will determine the success. The key issue is how much would it cost? One has to think about it seriously, whether that's a sustainable solution, because if you are in an area where you have no water whatsoever, the question is, why would you want to actually develop residential? I think for hydro panels, it will produce somewhere between maybe three liters to five liters per day. A human being requires two liters a day, and you have to look at the cost. How much are you paying for a liter of water? miles east of water-starved Hinkley. Hey. It's wonderful to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I'm Ginger. <laughs> Maria. Uh, nice to see you. Hi. Maria Monroy welcomes the innovation because it's all about comfort and having safe water for her family to drink. There you go. OK. Maria and her family have been understandably weary of their water. <laughs> <laughs> and they still use the tap for cleaning and showering. But like millions of Americans, they rely on bottled water. There you go. She says after they saw what happened in neighboring Hinkley, her family chooses to spend money on bottled water, and it's a huge expense. How far do you have to go to get bottled um, water? It's like 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah, probably 30 minutes. <laughs> so when what sounded like a miracle showed up, they said, 
please. Kind of a wild concept. Yes. Especially in the desert. Yes, where it, we need it. <laughs> yeah. What's your hope for these and for like, do you imagine that you would see them in more places, more properties? You know what? Yes, hopefully other people do want to get them in their properties and be able to rely on it. The problems don't end at Hinkley. From Jackson, Mississippi to Flint, Michigan, there are communities all over the U.S. that can't drink their groundwater, or probably shouldn't. Do you have a lot of hope? You have to have hope, you know, you have to. You have to pray and have hope that there's gonna be change in this world and that somebody somewhere, somehow is gonna figure out a way of cleaning up this land, you know, with the water, the air, everything. But will I see it in my time? You know, I don't think so, <laughs> but I hope that it will happen for my kids and my grandkids. Our thanks to Ginger for that. A small, predominantly black area of Alabama called Shiloh is repeatedly plagued by flooding, which residents say is due to the construction of a nearby highway. The issue is impacting residents whose families have lived there for generations and who say they now find themselves in difficult conditions. They say it's the direct result of a state inflicting what on its face looks like what other communities have experienced for decades, environmental injustice. ABC's Steve Osinsami brings you the story of those residents as they call out for help. Rain will be ending from north to south. You just can't see much. I mean, it's so frustrating. You've got these big storms in the middle of the night. You just can't see much at all. Anytime there's any rain in the weather forecast for Southern Alabama. These are flood advisories in effect. They don't sleep well at night along this small section of US Highway 84. This started after we had the road put in. It took time for them to build up the road and as they built up, then more water came down. That's bad. You let a storm come less than one hour, that place is saturated with water. The family of Timothy Williams and many of the other black Americans here have owned their slice of heaven near the Florida Georgia line for more than 150 years. We pray that you'll bless the food, take out any offense, and that it be good for the nation of our body. In your name we pray, amen. amen. They are rare people in America, a couple dozen black landowners who've been able to pass down a small piece of generational wealth to their children. They live in a historic rural community, several hundred acres large, just east of the city of Elba, a place they call Shiloh, a name that comes from the Hebrew Bible. And when the floodgates of the sky break open, like it says in the scriptures, they say it threatens all they have. All right, we're going to see how the water's rolling down from the highway, the uh, state highway. We saw for ourselves how only 15 minutes of heavy rain was enough to bring inches of water right up to their doorsteps on their small stretch of the highway where everyone is African-American. They say that the water brings frogs and poisonous snakes like they've never seen here before. Fighting the water is expensive. Their inheritance is drowning. They put us in a hole. We were never in, in a hole situation. But they took the highway and they elevated it and then forced all the water onto us. That's, I mean, I mean, that's just plain Jane, as I say, you know, what they did. Is this what you might call environmental racism? Yes, sir. For the good people of Alabama, the new miles of concrete were supposed to be a blessing. But here in Shiloh, they say that replacing their old dirt road has felt more like a curse. US 84 was first built in 1926, and back then it only stretched from Georgia to Alabama. Today, it runs as far west as New Mexico, and the last pieces of construction were these new lanes running 100 miles that passed through southern Alabama and opened for traffic here over the last several years. But even before the road crews in Alabama had finished their work, our investigation found electronic diaries, sometimes weekly notes from state employees, 
showing that they were already getting complaints from the families in Shiloh along a half-mile stretch of the freeway. And they were telling them that the runoff from the new road was flooding them out. Willie Horstead, an Army veteran, was one of the landowners who tried to get them to listen. I feel like why they're not concerned because the shoe is not on their foot, it's on mine. My home would want to be destroyed, not there. Otis Andrews, a grandfather, says that the regular flooding is shifting his home's foundation and putting cracks in his walls. Ain't that one over the door. That, that's one right there. And that one right there, too, see? They all admit that the state made the early designs of the new highway readily available, but say it was hard to see at the time how these large drains on paper would look like this in real life. In some cases, pointing the runoff from the highway directly at their houses. And they say they couldn't have known that this large retention pond so close to their homes that was meant to hold the water would regularly overflow. They're now begging for help from investigators at the Federal Highway Administration who answered their calls and are seen here, coming out to look for themselves last winter. They went back to Washington and opened a civil rights investigation. A lot of this property here are Caucasian people, which is white people on these properties. The state fixed it where their properties wouldn't flood. But when it only got to the shallow community, they flooded us. From the sky, it's easy to see what he means, how all the drains on this stretch of the freeway empty out near homes in Shiloh. We talked with county officials who believe this is what happened. They say the state was trying to protect the highway from a major flood, putting Shiloh in a bowl. They had to raise it almost 16 feet of what they were planning because we had a flooding event just before they're building or as they're building the highway in 2015. Now they're in a bowl because you got a 18-foot uh, highway over here, and they're down here. You guys never used to flood? Never, never. Not ever? Ever. Uh, as a little boy coming to that community, my grandmother lived there. I used to farm out there with her, the gardens and everything. You feel they're trying to push you out? I mean, it's no doubt. This is racism. There's no other way around it. And then they don't even want to correct the problem, you know? We've asked them to correct it. No, you can't do it. You just got to live with it. We've been working closely with the data team at our ABC-owned television stations who found that the Williams family property, which includes this restaurant, should normally only have a 4% chance of flooding at least once a year. Our home is going to be sunk uh, because the waters from here is already sinking the house. But Williams says that since the new highway, his home seems to flood practically every time it rains. And according to the weather data, the area has seen heavy rains more than 150 times since March of 2019. Why is it hard for folks on the black side of the street? Because we're losing, excuse me. Whew. We're, we're, we're losing everything. Whew. Every time I talk about it, We've taken our savings and, and um, to fix everything, and we don't have any more money. Whew. And um, this wasn't the plan, you know? Um, I don't know what else to do, you know? Our inheritance is is just being washed away. And it's not just black families in Alabama. Federal highway officials have looked into similar complaints from Native American, Hispanic, and other communities of color in several other states. So this is your hometown? Uh, yeah, I was born in Elba. In Alabama, they're getting help from a hometown hero. Professor Robert Bullard helped coin the phrase environmental racism in the 18 books he's written over the last 40 years. And he's helping them fight something that we uncovered in this investigation. These are agreements signed three years ago between the state and the homeowners that Dr. Bullard says are highway robbery because the payments are small. Some of the families were afraid to talk to us because of these documents, worried the state would ask for the money back. 
But as we have discovered, these settlements don't even require the state to do anything about the flooding. Settlements should mean that you have resolved something. The flooding is not resolved. Three of the neighbors who say they needed the money to fix their homes signed this, what's called a restrictive covenant and agreement, and no one was paid more than $5,000. They agreed to forever discharge any and all claims against the state of Alabama and agreed that both the current and future owners can no longer take action against the state, no matter how much worse the flooding gets. In a statement to ABC News, the Alabama Department of Transportation says that we do not believe any unfair treatment has occurred regarding the Shiloh community and certainly no discrimination against anyone. And they say they put the restrictive covenants in each of the deals because the state maintains that it has not increased the volume of stormwater runoff being placed on the Shiloh community. But they also tell us that they just hired a consultant to look into improving the way the drains move the water. Is there any doubt in your mind that uh -huh. if you were a white landowner, uh -huh. that you would be getting more cooperation, more results, different treatment? Oh, yes. They would have came quick like they did the daycare. Rhonda Robinson and her mother, Peggy Carpenter, say that the settlements the black family signed are too low and they would know. They own this daycare a few miles west of Shiloh on this same stretch of the new highway that also started flooding. The loss of their family business broke their hearts. But in their case, the state gave them $165,000, buying a portion of the land two and a half years ago. Like the black families down the road, they too can no longer file future claims against the state. Mm, I can't imagine, I fell for them because the fight was hard. That's like a drop a penny in a bucket. I'm still floored over that. That's just heartbreaking. I'm sorry. This, this happens quite frequently, where the government can uh, take advantage of, of underserved populations or unsophisticated parties. Blake Hudson is a dean and a property law professor at Sanford University outside Birmingham and says he can relate to the struggles of Shiloh. He got into law after the state built a new highway and took a portion of his family's farm, but paid his grandfather less than their neighbors. I have a feeling if the government had come to these people and said, this water will go into your house, they wouldn't have taken the $4,800. County officials we met are now trying to find money to help the state redirect the water. And they say something needs to be done soon because it's raining more and raining more often. The landowners in Shiloh say that despite it all, they want to hold on to what's theirs. It's black land. Right. And that's something. Yes, sir. We're never going to walk away. We're going to continue to fight. And I do believe somebody's going to hear us. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that. Sam Bankman Freed was able to get billions invested into his burgeoning crypto exchange, and he was eventually convicted of fraud. But while many bought into what Bankman Freed was selling, not everyone was buying in. Enter actor and crypto skeptic Ben McKenzie, who says he saw past the sell. He's now testified before Congress as he sounds the alarm for amateur traders everywhere. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis sat down with a former OC star. You might recognize Ben McKenzie as Ryan Atwood from the OC. Who are you? Whoever you want me to be. Or is James Gordon in the superhero crime drama Gotham? When I was about your age, drunk driver hit our car. Killed my dad. But lately, he's taken on a new role, crypto skeptic. The actor turned author recently published his debut book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud, detailing his investigation into the digital currency and his warning to consumers. I'm sure there are going to be a few people who say, how did that guy from the OC end up writing a book about crypto? Yeah, trust me. I mean, I feel the same way. <laughs> what am I doing here? It's a good question. Uh, I like to say that easy money is about cryptocurrency, but it's, it's really about money and it's about lying. And I know about money from a degree in econ and from making a little bit of it in showbiz, but I know about lying because I'm an actor and I do it for a living. Um, 
<laughs> and so when these cryptocurrencies were calling themselves currencies and all these guys were hawking this stuff, I was initially drawn in, but then I couldn't understand them. And I thought, this seems really sketchy. I just went further and further down and cryptocurrency was everywhere. And some of the most famous people in the world were selling it, but it didn't make sense economically. And if I was right, then it was gonna hurt a lot of people. And uh, I felt like I had a duty to speak out. Mackenzie's interest in the topic started during the pandemic, when he, like many others, found himself with a lot of extra time on his hands. And then he had an epiphany while reading his daughter a bedtime story. I was really debating at that point whether it was worth me speaking up about this. Who am I to call out this supposedly multi-trillion dollar industry? But I'm reading my daughter, The Emperor's New Clothes, and two things stuck with me. The first is the genius of the con is just a it's just an appeal to ego. You know, only the smartest people can perceive the imaginary clothes. So adult after adult is tricked into believing the con for the simplest reason of all. They don't want to look stupid. The second thing is the emperor is gallivanting through town naked. It's a child who calls out the lie. The only one brave enough to speak truth is someone who doesn't know he's being brave. He's simply telling the truth. Well, it's hard not to see myself as that child. Who was I to call it out? And yet, maybe I was right. And what a story that would be. Mackenzie teamed up with journalist Jacob Silverman, and the two began their investigation, publishing articles in Slate, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and more, while interviewing some of the biggest names in cryptocurrency, like FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed, now accused of fraud, facing up to 115 years in prison. He has pleaded not guilty. What was that conversation like? Bizarre. We requested an interview. He agreed almost immediately. So we ended up in a Manhattan hotel room uh, in July of last year, well before you know, he was charged with crimes. Um, and a lot of red flags for fraud were popping up. Things didn't add up. And I kept asking him to explain it to me in a way that made sense. And we never got there. It was like punching against air. It was very strange. Um, one of the most surreal hours of my life. How did you feel when you walked away from that conversation? I didn't know what to feel. I felt uneasy. At the time, Sam Bankman-Fried was being called the JP Morgan of crypto. Um, so he was the purported head of this supposedly multi-trillion dollar industry. And yet when I talked to him, I found his answers deeply unsatisfying. And the strangest thing to me was that he wanted me to like him. What gave you that impression that he wanted you to like him? His behavior, the way he would reach out. He would say things like, I want to keep you from reporting on things that won't age well. Mm. Like, I'm going to protect you, mm. lead you the right way. He said to me at one point over DM, I understand that you're skeptical of crypto, but you can't be 100% skeptical. That can't be the right number. Which... I can understand the rationale there, but I didn't quite understand what he was trying to get out of me. He just wants that little piece of doubt. A little room. Mackenzie was eventually invited to testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee at the end of 2022 following the collapse of FTX and just days after Bankman Freed's arrest. The demise of FTX and Alameda represent the most spectacular corporate downfall since Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme imploded in the wake of the great financial crisis. So how do you cram for that? Well, speaking, you only have five minutes. And look, I mean, you know, I had to, <laughs> I'm a performer, so I needed to know what I was gonna say, I needed to hit my marks, and I needed to convey a clean and clear and compelling message. And so I ended up saying, I want the American people to know that although the stories of cryptocurrency are very compelling, the truth is very ugly. In my opinion, the cryptocurrency industry represents the largest Ponzi scheme in history. In fact, by the time the dust settles, crypto may well represent a fraud at least 10 times bigger than Madoff. Did you ever second guess your own thesis? Oh my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> you would have to have a major ego to think that, hey, I think I might have stumbled on the, one of the largest frauds in history, um, but everybody else doesn't seem to think that, but uh, surely I'm right. I mean, yeah, oh, absolutely, I question myself. I mean, I still have to check myself all the time. Um, what's wonderful about the crypto skeptics is that's what we do. We challenge each other. 
Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that. And we still have still much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, they're a massive rock group that's produced hit after hit, creating classics that may never die. We sit down with the duo behind Air Supply. But next, a Ukrainian seven-year-old may have lost her leg in a missile attack, but not her fighting spirit. She and her mother revisit that moment and look at the future hurdles ahead. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, Legends of the Game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Welcome back. Sasha Pascal lost her leg in a missile attack in the ongoing war in Ukraine. But the seven-year-old rhythmic gymnast is continuing to fight and has big dreams for her future. ABC's Britt Clennett has her inspiring story. At this gym in Chornomorsk, southern Ukraine, victories are etched in time. It's a place where gold medals are born, where dedication, hard work and sacrifice is expected. This is seven-year-old Sasha Pascal, one of Ukraine's hopeful young rhythmic gymnasts. She trains every single day. But Russia's brutal war in Ukraine has left Sasha impaired. Tiny, 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 tiny. 
You know, her coordination is really impressive and she's treated exactly the same as all the other girls. Are you tired now? No. You're not tired. Do you ever feel like your prosthetic leg makes you more tired sometimes? Because you're a superstar. Superstar. What's your dream, Sasha? What do you want to do? I want to start a Olympic champion, then a trainer. That's a big dream. You can do it. Sasha's determination unwavering, despite being one of countless children harmed in this war. This is the moment the missile strikes their seaside home. Sasha and her mother Maria take me there. This is the house. Sasha was on the third floor at the time. You can see why. They're so happy that she came down just in time. You're just here? Yeah. Вот тут вот, вот прямо здесь вот. Я ее позвала, мы собирались идти на пляж, и она вот спустилась, говорит, мама, ну что, идем? Я говорю, ну идем. Мы вот так вот повернулись с ней, и вот и уже почувствовали на себе вот у меня вот как волосы от удара и стекла вот стекла вот эти все полетели в спину. Потому что она прям передо мной она так взлетела, она, ну она маленькая. Взлетела? Да. Да и упала. На воздух? Сюда вот. Да. Как летающая э, птица? Птица. Полностью кости были. Да, здесь была поврежденная, головка была полностью поврежденная. As a mom, you must have been horrified and, and terrified that the, of the worst. Ну, говорила спасибо, что она осталась жива, потому что при таком ударе остаться живы это просто вот как в рубашке родились. What's it like being here again? Аж страшно сюда приходить. О, очень страшно. Потому что сразу мысли, вот как мы ее доставали, как мы ее везли в больницу, вот эта нога, рука, ну, очень, очень тяжело, очень. Sasha in intensive care for two weeks. Half a year later, she was back in gym training. Then she entered her first post-trauma competition and won it. Weeks later, she won again. Sasha swims. And ballroom dances. This strong little girl even capturing the attention of Vogue and winning hearts at the highest levels, like Ukrainian First Lady Elena Zelenska. I know, I know you've met yeah. her before. and She's amazing. She's incredible. I just want you to show you a video of, of when we saw her. This is Sasha. Yeah. <laughs> we just couldn't believe she, it. You know, she's backflipping back and, and jumping around like any of the other girls. They look the same. You know, I, I guess my question is, kids are very resilient. Yeah. The, we don't know the impacts that the war is going to have later on. Ну, на жаль, таких дітей уже багато. Саші пощастило. У неї є люблюча родина. В неї є оточення, яке її підтримує. В неї є можливості розвиватися, жити далі. Саша still has medical hurdles to clear. She's constantly outgrowing her prosthetic leg. 
but back on the beach, yards away from where she nearly lost her life. Sasha looks ahead. Our thanks to Brit for that. We still have much more to get to coming up. We're with a group of women empowering one another through their disability as we show you what it's like to be what they call a boundless roulette. But next, for more than 40 years, this duo has been serenading lovers with some of your favorite ballads of the 80s. We sit down with rock legends Air Supply to talk about how their hits have stood the test of time. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes fall up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Now to a staple of 80s rock. They've put out some of our favorite love ballads. But the hits Air Supply and Australian Duo are known for have stood the test of time. Now the band spends most of their time touring. Decade after decade after decade. Our Phil Lipoff sat down with the legendary pair to talk about the secret to longevity in tonight's Prime Playlist. Big, bold, beautiful love songs that stand the test of time. Few groups have done it better than Air Supply. From their hits, All Out of Love, and Lost in Love, to every love song in between.
Graham Russell and Russell Hitchcock have been recording huge hits and touring the world for almost 50 years. We've toured every year except COVID year f for since 1976. That's amazing. Without a stop. On this night in Red Bank, New Jersey, we watched as the audience sang every word. Then we sat down with the legendary duo. Thank you both for doing this. We started with how they met in 1975, both in the same production of Jesus Christ Superstar in Australia. Neither of us had any musical background or any training of any kind. But when we met, we knew something was going on because we'd sing between shows in Superstar, and people would come by and go, wow, you guys sound amazing. We went on tour the next day after Superstar closed. We had a number one record in Australia. Their self-titled debut album, it happened that fast, and just a year later, they were on a whirlwind tour opening for Rod Stewart. But when the tour ended... We got back to Australia, we couldn't get arrested, you know. <laughs> we, uh, we had seven in the band, I think. We were getting offered $200 a night to play. After touring with Rod Stewart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were, we were no, no, nowhere, nothing. I went and stayed with my sister in Melbourne and, and got work doing jingles here and there. Um, and then Graham said he'd written some songs, why don't you come to Adelaide? And one of those songs was Lost in Love. And I went, that's a monster mm, right yeah. there. And it was. Their 1980 release, Lost in Love, changed everything for the British-Australian rock group, certified double platinum in the US. From the title track to All Out of Love and Every Woman in the World. After that, there was no looking back. The next year, they dropped The One That You Love with hits like Here I Am. Here I Am. Three more albums in the 80s, another four in the 90s, and three releases so far in the 2000s. There are bands that last, if, if they have 15 or 20 years, that's a successful career. Yeah, yeah. You guys are now on 47. You're mm. selling out shows. You're mm. doing two a week, mm. all year long, mm. still. We're valid in 2023, just mm. as much as we were in 1976. Making love out of nothing at all, even the nights mm. are better, yeah, yeah. every woman in the world, mm. the list goes on and on. They cross decades because as you were writing love mm. songs mm. On, on a guitar with piano and your voices yeah. that are as valid as you say today, as relevant yeah. today as they, as they would be then. Mm. Was there was that conscious? Was that a conscious decision? Or was that just what, how you were writing and singing? It's just the, the way I, I wrote songs and still do. Uh, we, uh, to have a conscious decision for us was very rare. When we made our first record, uh, which was Love Another Bruise, Love Another Bruise. We didn't have a plan. We, well, we really didn't know what we were doing. We just knew that we both loved this song. And when Russell went in to sing it, uh, everything changed because suddenly it was, you know, beautiful song, then Russell just popped it out at the end and he just happened to jump up the octave and sing it higher because he could do that. And, and in the studio, everybody went, whoa, that's mm. it. So suddenly our sound was created. And when you write the kind of moving lyrics that Graham does, and sing them the way Russell does. The songs become a part of fans' lives, especially during deeply personal moments. We had a young guy at, at a show, and he said, I just came out to my dad, and he's disowned me. And uh, I was actually thinking about killing myself. Mm. And I got put on one of your records or something, and I thought, whoa, you know, this is not worth any of this. You go, whoa, this is... This is far beyond somebody paying 20 bucks for a concert and going home with somebody saying, oh, that was great. Mm. You know, actually changed somebody's lives. Saved. Saved. In there that you case, go. Yeah, saved yeah. somebody's yeah. life. So we don't take that for granted. And that is at the core of Air Supply, taking nothing for granted and reaching as many fans as possible. Helping them do that on tour, an amazing group of musicians building on those gigantic love songs. With guitar solos.
hard-hitting drums, a solid bass line, and a charismatic pianist keeping it all together. We just love to play, and, you know, we love stepping on stage and seeing people's face, faces light up. I mean, you can't buy that. You also can't buy the kind of support they get from their wives. Russell married to his wife, Carrie. Graham first met Jody on the set of their music video for Making Love Out of Nothing at All. She was cast as his love interest. They later married. Even the nights are better Now that we're here together now in their 70s, the legends are not slowing down in the middle of yet another world tour. You guys are rock stars. Yeah, we've also considered ourselves always a touring rock and roll band because we don't sit home for any length of time. We've done over 5,300 shows in our career. And no slowing down, we're doing 100 plus shows no, a year. Yeah. No, we're doing 120. Our thanks to Phil for that. And there's still much more ahead here on Prime tonight, a shared love of dance and serving the community. We take you inside the world of the Rolettes. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day. On the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Many Americans with disabilities say they are not just living with, but rather thriving with their disability. We bring you one group coming together to empower women in wheelchairs nationwide through a shared love of dance and community as they give back to others and encourage them to live their best life every chance they get. Let's take it from the beginning. Here we go. Five. We are women with disabilities, and we are strong, and we're here. Up, down, up, down. And we are very talented. You can do better than that. Five, six, seven, go. 
I'm Chelsea Hill. I'm the founder of Rolettes, and we are at our yearly Rolettes experience. A white go to. I had dreams of it being big, and I had a dream of seeing a bunch of women in wheelchairs dancing in a ballroom. And so being able to have our 11th year here and looking out on stage and seeing all these amazing women just dancing, it's, it's really surreal. My name's Marissa. I'm 28 years old and I am from New Jersey. The Rolettes experience brought me to LA. I've never been surrounded by so many empowered women, empowering other women. And just the connectivity and the sisterhood here is what really resonated with me. Are you guys ready? All the dancers on the stage ready? The Rolettes Experience is a women empowerment weekend for women and children with disabilities. Uh, they come in from all over the world and we have dance classes, makeup seminar, a pool party, a, a disco party, and so much more. I started purely because I wanted to dance and I wanted to dance with other girls that were literally just like me. Your wheels are so cool, it just adds to it. Thank you. It's really a community that we started that kind of was started, I guess, by accident. We didn't realize how big it was gonna get, but we don't always like hoped for it to be like this. All year round we're planning this and then to be able to see everybody in person, it's really, it's really special. I was a senior in high school and I was out at a party with friends and uh, we were all drinking. I had work the next morning and so I ran out to the first car I saw and my driver had been drinking. Uh, we ended up hitting a tree head on and I suffered a spinal cord injury at the age of 17. So I was classified as disabled and basically that I was gonna shut the curtains and not do anything with my life. And you know, that's why I reached out to people online because I was like, I want so much more for my life and I didn't know anybody with a disability at the time. My journey has kind of been complicated. I don't have an injury. I do have a chronic illness. I started to slowly lose my mobility. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I've been in pain most of my life. Three and four. Being here, I feel like I am so confident now. I have a one, two. And I can confidently say that I'm living my best life as a wheelchair user. Oh my God, you guys look beautiful. Oh. I genuinely really want, and we want, Rolex Experience to be a place for everybody, for all disabilities, and for people to come in and be able to find community and sisterhood and feel like Rolex Experience is their home. We want girls to come in and feel sexy and powerful and, and strong and tap into something that they don't get to usually tap into. And that, to me, is, is such a beautiful thing to witness because these girls come in and they're so shy and timid in the beginning of the weekend. And then by the last dance class, they are transformed into a different person. Someone that was always inside of them, but it takes people and takes a certain thing to bring that out in them. I'm not bound to this chair, I'm boundless. And this chair is, is my freedom. I don't do this alone. You want to go over accounts real quick? We have an Easily. entire team that helps put on this entire production, and I could not do what I do and be a mom without all of the people that are supporting not only me, but this entire movement. If there's even a thought about, hmm, should I go to the Rolettes experience? That's your answer. If you're thinking about it, that means you should come because this is just the, the best and most empowering experience I, I've ever had and I feel at home in my body thanks to the roulettes and thanks to Chelsea. Could all use a bit of inspiration. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live, is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Thank you.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, the baby that riveted the nation. Baby Holly found 40 years later. Tonight here, my exclusive interview with her and what happened. 2020 starts right now. This is the story of a young family, their identities lost and then suddenly found again. A mystery that would defy belief. And it all started with this sudden arrival of a baby. I heard a knock at the back door. There were two ladies. They looked like they just walked right out of the Bible. I had never seen anybody like that in my whole life. They said, we need somebody to take care of a baby. You know, she, it was, she was a gift from God. It's like a mystery in a mystery in a mystery. This is just one of several stunning turns in this story. There would be another in the woods of Houston. So it was days before they actually discovered the two bodies, and they were right here in the woods? Both bodies were um, bound. It was a young man and a young woman. They likely knew the people who killed them. The hunt for answers to what really happened in those woods would actually lead investigators across the country and to a second mystery. Yeah, I'm getting chills, too, just talking about it. What happened to this baby? My brain just was on fire. How can a child be missing for 40 years and nobody know where she is? It sounds like a scene from the movie or something, right? All the pieces started to come together. The woman behind the headline, Baby Holly, who made national news, sharing her journey for the first time from lost to found. Holly, it's great to finally meet you. Thank you, David. David Muir reporting. Baby Holly found. The exclusive 2020 event starts right now. This is the story of a young family, their identities lost and then suddenly found again. A mystery that would span decades, it would crisscross states, defy belief, and it all started with this sudden arrival of a baby. I heard a knock at the back door. The 
there were two ladies in white. They looked like they just walked right out of the Bible. I had never seen anybody like that in my whole life, never. One of them was holding a baby, probably about eight or nine months. They said, we need somebody to take care of a baby. It was a shock for sure. But this startling delivery of a baby at the steps of the church is just one of several stunning turns in this story. There would be another major turn thousands of miles away in the woods of Houston. January 6th, it was a sunshiny day, uh, but it was, it was cool. It was very common for our three shepherds to run off through the woods, do their hunting, their barking, their frolicking, whatever they were doing. Me and my friend came back to the house. As we start walking this way, our shepherd comes around the corner and she's got something in her mouth. Well, as she got closer, she dropped that something right in front of us, and it was a human arm. From just above the elbow down to the fingertips. Never imagined that in a, in a million years. I called my parents and told them what had happened. Eventually, the police showed up. So the call comes in January 6th, 1981. Yes, so the police came out, and then the search began in the area. And back then, there wasn't, there wasn't anything here. Houston is 660 square miles. Back in the 80s, it wasn't anywhere near as developed as it is now. You got all hands on deck trying to find where this arm came from. There's nothing out there. This is in the sticks, rural Houston. Not a lot going on on Wallaceville Road. You don't imagine anything like that ever happening. So it was days before they actually discovered the two bodies, and they were right here in the woods? They were. They're about 100 feet from the roadway and about 50 feet from this access road, right pretty much through this path. What did the distance into the woods tell you about what might have happened? Well, the lengths at which they would have had to come back here seem a little odd. Highly vegetated. It's not easily walked. We don't know if they were killed elsewhere and brought to this location or if they were killed at this location. But the mere fact that they're deep into the woods here uh, means there was an effort to get them back yes, here. Yes, absolutely. Investigators start by thinking they're searching for one body. Now suddenly they have the near skeletal remains of two people about 10 to 12 feet apart. What else did they find with these bodies? Both bodies were um, bound and appeared that there were not very many clothes in the area. There was a pair of green shorts found. It was a young man and a young woman, and there was just really very little indication of what had happened. And the medical examiner was able to determine that the female victim had likely died from asphyxiation and that the male victim had likely died from blunt force trauma to the head. When investigators learned from the ME just how brutal their deaths were, what did that say to you about the people who might have done this? It tells me that they likely knew the people who killed them because they were bound, strangled, and blunt force trauma. Those are all really up close and personal ways in which she would kill somebody. The medical examiner in the case uh, is able to determine that the female victim is likely between 15 and 18 years old, the male victim between 17 and 24. Harris County investigators are really scratching their heads. They're able to put together sketches of the pair's reconstructed faces and put those sketches out to the media, but no one came forward. And in 1980 and 1981, the resources for identifying people were, were more limited than they are today. They casted their fingers to try to get fingerprints. You could compare dental records. They did that. They were not able to find any dental records. This medical examiner's investigator talked about the teeth of these victims being in immaculate condition. You would expect maybe that these are people that people would look for, their, their relatives, their loved ones, their friends. 
So no match on the fingerprints. The dental uh, turns up nothing either. There were no IDs on them, n no paperwork, no wallets, nothing else attached to these no, bodies. Absolutely nothing else that could identify these people. If you don't know who the victim is, you can't really complete any investigative steps. They were just basically labeled a John Doe and a Jane Doe. The case just goes on a shelf. They were buried right here in this county cemetery. No headstones, no family paying its respects. Instead, Jane Doe and John Doe marked with a simple, nondescript concrete marker here in this strip of land. They are among the hundreds of anonymous souls that have been buried here through the decades. So many families across this country wondering what happened to their loved ones. But in this case, it was about to take a turn. Forty years of emotions, 40 years of looking. This case would take years to unravel. There was a story there. We just didn't know what it was. And they decide that they are going to figure out who these people are. It was extraordinary hope because DNA technology was new. Right. I picked up the phone and said, I think I just solved this case. It would make national news. This is truly remarkable. A 42-year-old cold case. So many questions. The Lynn and Klaus family have been searching for answers. Their loved ones were found beaten and strangled to death. The shock of it is all finally starting to set in. And the hunt for answers to what really happened in those woods would actually lead investigators across the country and to a second mystery. I'm getting chills just talking about it. What happened to the baby? When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day. On the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is a place to sing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Hit me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone lights. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance some more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. It's haunting to stand here in a field full of unidentified remains, and they were just two of them. Exactly. When you look around just the vastness of the cemetery, and this is, this is one of many. This Jane and John Doe in Harris County, they quickly become two more victims of what experts call the nation's silent mass disaster, remains left unidentified for decades. This is a problem all over the country. In the United States, there are over 14,000 unidentified bodies. They are not just case numbers, they have names. And it's important to possibly restore the names to these people. Back in 1980, 1981, when they couldn't identify these victims, the case remained open, but it was a cold case. I think it's really important to think about when this murder took place. Pre-internet, pre-cell phone. If you had a missing persons case, you're going and putting signs on telephone poles, on bulletin boards, and you don't know what's happening the next county over. Fast forward 30 years. 2011, the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences gets a grant. We've gotten a grant from the federal government to test some of the remains of their most promising cold cases. This case was definitely top of the list because it was two individuals, and it was two young individuals. So someone had to be looking for them. And they actually had to dig up these Jane and John Doe's we took the individuals back to the medical examiner's office. The DNA um, was extracted and analyzed and put into the system. There was extraordinary hope because DNA technology was relatively new. Right. And yet when you take that DNA and you check it against the criminal database, nothing. Nothing. No familial matches at all. So 30 years later, another roadblock. Yes. Remember at the time, they only had criminal databases to search. They didn't have all of these family genealogy databases. So they turned to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for that Jane Doe. Harris County Sheriff's Office had a Jane Doe case of a person who's under the age of 21. They had a drawing that they were already circulating. So we utilized that image uh, on our missing child poster and distributed that. We did have some leads, but obviously nothing that sparked enough to lead to an identification. But there would be new hope along the way, because over time, advances in DNA technology give rise to what's called forensic genetic genealogy, offering new tools to once again try to identify Jane and John Doe. Police say one of the most elusive serial killers in American history has been captured. Until the Golden State Killer case blew the doors open on genealogy, that was something that very few people were even looking at. 
The Golden State Killer was a completely separate case, but it was the first major case to actually show the power of genetic genealogy. We begin with that bombshell arrest, a major clue that unlocked this just days ago. They say cutting edge DNA testing allowed them to make a match. We we're able to do so much more with investigative genetic genealogy where you can use the DNA that you have to further your case and find out, are there people related to this case? My name is Misty Gillis, and I'm a senior forensic genealogist. I love solving mysteries. Ever since I was younger, I always, I read Sherlock Holmes, I read Nancy Drew, I follow true crime all the time. One of the things that's been really interesting is amateur crime sleuths have played such a big role in bringing these cases to light and solving them. Misty Gillis, he's brought closure to 17 families and identified one serial rapist. In 2020, Misty Gillis is working on cold cases with another genetic genealogist named Allison Peacock. I got started in this line of work trying to solve some of my own mysteries in my own family. So solving those mysteries is what gave me the tools to be able to help law enforcement. I had started looking through a website called the Doe Network, which is kind of a clearinghouse for unidentified remains um, in North America. And I came across this rendering of a male in Texas that was found in 1981. There was something about it that just ignited something in me. She said there was a male and female found together. This Romeo and Juliet is what she called them. There was a story there. We just didn't know what it was. They decide they're going to try to figure out who these two young people are, this man and this woman, a mystery that no one had been able to solve for 40 years. Harris County, to its credit, agrees to play ball, and it's off to the races. Once I started building out the family tree matches, I had DNA matches to the mother's side and the father's side. So I knew that my unidentified remains was from this family. And once I saw that there was one male, that was my aha moment of I had figured it out. After about 10 days, Missy said, I think I just solved the Harris County Doe. And she said, who is it? And I said, Harold Dean Klaus. They end up making a call in late October 2021 to a woman named Debbie Klaus Brooks of New Smyrna Beach, Florida. She asked me, are you Debbie Klaus? And I said, yes, I am. I will remember that phone call for the rest of my life. We had said on the phone, is there anyone missing in your family? And right away she said, yes, my brother Dean. She says, well, because I just want you to know that we found him with a female close by him. And my first thought was, is it Tina? The immediate next question was, well, what about the baby? And I was like, Baby? What baby? stake so much on the line more americans turn here than any other newscast abc news world news tonight with david muir america's number one most watched newscast across all of television we are here in israel a nation at war we've seen tank after tank pouring into this area this is where it all began bullet holes all up the wall within minutes the air raid sirens going off you can hear the sound of an explosion we are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember 
that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. There's something wrong here. All I could see was the torso and the feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. At some point, there will be more victims. We were against the clock. Find that evidence and bring it to justice. He hunts humans as prey. I've never saw that kind of evil before. Just the devil incarnate. It's like a cat and mouse game. I know it's him. That just scared everybody. You guys gotta hurry. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. Sent a few cold chills down my spine. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime at Blood Mountain, streaming only on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I will remember that phone call for the rest of my life. Yeah, I'm getting chills, too, just talking about it. I said, would you happen to have anybody in your family that might have been missing for a really long time? I said I had my brother that disappeared um, about 40 years ago. She says, I just want you to know that um, we found him. He had been murdered. We had to say, he was found with a female. Can you tell us about his wife? And she said it was Tina. In just those first moments on the phone, Jane and John Doe suddenly have their names after 40 years of being unidentified. 21-year-old Harold Dean Klaus, 17-year-old Tina Lynn Klaus, and they were a beautiful young couple from Florida. She said, I've been praying and praying about this for years that my mom would find out what happened to our brother before she died. You have two types of feelings. There's a feeling that comes, and you can say, we found him, he's gone. Then there's another part you're hoping he's not gone. When I was on the phone with Debbie, she just, you know, went silent. And then a couple of seconds later, she was like, 
what about Holly? What, what, what about the baby? And I was like, baby? What baby? My brain just was on fire because I was like, how can a child be missing for 40 years and nobody know where she is? Debbie was able to share with us a lot of details. They really were just a young family. They had this little girl. They were establishing their own life together, really, when, unfortunately, that was taken away from them. To truly understand the story of these families, these two young lives that ended so soon, the real story begins in a small town just south of Daytona Beach, Florida. I loved growing up here. At that time, especially, it was really a small, quiet town. Just down the road from Daytona. Daytona was the place to go for any kind of action. You know, motorcycle week, there's race week, there's spring break. But New Smyrna is still the quieter, more peaceful place to go and enjoy the beach. Laying in bed at night, you could hear the waves rolling in. These kids are always running up and down the stairs and jumping in closets, and you know how kids are, scaring each other. My kids are number one in my life and always have been. Donna Casasanta is a waitress at a local restaurant. She raised her six children, four daughters, two sons, and all of this after her husband passes away. They were the glue that held me together, made me whole. Her second oldest son, Dean, is actually known by the family as Junior. Oh, he's very rambunctious, very um, breaking the rules. He's real good at that. He liked to joke around with us, make us laugh, do silly things. Dean's family described him as kind, kind to a fault. He would often pick up hitchhikers, much to his family's disapproval. I don't know how else to put it except to say he had empathy, if you will, for others. Mm -hmm. The family says at the time it was also not uncommon in New Smyrna Beach to actually see these groups of young people traveling on foot, often wearing white robes. They would talk about their religious views. And as a teenager, Dean actually traveled with these groups on more than one occasion. But he always returned home. And I seen this young man coming toward me. And I said, oh my gosh, that's Dean. So I ran running up to him like, come on, where you been? You know, mom's going to be so mad at you. You're really going to be in trouble, you know? And I said, Junior, you can't keep doing this. You will wind up in trouble somehow, some way. You know, and, oh, mom, nah, I can handle it, you know. It's the way it was. Now back home again, Dean finds a reason to actually stay. Her name was Tina Gail Lynn, and she was a friend of one of his younger sisters. She was so sweet was and so happy. And then the more she was with the family, the more I just fell in love with her. For her, Dean was it. Nice looking guy. He treated her right. Everything she needed, everything she was looking for, he was the guy to give it to her. She told me she was in love with him, crazy in love with him. And uh, so she just looked so happy. And the next thing I know, they were married. It wasn't long before Dean and Tina announced that they were expecting a baby. And then on January 24th, 1980, Holly Marie Klaus was born. Oh, she was sweet, chubby, healthy, healthy little thing. They doted over her. They were so devoted. I mean, absolutely devoted. And I loved the way he took care of his little girl. It was the spring of 1980, and baby Holly is just a few months old. And this young couple with their new baby decide to move out of state. They hit the road, and first they drive to Baltimore, Maryland, before then going to Texas, where they first stay with some of Dean's family in Louisville, which is a suburb of Dallas. Tina was very good about writing letters or a phone call at least once a month. Hey, how are you doing? Da, 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 da. And she would also send pictures of Holly. Early October, we got a letter from Tina. It said, we've got a place of our own. And she was excited and happy about it. And uh, she gave me that address. 
And I wrote back to her, I know within the same week, within days, and my letter came back, marked, moved, left no forwarding address. And I thought, what's going on? So I think worry started once a month, 45 days go through, and there's no letter, there's no updated pictures of Holly. There's something not right about this. You know, there, that's, that's, that's not like them. And then all of a sudden, Donna gets an interesting phone call. The man's voice was rough. Kind of raspy. This man on the phone now with Dean's mother tells her that he has something that belongs to her son, and he wants to return it. I warned her that I don't think this is legit, Mom. You better be very careful. The man said, meet me at Daytona 500 Speedway, 12 o'clock, midnight. And I'm thinking, 12 o'clock, midnight, that don't sound right. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? How <laughs> cute. <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
It's now been a few months, no word from Tina and Dean Klaus. That steady stream of letters about them and their baby has stopped. So Dean's mother, Donna, calls family in Texas, and all they know is that the young couple and their baby are gone. What's going on? She was happy. They just got their own place. This can't be. Why would they have left? I was, I was just very suspicious. After some time passes, you're like, how do three people just disappear? A couple months after Donna stops hearing from Dean, she gets this weird phone call. The man's voice was rough. Kind of raspy. And he told me that their car had been found in LA. It's the same car that just the spring prior had pulled out of Donna's driveway with Dean, Tina, and little baby Holly. And now this man presenting himself as a detective calls and claims that the car was found empty and abandoned in LA. Didn't make sense. I have to take a gas. Keys in ignition. Nothing wrong with that. Why and it was parked in this nice neighborhood. When she said, have you found my son? You don't think about my son? He told her, well, ma'am, between California and Texas, there's a lot of desert. No detective would tell a mother, a grieving mother, that. And I knew right away this was not a detective. This man on the phone tells Donna that he knows people who will drive the car from LA to Florida. All they want is $1,000 for their troubles. And Donna remembers that she reluctantly agreed to this, but she didn't feel good about it. She agrees to meet this person at the Daytona Speedway. It sounds like a scene from a movie or something, right? And I'm thinking, 12 o'clock midnight, that don't sound right, you know. Donna is a waitress at that time in a restaurant frequented by law enforcement. So she talks to some of these guys. And they said, yes, Donna, do it. We'll be there. You don't have to worry. We will be there. The woman pulled Junior's car up, got out. I would guess her age, late 20s, early 30s. And then she had two girls, and they also stepped out. And they had robes on. Yes. I said, I've been searching for my son. Let me just call him. I'll talk to him on the phone. I'll know his voice. And then this older woman who went by Sister Susan just said that Dean and Tina had renounced their worldly possessions and their past lives, joined this religious group, and they weren't going to be hearing from them anymore. And she said, he's no longer part of your family. He's our family now. And I think that broke mother, I'm sure. I mean, it would me as a mother. The police stepped in then, and he told me, go ahead, take your car and go home. I checked with the police a few days later, and they said nothing they could do because they didn't, uh, hadn't broken any rules except they brought your car back to you. Donna told me that she was concerned, but Dean had joined these groups before, so she had no reason to believe that he wouldn't return home at some point. Coming out of the hippie movement in the mid-70s, there was a whole entire movement of people becoming involved with these religious-based organizations. When the baby boomers were hitting their early 20s, they were looking for answers. They were trying to figure out their direction in life. All these groups had very similar names as well. They all wore white robes. They were all traveling around the United States. Authorities say that the woman at the Speedway didn't reveal this at the time, but investigators would later discover that Dean and Tina had traveled with members of a group called Christ Family. The Christ Family seems to have grown uh, slowly, beginning probably around 1969 or 1970. It was around a person who came to be known as Jesus Christ Lightning Amen. His birth name was Charles McHugh. The three main doctrines of the Christ family were no killing, no sex, and no materialism. Followers of the Christ family often surrendered all of their possessions. They used the phrase, in the wind, to describe their travels around the country. 
This nomadic lifestyle wasn't easy with children, let alone babies. And people who've studied this particular group said children were reportedly handed over to relatives or others to take care of them while their parents traveled. I knew Tina would do whatever Dean wanted to do. So I did believe they may have joined a group, but I still figured that we'll get a call or, or they'll show up sometime because I couldn't believe Tina would really totally give up family. Because they're adults, you can't list them as missing because they have freely chosen to just disappear. So the only recourse for the family at that point in 1980 was to contact the Salvation Army. When most people think about the Salvation Army, they think about people ringing bells with red buckets, asking for donations around Christmas time. But actually, the Salvation Army did assist families in looking for missing loved ones, especially when law enforcement was unable to get involved. They were going to search the driving records, and then they said, well, we're going to search their Social Security numbers. They had me write an open letter to Tina, but none of the efforts ever went anywhere. Holly's birthday, I would think about her and think, you know, do they have a cake, and what kind of toys is she liking now? And I thought about them a lot. Honestly, after the years go by, you hit year five, you hit year 10, you hit year 20. The year 40 comes by, life's still going on. And then you get news like we did, very frustrating, very painful. The thought of not knowing was over with, but that only brought another section of it is, where was Holly? What happened? We don't have the full story. Early November of 2021, we have IDs on the unidentified human remains, but no one knows what happened to the infant. We know what mom looked like. We know what dad looked like. So we created what's referred to as an age progression and just start putting the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out where is this baby? Was she given up? Was she left somewhere? Was she, God forbid, murdered herself? There were no remains, no evidence that baby Holly was ever in those woods in Houston. So this really begged the question, what happened to baby Holly? It's one of those moments that I will never forget. This is a really incredible turn. When I looked at the records, I was just like, holy crap. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can <laughs> <laughs> I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. What you good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. This case had been cold for decades. That headline grabbed me. After 40 years, murdered couple finally identified where is their missing baby and i thought wow what a complete mystery what a puzzle i knew i had to do a podcast on this it felt a little bit like you know those russian nesting dolls how often do you sort of get a story that is it's like a mystery in a mystery in a mystery in a mystery when you're hearing this story and asking, you know, what happened to one-year-old Holly? Did you find a baby with them? Two tragedies solved. One mystery remains. At the time when I did the story, I'm a reporter with KHOU 11 News. You're in this moment of figuring out two mysteries simultaneously, and then all of a sudden you have this other mystery unearthed out of nowhere. Dean and Tina's families decide that they want to actually travel to the very spot where the bodies were found. And to my surprise, they asked me to come along. We planned the trip down to Texas to try to um, celebrate finding them. And the not knowing part of, about Holly through all that was excruciating. It, it weighed heavy on all of us. We had to quit path. It was a tough trip. Just going to visit that site, it was really emotional. And my mom's health's not that she can't walk very well. And there's all these obstacles, you know. But she really wanted to go. And so we made a way to get to that spot. He was physically holding her up, right? And spiritually, he was holding her up as well. It was very remote. There was some sun shining through the, the trees. It was very quiet, it was very peaceful. But yeah, it, it was hard, it was very hard for, for all of us. We went to the pauper's field. They're all unmarked. We had a prayer and just kind of shared with each other some precious moments that we remember. We never got the last chance to see him or say goodbye. Yeah. He's still the same, right? 
the family immediately knew they had to come be here to pay their respects. Yeah, they all traveled together to, to come do that. And suddenly, in a field of people who are unidentified, you had one family standing here saying goodbye finally to their loved ones. All of the years, they were just hoping that they were living somewhere, having a happy life. And now, all of a sudden, they're being told that that is not what happened. And in addition to that, they don't know where Holly is. So this is a really incredible turn to this story. And four hours north of Houston in Louisville, Texas, a detective there opens a missing persons case for this little baby. Remember, Louisville, Texas is the last known address for this young couple and their baby before they suddenly disappeared in late 1980. My name is Craig Holloman. I am a detective with the Louisville Police Department. I knew that Dean and Tina had been there kind of October-ish time frame. When I interviewed his family that lived um, close to Louisville, they did say that they stayed with them. And uh, after about a month with them, they found their own apartment. And then as quickly as they came in, they disappeared. One of the first things Detective Holloman tries to do is track down Holly's birth certificate. Easy, not so much. I figured, well, maybe I can call to the state of Florida to get somebody to help me out. I eventually talked to somebody on the phone, no help. And right around the time that this detective hits this major roadblock, there's actually a new cold case unit getting off the ground at the Texas Attorney General's office. A need was really identified to say that there aren't enough resources being dedicated to cold cases around the state of Texas. When we first received the case, we realized it had two parts, a missing infant, baby Holly, and then we knew there was also a double homicide. We needed to find baby Holly. That probably held a lot of answers about what happened to her parents. We thought that either Holly had been kidnapped and God forbid had grown up in very bad circumstances or had been murdered along with her parents. When you work these cases, usually they don't have a very happy ending. Investigators are trying to unravel this knot of yarn. They try to get baby Holly's original birth certificate for what seems like it should be a really simple ask hey, can we get this birth certificate? And they just run into a brick wall. And that was hard for us to understand as law enforcement. What do you mean you couldn't get the birth records? We reached out to the Florida AG's office and they eventually linked us up with a detective with the Volusia County Sheriff's Department, Steve Wheeler. It all started with an email. March 18th, I remember that date. My sergeant said, hey Steve, see if you can help Texas out with this case that we're. I drafted up a subpoena, but the Florida Department of Health advised that my subpoena would not be sufficient to provide me these documents. And uh, I asked why. They just said they were sealed. Instantly, I had a feeling she's alive. Baby Holly's alive. There are only a few reasons why you'd want to seal a birth record. And one of those reasons is an adoption. I drafted up a court order and told the judge, these documents unsealed could find Holly, she could still be alive, or these documents could lead the state of Texas to the suspects and, and her parents' murder. And after all this time, a judge finally delivers what detectives have been waiting for. Hey, Mindy, this is uh, Detective Steve Wheeler. When you get a chance, call me back. Detective Wheeler left me a message saying, you need to call me. When I got the email and looked at the records, I was just like, holy crap. I'm thinking maybe we had a big breakthrough. We had names, and that was huge. We did not know if these adopted parents were innocent, caring, loving parents, or had details about a heinous homicide. At that point, it was all hands on deck. Once we uncovered that sealed birth certificate in Florida, it blew wide open. Is one of those moments that I will never forget. I knew this was about to change someone's life forever. All the pieces started to come together. Baby Holly has been located alive and well 42 years later. Holly, it's great to finally meet you. 
Thank you, David. It's really nice to meet you. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. How often do you sort of get a story that is, it's like a mystery and a mystery and a mystery and a mystery. And the case all begins with this gruesome discovery.